Preface of a Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. A Failure of Initiative, Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Preface On September 15, 2005, the House of Representatives approved House Resolution 437, which created the Select Bipartisan Committee to investigate the preparation for and response to Hurricane Katrina, the Select Committee. According to the resolution, the committee was charged with conducting a full and complete investigation and study and to report its findings to the house not later than february fifteenth two thousand six regarding one the development coordination and execution by local state and federal authorities of emergency response plans and other activities in preparation for hurricane katrina and two the local state and federal government response to hurricane katrina the committee presents the report narrative and the findings that stem from it to the u s house of representatives and the american people for their consideration members of the select committee agree unanimously with the report and its findings other members of congress who participated in the select committee's hearings and investigation but were not official members of the select committee while concurring with the majority of the report's findings have presented additional views as well which we offer herein on their behalf first and foremost this report is issued with our continued thoughts and prayers for katrina's victims their families and their friends the loss of life of property of livelihoods and dreams has been enormous and we salute all americans who have stepped up to the plate to help in any way they can it has been said civilization is a race between education and catastrophe with katrina we have had the catastrophe and we are racing inexorably toward the next americans want to know what have we learned two months before the committee was established former speaker of the house newt gingrich testified before a government reform subcommittee about the need to move the government to an entrepreneurial model and away from its current bureaucratic model so that we can get government to move with information age speed and effectiveness implementing policy effectively speaker gindrich said is ultimately as important as making the right policy the select committee first convened on september twenty second two thousand five understanding like speaker gindrich that a policy that cannot be implemented effectively is no policy at all the select committee was created because in the tragic aftermath of katrina america was again confronted with the vast divide between policy creation and policy implementation with the life and death difference between theory and practice the select committee has spent much of the past five months examining the aftermath of this catastrophic disaster it has become increasingly clear that local state and federal agencies failed to meet the needs of the residents of louisiana mississippi and alabama it has been our job to figure out why and to make sure we are better prepared for the future our mandate was clear gather facts about the preparation for and response to katrina at all levels of government investigate aggressively follow the facts wherever they may lead and find out what went right and what went wrong ask why coordination and information sharing between local state and federal governments was so dismal why situational awareness was so foggy for so long why all residents especially the most helpless were not evacuated more quickly why supplies and equipment and support were so slow in arriving why so much taxpayer money aimed at better preparing and protecting the gulf coast was left on the table unspent or in some cases misspent why the adequacy of preparation and response seemed to vary significantly from state to state county to county town to town 
why unsubstantiated rumors and uncritically repeated press reports at times fueled by top officials were able to delay disrupt and diminish the response and why government at all levels failed to react more effectively to a storm that was predicted with unprecedented timeliness and accuracy we agreed early on that the task before us was too important for carping this was not about politics katrina did not distinguish between republicans and democrats this was about getting the information we need to chart a new and better course for emergency preparation and response the american people want the facts and they've been watching they alone will judge whether our review has been thorough and fair our final exam is this report our report marks the culmination of nine public hearings scores of interviews and briefings and the review of more than five hundred thousand pages of documents our investigation revealed that katrina was a national failure an abdication of the most solemn obligation to provide for the common welfare at every level individual corporate philanthropic and governmental we failed to meet the challenge that was katrina in this cautionary tale all the little pigs built houses of straw of all we found along the timeline running from the fictional hurricane pan to the tragically real devastation along the gulf coast this conclusion stands out a national response plan is not enough what's needed is a national action plan not a plan that says washington will do everything but one that says when all else fails the federal government must do something whether it's formally requested or not not even the perfect bureaucratic storm of flaws and failures can wash away the fundamental governmental responsibility to protect public health and safety still no political storm surge from katrina should be allowed to breach the sovereign boundaries between localities states and the federal government our system of federalism wisely relies on those closest to the people to meet immediate needs but faith in federalism alone cannot sanctify a dysfunctional system in which the dhs and fema simply wait for requests for aid that state and local officials may be unable or unwilling to convey in this instance blinding lack of situational awareness and disjointed decision-making needlessly compounded and prolonged katrina's horror in many respects our report is a litany of mistakes misjudgments lapses and absurdities all cascading together blinding us to what was coming and hobbling any collective effort to respond this is not to say there were not many many heroes or that some aspects of the preparation of response were not by any standard successful we found many examples of astounding individual initiative that saved lives and stand in stark contrast to the larger institutional failures nor do we mean to focus on assigning individual blame obtaining a full accounting and identifying lessons learned does not require finger-pointing instinctively tempting as that may be there was also an element of simple bad luck with katrina that aggravated the inadequate response the hurricane arrived over a weekend at the end of the month people on fixed incomes had little money for gas or food or lodging making them more likely to remain in place and wait for their next check communicating via television or radio with families enmeshed in their weekend routines was difficult at best as was finding drivers and other needed volunteers over the past several months we have become more than familiar with the disaster declaration process outlined in the stafford act we understand the goals structure and mechanisms of the national response plan we've digested the alphabet soup of coordinating elements established by the plan the hsoc homeland security operations center and rrcc regional response coordination center jfo's joint field offices and pfo's principal federal officials the iimg interagency incident management group and much more but the american people don't care about acronyms or organizational charts they want to know who was supposed to do what when and whether the job got done 
and if it didn't get done they want to know how we are going to make sure it does the next time the report is a story about the national response plan and how its fifteen emergency support functions esfs were implemented with katrina we offer details on how well the esfs were followed where there were problems we've asked why where even flawless execution led to unacceptable results we've returned to questioning the underlying plan we should be clear about the limitations of our investigation and the parameters of this report we focused on the preparation for and response to katrina for the most part paring down the timeline to one week before and two weeks after the storm we did not at least intentionally delve into important longer-term rebuilding and recovery issues that will continue to have a central place on the congressional agenda for months and years to come in many areas housing education health contracting response bleeds into recovery and the distinctions we've made are admittedly difficult and somewhat arbitrary further this report is only a summary of our work we are hopeful that indeed certain that more information will arise the select committee has constrained its narrative and findings to those that can shed the most light make the biggest difference and trigger the most obvious near-term actions readers will note that we focus considerable attention on a handful of key events evacuation plans and the execution of them conditions and events at the superdome convention center and highways nursing homes and hospitals as a means of illustrating what went right and wrong in countless other locales what this select committee has done is not rocket science we've gathered facts and established timelines based on some fairly rudimentary but important questions posed to the right people in both the public and private sectors what did you need and what did you get where were you in the days and hours right before during and after the storm who were you talking to what were you doing does that match what you were supposed to be doing why or why not in other words the select committee has matched what was supposed to happen under federal state and local plans against what actually happened our findings emerge from this process of matching too often there were too many cooks in the kitchen and because of that the response to katrina was at times overdone at times underdone too often because everybody was in charge nobody was in charge many government officials continue to stubbornly resist recognizing that fundamental changes in disaster management are needed the report illustrates that we have to stop waiting for the disaster that fits our response plan and instead design a scalable capacity to meet whatever mother nature throws at us it's not enough to say we wouldn't be here if the levees had not failed the levees did fail and government and other organizations failed in turn in many many ways it remains difficult to understand how government could respond so ineffectively to a disaster that was anticipated for years and for which specific dire warnings had been issued for days the crisis was not only predictable it was predicted if this is what happens when we have advance warning we shudder to imagine the consequences when we do not four and a half years after nine eleven america is still not ready for prime time this is particularly distressing because we know we remain at risk for terrorist attacks and because the two thousand six hurricane season is right around the corner with this report we hope to do our part to enhance preparation and response with katrina there was no shortage of plans there were plans but there was not enough plan mean government failed because it did not learn from past experiences or because lessons thought to be learned were somehow not implemented if nine eleven was a failure of imagination then katrina was a failure of initiative it was a failure of leadership tom davis Harold Rogers, Christopher Shays, Henry Vanilla, Steve Byer, Sue Myrick, Mac Thornberry, Ray Granger, Charles W. Chip Pickering, Bill Schuster, Jeff Miller.
End of Preface Section 1 of A Failure of Initiative This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson A Failure of Initiative Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Executive Summary of Findings The Select Committee identified failures at all levels of government that significantly undermined and detracted from the heroic efforts of first responders, private individuals and organizations, faith-based groups, and others. The institutional and individual failures we have identified became all the more clear when compared to the heroic efforts of those who acted decisively, those who didn't flinch, who took matters into their own hands when bureaucratic inertia was causing death, injury, and suffering, those whose exceptional initiative saved time and money and lives. We salute the exceptions to the rule, or more accurately, the exceptions that prove the rule. People like Mike Ford, the owner of three nursing homes, who wisely chose to evacuate his patients in Plaquemines Parish before Katrina hit, due in large part to his close and long-standing working relationship with Jesse Street Amont, director of Plaquemines Office of Emergency Preparedness. People like Dr. Gregory Henderson, a pathologist, who showed that not all looting represented lawlessness when, with the aid of New Orleans police officers, he raided pharmacies for needed medications and supplies and set up ad hoc clinics in downtown hotels before moving on to the convention center. But these acts of leadership were too few and far between, and no one heard about or learned from them until it was too late. The preparation for and response to Hurricane Katrina show we are still an analog government in a digital age. We must recognize that we are woefully incapable of storing, moving, and accessing information, especially in times of crisis. Many of the problems we have identified can be categorized as information gaps, or at least problems with information-related implications, or failures to act decisively because information was sketchy at best. Better information would have been an optimal weapon against Katrina information sent to the right people at the right place at the right time information moved within agencies across departments and between publications of government as well seamlessly securely efficiently unfortunately no government does these things well especially big governments the federal government is the largest purchaser of information technology in the world by far one would think we could share information by now but katrina again proved we cannot we reflect on the nine eleven commission's finding that the most important failure was one of imagination the select committee believes katrina was primarily a failure of initiative but there is of course a nexus between the two both imagination and initiative in other words leadership require good information and a coordinated process for sharing it and a willingness to use information however imperfect or incomplete to fuel action with katrina the reasons reliable information did not reach more people more quickly are many and these reasons provide the foundation for our findings in essence we found that while a national emergency management system that relies on state and local governments to identify needs and request resources is adequate for most disasters a catastrophic disaster like katrina can and did overwhelm most aspects of the system for an initial period of time no one anticipated the degree and scope of the destruction the storm would cause even though many could and should have the failure of local state and federal governments to respond more effectively to katrina which had been predicted in theory for many years and forecast with startling accuracy for five days, demonstrates that whatever improvements have been made to our capacity to respond to natural or man-made disasters, four and a half years after 9-11, 
we are still not fully prepared local first responders were largely overwhelmed and unable to perform their duties and the national response plan did not adequately provide a way for federal assets to quickly supplement or if necessary supplant first responders the failure of initiative was also a failure of agility response plans at all levels of government lacked flexibility and adaptability inflexible procedures often delayed the response officials at all levels seemed to be waiting for the disaster that fit their plans rather than planning and building scalable capacities to meet whatever mother nature threw at them we again encountered the risk averse culture that pervades big government and again recognized the need for organizations as agile and responsive as the twenty first century world in which we live one size fits all plans proved impervious to clear warnings of extraordinary peril category five needs elicited a category one response ours was a response that could not adequately accept civilian and international generosity and one for which the congress through inadequate oversight and accounting of state and local use of federal funds must accept some blame in crafting our findings we did not guide the facts we let the facts guide us the select committee's report elaborates on the following findings which are summarized in part here in the order in which they appear the accuracy and timeliness of national weather service and national hurricane center forecasts prevented further loss of life the hurricane pam exercise reflected recognition by all levels of government of the dangers of a category four or five hurricane striking new orleans implementation of lessons learned from hurricane pam was incomplete levees protecting new orleans were not built for the most severe hurricanes responsibilities for levee operations and maintenance were diffuse the lack of a warning system for breaches and other factors delayed repairs to the levees the ultimate cause of the levee failures is under investigation and results to be determined the failure of complete evacuations led to preventable deaths great suffering and further delays in relief evacuations of general populations went relatively well in all three states despite adequate warning fifty-six hours before landfall governor blanco and mayor nagin delayed ordering a mandatory evacuation in new orleans until nineteen hours before landfall the failure to order timely mandatory evacuations mayor nagin's decision to shelter but not evacuate the remaining population and decisions of individuals led to an incomplete evacuation the incomplete pre-landfall evacuation led to deaths thousands of dangerous rescues and horrible conditions for those who remained federal state and local officials failure to anticipate the post-landfall conditions delayed post-landfall evacuation and support critical elements of the national response plan were executed late ineffectively or not at all it does not appear the president received adequate advice and counsel from a senior disaster professional given the well-known consequences of a major hurricane striking new orleans the secretary should have designated an incident of national significance no later than saturday two days prior to landfall when the national weather service predicted new orleans would be struck by a category four or five hurricane and president bush declared a federal emergency the secretary should have convened the interagency incident management group on sunday two days prior to landfall or earlier to analyze katrina's potential consequences and anticipate what the federal response would need to accomplish the secretary should have designated the principal federal official on sunday two days prior to landfall from the roster of pfos who had successfully completed the required training unlike then fema director michael brown considerable confusion was caused by the secretary's pfo decisions a proactive federal response or push system is not a new concept but is rarely utilized the secretary should have invoked the catastrophic incident annex to direct the federal response posture to fully switch from reactive to proactive mode of operations absent the secretary's invocation of the catastrophic incident annex the federal response evolved into a push system over several days the homeland security operations center 
failed to provide valuable situational information to the white house and key operational officials during the disaster the white house failed to de-conflict varying damage assessments and discounted information that ultimately proved accurate federal agencies including the dhs had varying degrees of unfamiliarity with their roles and responsibilities under the national response plan and national incident management system once activated the emergency management assistance compact enabled an unprecedented level of mutual aid assistance to reach the disaster area in a timely and effective manner earlier presidential involvement might have resulted in a more effective response dhs and the states were not prepared for this catastrophic event while a majority of state and local preparedness grants are required to have a terrorism purpose this does not preclude a dual use application despite extensive preparedness initiatives dhs was not prepared to respond to the catastrophic effects of hurricane katrina dhs and fema lack adequate trained and experienced staff for the katrina response the readiness of fema's national emergency response teams was inadequate and reduced the effectiveness of the federal response massive communications damage and a failure to adequately plan for alternatives impaired response efforts command and control and situational awareness massive inoperability had the biggest effect on communications limiting command and control situational awareness and federal state and local officials ability to address unsubstantiated media reports some local and state responders prepared for communication losses but still experienced problems while others were caught unprepared the national communication system met many of the challenges posed by hurricane katrina enabling critical communication during the response but gaps in the system did result in delayed response and inadequate delivery of relief supplies command and control was impaired at all levels delaying relief lack of communications and situational awareness paralyzed command and control a lack of personnel training and funding also weakened command and control ineffective command and control delayed many relief efforts the military played an invaluable role but coordination was lacking the national response plan's catastrophic incident annex as written would have delayed the active duty military response even if it had been implemented dod dhs coordination was not effective during hurricane katrina dod fema and the state of louisiana had difficulty coordinating with each other which slowed the response national guard and dod response operations were comprehensive but perceived as slow the coast guard's response saved many lives but coordination with other responders could improve the army corps of engineers provided critical resources to katrina victims but pre-landfall contracts were not adequate dod has not yet incorporated or implemented lessons learned from joint exercises in military assistance to civil authorities that would have allowed for more effective response to katrina the lack of integration of national guard and active duty forces hampered the military response northern command does not have adequate insight into state response capabilities or adequate interface with governors which contributed to a lack of mutual understanding and trust during the katrina response even dod lacked situational awareness of post landfall conditions which contributed to a slower response dod lacked an information sharing protocol that would have enhanced joint situational awareness and communication between all military components joint task force katrina command staff lacked joint training which contributed to the lack of coordination between active duty components joint task force katrina the national guard louisiana and mississippi lacked needed communications equipment and inoperability required for seamless on the ground coordination emac processing prearranged state compacts and guard equipment packages need improvement equipment personnel and training shortfalls affected the national guard response 
search and rescue operations were a tremendous success but coordination and integration between the military services the national guard the coast guard and other rescue organizations was lacking the collapse of local law enforcement and lack of effective public communications led to civil unrest and further delayed relief a variety of conditions led to lawlessness and violence in hurricane-stricken areas the new orleans police department was ill-prepared for continuity of operations and lost almost all effectiveness the lack of a government public communications strategy and immediate hype of violence exacerbated public concerns and further delayed relief emac and military assistance were critical for restoring law and order federal law enforcement agencies were also critical to restoring law and order and coordinating activities medical care and evacuations suffered from a lack of advanced preparations inadequate communications and difficulties coordinating efforts deployment of medical personnel was reactive not proactive poor planning and prepositioning of medical supplies and equipment led to delays and shortages new orleans was unprepared to provide evacuations and medical care for its special needs population and dialysis patients and louisiana officials lacked a common definition of special needs most hospital and veterans affairs medical center emergency plans did not offer concrete guidance about if or when evacuations should take place new orleans hospitals veterans affairs medical center and medical first responders were not adequately prepared for a full evacuation of medical facilities the government did not effectively coordinate private air transportation capabilities for the evacuation of medical patients hospital and veteran affairs medical center emergency plans did not adequately prepare for communication needs following hurricane katrina new orleans veterans affairs medical center and hospitals inability to communicate impeded their ability to ask for help medical responders did not have adequate communications equipment or operability evacuation decisions for new orleans nursing homes were subjective and in one case led to preventable deaths lack of electronic patient medical records contributed to difficulties and delays in medical treatment of evacuees top officials at the department of health and human services and the national disaster medical system do not share a common understanding of who controls the national disaster medical system under emergency support function eight lack of coordination led to delays in recovering dead bodies deployment confusion uncertainty about mission assignment and government red tape delayed medical care long-standing weaknesses and the magnitude of the disaster overwhelmed fema's ability to provide emergency shelter and temporary housing relocation plans did not adequately provide for shelter housing plans were haphazard and inadequate state and local governments made inappropriate selections of shelters of last resort the lack of a regional database of shelters contributed to an inefficient and ineffective evacuation and sheltering process there was inappropriate delay in getting people out of shelters and into temporary housing delays that officials should have foreseen due to manufacturing limitations fema failed to take advantage of the department of housing and urban development's expertise in large-scale housing challenges fema logistics and contracting systems did not support a targeted massive and sustained provision of commodities FEMA management lacked situational awareness of existing requirements and of resources in the supply chain. An overwhelmed logistics system made it challenging to get supplies, equipment, and personnel where and when needed. Procedures for requesting federal assistance raised numerous concerns. The failure at all levels to enter into advanced contracts led to chaos and the potential for waste and fraud as acquisitions were made in haste before katrina fema suffered from a lack of sufficiently trained procurement professionals dhs procurement continues to be decentralized 
and lacking a uniform approach and its procurement office was understaffed given the volume and dollar value of work ambiguous statutory guidance regarding local contractor participation led to ongoing disputes over procuring debris removal and other services attracting emergency contractors and corporate support could prove challenging given the scrutiny that the companies have endured contributions by charitable organizations assisted many in need but the american red cross and others faced challenges due to the size of the mission inadequate logistics capacity and a disorganized shelter process end of section one Section 2 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Carwin. A Failure of Initiative. Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives investigation overview part one we were abandoned city officials did nothing to protect us we were told to go to the superdome the convention center the interstate bridge for safety we did this more than once in fact we tried them all for every day over a week we saw buses helicopters and fema trucks but no one stopped to help us we never felt so cut off in all our lives when you feel like this you do one of two things you either give up or go into survival mode. We chose the latter. This is how we made it. We slept next to dead bodies. We slept on streets at least four times next to human feces and urine. There was garbage everywhere in the city. Panic and fear had taken over. Patricia Thompson, New Orleans citizen and evacuee. Select Committee Hearing, December 6, 2005. Investigation Overview when Hurricane Katrina made landfall near the Louisiana-Mississippi border on the morning of August 29, 2005, it set in motion a series of events that exposed vast numbers of Americans to extraordinary suffering. Not only would Katrina become the most expensive natural disaster in U.S. history, it would also prove to be one of the deadliest. From the marshes of Louisiana's Plaque Mines Parish, to the urban center of New Orleans, to the coastal communities of Mississippi and Alabama, Katrina cut an enormous swath of physical destruction, environmental devastation, and human suffering. With the overtopping and breaching of the New Orleans levees, the vast majority of the city became submerged, requiring the emergency evacuation of tens of thousands of residents who had not left prior to the storm lifted off roofs by helicopters or carried to safety in boats they were taken to the superdome the convention center a piece of high ground known as the cloverleaf or any other dry spot in the city at these locations they were subjected to unbearable conditions limited light air and sewage facilities in the superdome the blistering heat of the sun and in many cases limited food and water they feared for their safety and survival, and the survival of their city. You had people living where people aren't supposed to live, said Dr. Juliet Saucy, director of New Orleans Emergency Medical Services, referring to the dire situation in the Superdome and Convention Center. In general, people were just trying to survive. Some people acted badly, but most just wanted something to eat and drink and wanted to feel safe. At least 1,100 Louisianans died as a result of Katrina. Mississippians have understandably felt slighted that the devastation to their state has received less national public attention than New Orleans. Mississippi experienced a different storm than Louisiana. In essence, a massive, blender-like storm surge versus the New Orleans flooding caused by breached and overtopped levees. By the end of the day on August 29th, due largely to a storm surge that reached 34 feet in the western parts of the state and extended inland as far as 10 miles, more than half of Mississippi was without power and had suffered serious wind and water damage. In addition to the surge, 
high winds and tornadoes left thousands of homes damaged and destroyed and as many as sixty six thousand mississippians were displaced from their homes katrina completely flattened entire neighborhoods and communities such as waveland bay st louis and pass christian but its damage was not limited to those who lived closest to the gulf of mexico even well inland there is no debate over whether homes may be habitable or not they just aren't there any more in these towns brick walkways and front porches lead up to nothing just a concrete slab where a house used to stand the storm careened upwards through the entire state with hurricane force winds and tornadoes reaching jackson the state capital and its northernmost counties and transforming twenty eight thousand square miles or sixty per cent of the state into a catastrophic disaster area by the time the storm had passed at least two hundred and thirty people were dead and nearly two hundred thousand people were displaced from their homes agricultural forestry gaming and poultry industries were severely damaged department of homeland security dhs reports estimate veterinary medical assistant teams disposed of over three million chickens that were destroyed by the storm while winds upon landfall were not as powerful as those of hurricane camille in nineteen sixty nine katrina was in many ways the perfect storm for coastal mississippi the combination of high winds extraordinarily low barometric pressure and arrival during a high tide resulted in a storm surge nearly twice that of camille's wind-whipped water flooded towns not only from the south but from the north not just from the gulf but from the bayous this was not a tsunami-like single wave of destruction this was a sustained ever-growing high tide one that kept coming for hours and when the water did roar back toward the gulf it took everything with it furniture pool tables refrigerators thirty-foot boats countless household items everything that was once inside was suddenly outside even the very accurate forecasts didn't capture the magnitude and devastation said eddie fave mayor of bay st louis it was the in and out of the surge that killed us the out in particular it carried everything away our infrastructure was devastated gulfport mayor brent war said the water came in blew off manhole covers then receded and caused a vacuum sucking gators and dvd players and lots and lots of sand into water and sewer pipes you couldn't have backed up a truck to a manhole cover and dumped it in more effectively out on his converted shrimp boat on the evening following katrina's landfall Representative Jean Taylor, whose home was destroyed, recalls seeing complete and utter devastation on the ground and a telling sight in the air. Birds were so tired all they could do was hold their wings out and soar in the wind, he said. Our seagulls, if I had to guess, ended up in Arkansas. Very little wildlife remains evident in the storm-ravaged areas. National Guardsmen stationed in Louisiana said they rarely see any pelicans or alligators anymore there are a few shrimp boats working the gulf and elected officials in mississippi guess it will take two years for the state's oyster industry to begin to recover areas presumed to be flood-proof like the diamond head community built after hurricane camille miles north of bay st louis suffered flood damage wind shifts caused a lot of areas considered safe to be flooded like the town of delisle where my district director's brother lives taylor said on a tour bus with select committee members in january his house was pancaked when he came home and tried to crawl in to see what he could salvage he ended up face to face with an alligator he ended up shooting the thing people got mad because they were hungry and he let the alligator rot in his front yard while only two hurricane related deaths were reported in alabama katrina caused significant damage along its coast with a wave surge of thirteen point five feet exceeding the one hundred year flood level of twelve feet despite the fact that the state did not suffer a direct hit from the hurricane bayou labat and dauphine island received the brunt of the storm in alabama losing eight hundred and two hundred homes respectively the storm caused wind damage as far north as tuscaloosa county 
Mobile Bay spilled into downtown and flooded large sections of the city, destroying hundreds of homes. The sheer power of the storm dislodged a nearby oil drilling platform, which became caught under the U.S. Highway 98 bridge. The overall toll from the devastation is still being tallied. At the time this report was issued, more than 3,000 people from storm-affected states remained unaccounted for. During the most recent fact-finding trip to the Gulf Coast, in late January 2006, members and staff of the Select Committee were shocked by the level of devastation and slow pace of cleanup. So many towns, cities, and parishes remain almost entirely empty. A throbbing metropolis of 470,000 before the storm, New Orleans had become, at the time of our writing, a struggling city that is home to barely 100,000 people although officials say that figure almost doubles for now during the daytime when contractors and employees come into the city to work significant portions of the city and region remain uninhabitable in st bernard parish a few miles east of downtown new orleans only four houses did not suffer catastrophic damage from wind rain or sudden flood that resulted from the breaking of the levees of the mississippi river gulf outlet canal MRGO. The parish, once home to nearly 70,000 people, has seen its population dip to about 7,000, with nearly all of those people living in temporary housing. In all of the affected communities, the local economies remain on the brink of disaster, fearful of another punch that would surely be the knockout blow. In Mississippi, Hancock County lost 64% of its real property value. In Bay St. Louis and Waveland, the figure is estimated to be closer to 90%. Investigative Context An Overview It's been said that experience is the best teacher. The unfortunate thing is that the learning process is sometimes such a painful one. This report is the result of a five-month journey by the Select Committee to gather information from all those who learned painful lessons during Katrina. It examines how well local, state, and federal officials worked with each other and with private entities to alleviate the suffering of so many of our fellow citizens. In crafting an investigative plan, the Select Committee faced and overcame several challenges. We had to appoint members quickly and rely on other committees to detail staff to the Select Committee. We had to move quickly while memories and evidence were fresh. We had to gather as much information as we could while leaving time to write and design a consensus report before our February 15, 2006 deadline. We had to remain focused on our prescribed right before and right after the storm time frame, despite significant interest in longer-term issues and challenges. Like juggling with knives, we had to keep multiple investigative elements in play simultaneously, preparing for and holding high-profile public hearings, requesting, receiving, and reviewing documents, and conducting interviews and briefings, and all this had to be done in a less-than-ideal political atmosphere. The Select Committee remains grateful to those Democrats who chose to participate in our investigation in defiance of their leadership's decision not to appoint members officially to the panel. The refusal by the minority leader was self-defeating, given that the Select Committee's composition and minority subpoena authority would have given Democrats more clout than they enjoy on any standing committee of the House. Despite this strategy, the Select Committee's review and the creation of this report have been bipartisan endeavors in spirit and in fact. On September 15th, before the Select Committee was established by a bipartisan House vote, the Government Reform Committee held a hearing on the early lessons learned from Katrina. At that hearing, the Committee's ranking member, Representative Henry Waxman, said there were two steps we should take right away. First, he said, we should request basic documents from the agencies. And second, he said, we need to hear from Michael Brown and Michael Chertoff. These are the two government officials most responsible for the inadequate response, and the committee should call them to testify without delay. The select committee did not delay. We met and exceeded those goals, while many who so urgently called on Congress to swiftly investigate refused to participate and instead prejudged our efforts. We investigated aggressively what went wrong and what went right. The Select Committee continuously invited any and all interested Democrats to join our hearings. 
giving them full and equal opportunity to make statements and question witnesses and help guide the direction of our inquiry including identifying and inviting witnesses five democratic members did just that representative charlie melanson representative jean taylor representative bill jefferson representative cynthia mckinney and representative sheila jackson lee document requests submitted to federal state and local agencies were signed by both chairman davis and representative melanson in addition to direct member participation democratic members and staff were assigned to travel with republican members and staff to affected locales and representative waxman's top government reform committee investigative staff assisted democratic participants finally democratic members were repeatedly invited to offer narrative text and findings for inclusion in this report the select committee beyond extending these courtesies remained focused on the job of congress in our system of checks and balances the congress has both the duty and the obligation to ask tough questions we did not believe it was appropriate to outsource our congressional oversight responsibility the american people did not want us to punt they wanted answers and they wanted them quickly if there is a consensus down the road to establish an outside commission which some purportedly wanted so be it the two were not and are not mutually exclusive however a commission will take months to set up and an eternity to finish its work we needed to begin immediately while evidence and memories were fresh news reports and other statements suggested many democrats felt the same for example bloomberg news reported in november that some house democrats want a larger role in katrina investigation in that report representative jean taylor said it's really important that we're there i certainly wish more of my colleagues who are interested in this would participate mr davis to his credit has been extremely fair representative maxine waters who had told chairman davis she wanted to participate but later said she could not told bloomberg i feel a certain void and a great absence from these discussions i was hoping that our leaders could find a way so we could participate representative neil abercrombie said he unsuccessfully expressed interest in serving on the committee the position of ms pelosi in the leadership is pretty clear he said i have a different view democrats who did buck their leadership have acknowledged both the value of their participation and the eagerness of the select committee to have them participate representative cynthia mckinney expressed her regrets about the democrats failure to officially appoint members to the committee while thanking chairman davis for convening a hearing on december sixth featuring the testimony from african-american residents and evacuees i would like to thank you mr chairman for allowing us to have this day because were it left up to i will get in trouble now but were it left up to the democratic leadership we would not have had this day because we wouldn't be here. The Democratic leadership has instructed us to boycott this panel, so I would like to thank my chairman for giving us the opportunity to invite people who don't have the opportunity to come and testify before Congress. We are here to serve all of the people of this country, and too rarely do we hear from all of the people. Regardless of who did or did not participate in our investigation, the select committee had a job to do, and we were determined to do it right. End of section two. Section three of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I'm Andrew Nelson in Atlanta, Georgia. A Failure of Initiative, Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Investigation Overview, Part 2. Hearing Chronology, an Overview. The Select Committee held nine hearings over the course of approximately three months. Select committee members and staff simultaneously conducted scores of interviews and received dozens of briefings from local, state, and federal officials, non-governmental organizations, private companies and individuals who provided or offered external support after Katrina, and hurricane victims. 
Select committee members and staff traveled numerous times to the Gulf Coast. The select committee also requested and received more than 500,000 pages of documents from a wide array of sources. The information gleaned from our investigation is provided in detailed narrative form in subsequent chapters. What follows here is a brief synopsis of the topics, questions, and themes raised at each of our hearings. Predicting Hurricanes What we knew about Katrina and when September 22, 2005 Select Committee Hearing The Select Committee began at a logical place, a hearing to establish a record of who was told what and when about the nature of the hurricane in the days immediately before the storm. We explore the timeline of Katrina, progressing from a tropical depression to a major hurricane, and asked when warnings were issued to the public and to federal, state, and local officials. We reaffirmed what we already suspected. At least two federal agencies passed Katrina's test with flying colors, the National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center. Many who escaped the storm's wrath owe their lives to these agencies' accuracy. This hearing provided a backdrop for the remainder of our inquiry. We repeatedly tried to determine how government could respond so ineffectively to a disaster that was so accurately forecast. How accurately? Storm track predictions released to the public 56 hours before Katrina came ashore were off by only 15 miles. The average 48-hour error is 160 miles, and the average 24-hour error is 85 miles. The Hurricane Center's predicted strength for Katrina at landfall two days before the storm hit was off the mark by only 10 miles per hour. NWS Director Max Mayfield personally spoke by telephone with the governors of Mississippi and Louisiana and the mayor of New Orleans two days prior to landfall to warn them of what was coming. He also gave daily pre-storm video briefings to federal officials in Washington, including top federal emergency management agency, FEMA, and DHS brass. The day before Katrina hit, the NWS office in Slidell, Louisiana, issued a warning saying, Most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks, perhaps longer. Human suffering incredible by modern standards. The select committee determined, despite more recently revised reports, that Katrina was actually a strong Category 3 storm at landfall, not a Category 4, that Katrina's strength and the potential disaster it could bring were made clear well in advance, through briefings and formal advisories. Inadequate response could not be blamed on lack of advance warning. Hurricane Katrina, the role of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. September 27, 2005 Select Committee Hearing. This hearing, featuring former FEMA Director Michael Brown, attempted to construct a timeline of what FEMA did and did not do before, during, and after Katrina made landfall. Fair or not, by the time of this hearing, FEMA in general and Brown in particular had become the symbol of all that went wrong with the government's response to Katrina. By the September 27th hearing date, with the emergence of Hurricane Rita, the select committee had the ability to compare and contrast disaster response actions after the two storms. While Rita was predicted to be a very different storm from Katrina, a mere size large compared to a size triple XL, and a storm that struck a far less densely populated area, it was immediately clear that governments at all levels did things differently this time around. More supplies were stockpiled on the ground prior to Rita's arrival. The federal government declared Rita an incident of national significance two days before landfall, triggering our most thorough response, and named a federal officer in charge. These steps occurred two days after Katrina. 10,000 National Guardsmen were called to Texas in advance of Rita. Louisiana summoned 1,500 before Katrina. Search and rescue operations were far better coordinated. Even if a little rough around the edges, massive pre-storm evacuation of Houston and surrounding locales showed improved foresight from state and local officials and how lives can be saved when people pay attention to a coordinated message from their government. We also attempted to clarify FEMA's role in disaster response. We were faced with the problematic reality that many Americans, and perhaps even some state and local officials, 
falsely viewed FEMA as some sort of national fire and rescue team. An important task for the select committee moving forward was defining what FEMA is, what it can and cannot do based on what it is actually charged with doing by statute. We noted FEMA is not a first responder agency, with the resources to assume principal responsibility for overwhelmed state and local governments during a disaster. This is the real world, not the real world. There is no Tommy Lee Jones character that comes and takes charge of, well, everything. But we also attempted to contextualize that discussion. In other words, before getting to what FEMA cannot do, we wanted to understand what they simply did not do. Just because they are not first responders does not mean that they should be a second thought. We explored the possible causes of FEMA's inadequate response, which are covered exhaustively in subsequent chapters. Among those discussed at the hearing, inadequacies of the Stafford Act, organizational or budgetary or grant-making shortcomings, state and local governments that didn't know how to ask for help or simply didn't, a bureaucratic mindset that now emphasizes terrorism to the exclusion of natural disaster planning. We looked at these possibilities and more. We also examined why FEMA seemed unable to implement lessons that should have been learned well in advance of Katrina. There were the lessons of previous hurricanes. Further, FEMA officials participated in the now widely known exercise called Hurricane Pam in July 2004, an exercise that predicted with eerie similarity Katrina's impact on New Orleans, including an evacuation of a million people, overflowing levees, and the destructions of hundreds of thousands of buildings. Hurricane Katrina, the role of the Department of Homeland Security. October 19, 2005 Select Committee Hearing. Although by this date, FEMA and Michael Brown had received the most attention from members of Congress, state and local officials, and the news media in Katrina's wake, the Select Committee sought to recognize that DHS and Secretary Michael Chertoff have primary responsibility for managing the national response to a catastrophic disaster, according to the National Response Plan, NRP. Therefore, three weeks after hearing from Michael Brown, we turned to his boss, the man who ultimately fired him. We needed to find out if Michael Brown had it right when he testified that FEMA had been underfunded and understaffed, that it had become emaciated, and that Congress had undermined FEMA's effectiveness when the agency was folded into DHS. Michael Brown testified that he asked the Department for funding to implement the lessons learned from the Hurricane Pam exercise and that those funds were denied. He also testified about brain drain, diminished financial resources, and assessments of 70 to $80 million by DHS for department-wide programs. He said he had written memos to Secretary Ridge and Secretary Chertoff regarding the inadequacy of FEMA's resources. We asked Secretary Chertoff about those assertions. We also sought to establish the department's role and responsibilities in a disaster. What resources can the secretary bring to bear? What triggers the decision to deploy those resources? During Katrina, how personally involved was Secretary Chertoff in seeking, authorizing, or deploying specific resources? Under the National Response Plan, the DHS secretary is the federal official charged with declaring an incident of national significance. Part of that declaration entails naming a principal federal official, PFO, to manage the response. The government's pre-landfall decision to declare an incident of national significance with Rita suggested awareness that the call came too late with Katrina. And based on some of Brown's emails, we knew that he resented being named the PFO by the secretary. We needed to ask Secretary Chertoff what he thought about that, and what those comments said about the underlying NRP. Finally, we asked Secretary Chertoff what we asked all officials during our investigation. Where were you in the days and hours right before, during, and after the hurricane? What were you doing? Who were you talking to? New York University professor Paul Light wrote shortly after Katrina that, Mr. Chertoff is just about the only official in Washington who can say, I told you so, about FEMA based on some of the reforms he outlined in July 2005 in his second stage review. We asked Secretary Chertoff if he believed FEMA's response to Katrina would have been better if the reforms had been in place on August 29th. 
Hurricane Katrina, Preparedness and Response by the Department of Defense, the Coast Guard, and the National Guard of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, October 27, 2005, Select Committee Hearing. At this hearing, we examine Department of Defense responsibilities, procedures, and coordination with the Department of Homeland Security in the event of a catastrophic disaster. We looked at the roles of the National Guard and U.S. Northern Command in disaster response as the operational arms of DOD and the states, and we reviewed the role of the Coast Guard, a unique national asset with both military capabilities and domestic law enforcement authorities. We sought to establish a timeline of the military's actions, what they were asked to do, when they were asked, and whether the jobs actually got done. We acknowledged the heroic efforts that DOD, the National Guard, and Coast Guard personnel made, efforts that saved many, many lives. The mobilization was massive and, at least once the call went out, swift and effective. But we also discussed problems with the military response. The select committee believed even some of the successes occurred despite less than optimal planning, and too often officers were planning in a crisis environment. There were problems with situational awareness and damage assessments, with coordinating search and rescue operations, with the effective use of defense coordinating officers by FEMA, with an early and persistent disconnect between DOD and state and local authorities, with inadequate telecommunications that prevented effective coordination, and, once again, with failing to learn as much as possible from previous disasters. While we continued to emphasize that local first responders are best suited for handling local emergencies, the recurring question was, what happens when first responders are overwhelmed as they clearly were in Katrina? As a result, we asked whether DOD anticipated these circumstances, what preparations were made, and what actions were taken with regard to the National Response Plan's Catastrophic Incident Annex, the annex that authorizes federal agencies to act when state and local capacity even to know what they need is compromised by the sheer size of the calamity. Our hearing came amid growing debate over an expanded military role in future disasters. President Bush prompted the discussion in a nationally televised address from New Orleans on September 15th, saying, It is now clear that a challenge on this scale requires greater federal authority and a broader role for the armed forces, the institution of our government, most capable of massive logistical operations on a moment's notice. Two witnesses, Paul McHale, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense, and Admiral Timothy J. Keating, Commander, North American Aerospace Defense Command and U.S. Northern Command, had indicated prior to the hearing that DOD was considering training and equipping an active duty force specifically for disaster response. Those remarks led to some confusion over specifics and even to some outright opposition. On October 13th, the National Governors Association issued a statement reasserting their authority. Governors are responsible for the safety and welfare of their citizens and are in the best position to coordinate all resources to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters, the association wrote. An October 21st statement by Assistant to the President for Homeland Security Advisor Francis Townsend, who is leading President Bush's examination of the federal response to Katrina, also spawned negative reactions from state officials. Townsend reportedly said she was considering whether there is a narrow band of cases in which the president should seize control when a disaster strikes. A spokesperson for Louisiana Governor Kathleen Babineau Blanco responded by saying she could not think of an instance in which the president should be able to unilaterally take control. We don't believe Katrina was the time, and I don't know what another time would be, Denise Betcher told the Times-Picayune. The select committee, therefore, began addressing this basic tension. On the one hand, we heard understandable caution from our members and witnesses against overreacting to Katrina with sweeping changes to laws or processes, caution against deviating too wildly from the locals as first responders paradigm. None of us believe the best lesson to be learned from Katrina was that all answers can be found in Washington. On the other hand, the call for increasing the military's role in domestic affairs is easy to grasp. Who else can respond the way the military can? Who else can stand up when others have fallen? This tension was reflected in the National Response Plan before Katrina. 
The catastrophic incident index assumes that local response capabilities may be insufficient, as they will be quickly overwhelmed. But the NRP plan states federal resources will only be integrated into the response effort upon a request by state and local authorities, and assumes state and local officials will be able to do the integrating themselves. The select committee was left wondering if the plan, as written, tried to have its cake and eat it too. How can we rely on the overwhelmed to acknowledge they are overwhelmed and then expect them to direct and manage the process of coming to their rescue? We agreed we needed a closer evaluation of existing procedures for DOD under the National Response Plan, paying particular attention to DOD's role when first responders are wiped out or otherwise incapable of providing the initial response. We agreed that incidents of national significance require a response on a national scale, but we also agreed the devil is in the details. We cannot expect the Marines to swoop in with MREs every time a storm hits. We train soldiers to fight wars. You can't kill a storm. So what is the threshold? When can or should the Stafford Act's assumption that states will be able to pull needed federal resources to meet their needs give way to the operational imperative that federal agencies push assets to those who need them? What would spur the kind of enhanced or heightened military role that some have been promoting in the aftermath of Katrina? When would we pull that trigger? And finally, would it have made a difference in the response to Katrina? The fact is, military resources are not infinite. It seems the kind of standing humanitarian force that would be needed to provide this sort of immediate assistance at a moment's notice would either threaten readiness or require an expansion of the active force and a significant boost in how well they are equipped. Legal questions also arose. Were we talking about statutory changes? Should we revisit Posse Comitatus, the 127-year-old law that bars federal troops from assuming domestic law enforcement duties? Did Katrina demonstrate a need for a new exception to Posse Comitatus, one to be utilized after major disasters? The select committee ultimately refocused the discussion by simplifying the question, do we need a larger DOD role or just a smarter one? The select committee tried to acknowledge at this hearing what an incredible job the Coast Guard did and recognized the National Guard's clear sense of urgency. We noted for the record that Northern Command had prepared for this storm, deploying defense coordinating officers to the three states before landfall and placing units on alert. But we also had to recognize that it was unclear how much real support was in place before the storm arrived, and that Secretary McHale himself had acknowledged prior to our hearing the DOD response was too slow. End of Section 3. I'm Andrew Nelson in Atlanta, Georgia. Section 4 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. A Failure of Initiative, Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Investigation Overview, Part 3. Hurricane Katrina, the Federal Government's Use of Contractors to Prepare and Respond. November 2, 2005 Select Committee Hearing Local, state, and federal governments rely heavily on contractor support to prepare for and respond to disasters. This hearing examined the contracts in place prior to Katrina's landfall and procurement planning efforts that took place in anticipation of a large-scale catastrophic event. We also reviewed the rationale and process for awarding disaster relief and recovery contracts in the immediate aftermath of Katrina. The Select Committee asked about the internal controls in place to ensure that federal acquisition laws were followed, the terms and performance of Katrina relief contracts, and the ways in which the management and oversight of disaster-related contracting can be strengthened. A great deal of taxpayer money went out the door to private firms to help prepare for and respond to Katrina. Part of our job was to ask whether it's been money well spent, 
and part of that inquiry was asking what contracts should have been in place before the storm arrived, based on what everyone knew, or should have known, would be needed. Was the contracting system up to the task? Were we able to get what we needed, when and where we needed it? By any measure, this was an enormous storm, described as one of biblical proportions. In the face of the massive destruction caused by Katrina, acquisition personnel acted to meet pressing humanitarian needs, contacting firms in an effort to provide immediate relief to survivors and to protect life and property, and thankfully many firms responded. It is true that several companies were called into action on a sole source basis under acquisition provisions that allow the government to acquire urgently needed goods and services in emergency situations. It's also true that contrary to many media reports, some of the immediate response efforts were provided through existing contracts that had been previously awarded through full and open competition. Nevertheless, concerns were raised with respect to how FEMA awarded contracts in Katrina's immediate aftermath and regarding what contract vehicles were in place before landfall. These were legitimate concerns that affect not only our findings relative to the preparation for and response to Katrina, but also how well prepared we'll be the next time, and how willing contractors will be to step up to the plate the next time they're called. The indirect result of inefficient contracting and misdirected even baseless charges against contractors could be a government left with more than it can manage in-house. In the weeks following Katrina, more than 80% of the $1.5 billion in initial contracts awarded by FEMA were awarded on a sole source basis or pursuant to limited competition. Many of the contracts awarded were incomplete and included open-ended or vague terms. In addition, numerous news reports questioned the terms of disaster relief agreements made in haste. Under the Stafford Act, Prime contractors are to give preference to local subcontractors, but reports indicated that not enough local businesses were being hired. Questions were also raised about the Corps of Engineers' use of a limited competition to award contracts for debris removal and cleanup. Undoubtedly, FEMA before Katrina suffered from something Congress has grappled with government-wide for many years, a lack of sufficiently trained procurement professionals. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, the DHS Office of Inspector General, IG, had repeatedly cited the lack of consistent contract management for large, complex, high-cost procurement programs. DHS procurement continues to be decentralized and lacking a uniform approach. DHS has seven legacy procurement offices that continue to serve DHS components, including FEMA. Notably, FEMA was not reporting or tracking procurements undertaken by disaster field offices, and the procurement office remains to this day understaffed given the volume and dollar value of its work. The chief procurement officer, CPO, had established an eighth office called the Office of Procurement Operations to meet the procurement needs of the rest of DHS. After Katrina, however, the CPO reassigned its staff to assist FEMA's procurement office. At this hearing, we learned errors were made in the contracting process before and after Katrina. The contract oversight process is not always pretty, and decisions made under life and death pressure are not always as lucid as those made under less complicated conditions. But there are lessons to be learned about efficient and effective contracting, even from this hopefully once-in-a-lifetime event. That there were and will be disagreements with contractors over pricing and payment schedules should come as no surprise to anyone familiar with the administration of complex contracts in difficult circumstances. The good news is, DHS has begun establishing a rigorous oversight process for each and every federal contract related to Katrina. Now the process needs to be fully implemented. Shortly after the emergency needs arose, DHS's chief procurement officer asked the DHS Inspector General's office to begin overseeing the acquisition process. 
the DHS IG assigned 60 auditors, investigators, and inspectors, and planned to hire 30 additional oversight personnel. The staff is reviewing the award and administration of all major contracts, including those awarded in the initial efforts, and will monitor all contracting activities as the government develops its requirements and as the selection and award process continues to unfold. To further ensure that any payments made to contractors are proper and reasonable, FEMA engaged the Defense Contract Audit Agency to help monitor and oversee any payments made and pledged not to pay on any vouchers until each one is audited and cleared. The Select Committee has no patience with waste, fraud, or abuse. We expect that any such instances that are proven will result in harsh punishment for the perpetrators. We also expect that as the conditions on the ground have improved, the next generation of contracts have been and will be awarded and administered in accordance with standard acquisition procedures. Emergency procedures are for emergencies only. FEMA said it continues to revisit non-competitive arrangements made immediately after the storm. Hurricane Katrina, Preparedness and Response by the State of Alabama November 9, 2005 Select Committee Hearing Hurricane Katrina, Preparedness and Response by the State of Mississippi December 7, 2005 Select Committee Hearing Hurricane Katrina, Preparation and Response by the State of Louisiana December 14, 2005 Select Committee Hearing The three state-focused hearings we held were arguably the most important in terms of fact-gathering. After all, we understood that in the event of an emergency, state and local government officials bear primary responsibilities under both the National Response Plan and their own laws and directives. Throughout federal, state, and local planning documents, the general principle is for all incidents to be handled at the lowest possible organizational and jurisdictional level. Police, fire, public health, and medical, emergency management, and other personnel are responsible for incident management at the local level. For federally declared emergencies or major disasters, DHS provides operational and or resource coordination for federal support to on-scene incident command structures. Our goal was to better understand the responsibilities and actions of state and local officials before, during, and after Hurricane Katrina made landfall. We explored state laws, policies, procedures, and how state and local officials interfaced with DHS and FEMA when they confronted Katrina, and how DHS interfaced with them. The National Response Plan and the National Incident Management System were crafted to provide the framework and template, respectively, for the federal government to work with state and local authorities to prepare for and respond to crises. In turn, States, localities, tribal governments, and non-governmental organizations are asked to align their plans and procedures with federal guidelines and procedures. Did this coordinated alignment occur? By the time of these hearings, we knew in large part it had not. We sought to understand from a state and local perspective why. Hurricane Katrina, Voices from Inside the Storm, December 6th, 2005 Select Committee Hearing. In mid-November, Representative Cynthia McKinney asked Select Committee Chairman Tom Davis to focus a hearing on the African-American voice related to Hurricane Katrina. With that request in mind, and having already planned a hearing featuring testimony from storm victims, the Select Committee sought to better understand the experiences of Gulf Coast residents including those forced to evacuate during the catastrophe. Only by hearing from those most directly affected by Katrina could we determine where, how, and why the government response at all levels was so terribly inadequate. There was little question that Katrina had sparked renewed debate about race, class, and institutional approaches toward vulnerable population groups in the United States. In the aftermath of the storm, a wide array of media reports, public statements, and polls underscored this reality. In his September 15th speech to the nation, President Bush touched on the issue. As all of us saw on television, there is also some deep, persistent poverty in this region as well. 
and that poverty has roots in a history of racial discrimination which cut off generations from the opportunity of America, the President said. Since then, the debate had become increasingly heated. In media interviews, Jesse Jackson compared New Orleans shelters to the hold of a slave ship, and Louis Farrakhan suggested New Orleans levees were intentionally blown up to destroy primarily African-American neighborhoods. While not all the commentary has necessarily been constructive, substantiated, or fair, the Select Committee believed the issue warranted further discussion, especially within the context of understanding the experiences of those caught inside the storm and in hopes of making sure the government response is more effective the next time. We knew from government emails and other documents that officials were almost immediately sensitive to public perceptions of race as a factor in the inadequate response. An aide to Louisiana Governor Blanco cautioned colleagues about how to respond to a request from Representative Maxine Waters, an African-American, for security escorts in New Orleans shortly after the storm. Please handle this very carefully, aide Johnny Anderson wrote in an email. We are getting enough bad national press on race relations. Emails from aides to former FEMA director Michael Brown reflected similar concerns about public relations and racial politics. And Alabama officials discussed similar sensitivities about a proposal to conduct background checks on out-of-state evacuees being housed in state parks. A CNN Gallup poll from September 8th to 11th reported 60% of African Americans but only 12% of whites believed race was a factor in the slow response to Katrina. Another poll by the Pew Research Center found that 7 in 10 blacks believed the disaster showed that racial inequality remains a major problem in America. A majority of whites disagreed. A November survey of 46 Katrina evacuees published by the Natural Hazards Center at the University of Colorado Boulder concluded that issues of race and class were central to evacuation experiences. For many, the evacuation process was complicated by age, mental or physical disability, the need to care for dependents, or material possessions they were trying to take with them. The Washington Post, the Kaiser Family Foundation, and Harvard University also conducted face-to-face -face interviews with 680 randomly selected adult evacuees residing in Houston. When asked, has your experience made you feel like the government cares about people like you, or has it made you feel like the government doesn't care? 61% reported they felt the government doesn't care. Additionally, the evacuees suggested an intersection between race and class. 68% of respondents thought the federal government would have responded more quickly if more people trapped in the floodwaters were wealthier and white, rather than poorer and black. At an early November forum at Emerson College, Louise Elisa, a former regional director for the Federal Emergency Management Agency under President Clinton, reportedly suggested that race had to be a factor in the inadequate response. I am telling you as a professional that you could not have had a mistake of this nature if something else was not afoot, the Boston Globe quoted Elisa. Whether or not one believed racist charges were well-founded, and clearly a majority of our members did not, the select committee agreed it should recognize and discuss the socioeconomic and racial backdrop against which Katrina unfolded. As the Brookings Institution reported in October, New Orleans, which once had economically and demographically diverse neighborhoods, had grown extremely segregated by both race and income by the time of the storm. As a result, Brookings concluded, blacks and whites were living in quite literally different worlds before the storm hit. At the very least, the select committee determined it should further explore at this hearing how socioeconomic factors contributed to the experiences of those directly affected by the storm. The UC Boulder survey found that almost all interviewees described the evacuation process as disorderly and disorganized, with minimal communication about where evacuees were heading and when the next transportation would arrive. This created a state of uncertainty and insecurity. 
predominantly working-class African Americans did not evacuate because they did not have the financial resources to do so. The Select Committee sought to learn more about whether government messages to Gulf Coast residents regarding the dangers of the coming hurricane could have been presented in a more effective manner, a question which also carried racial and socioeconomic implications. If you don't hear the message from someone you trust, you tend to be skeptical, Margaret Sims, vice president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, told Public Relations Strategist magazine. If you get conflicting information from people you're not sure of, then inaction may be, from your perspective, the most prudent form of action. The same magazine article noted that disaster response may have been hampered by not taking the circumstances of area residents fully into account. The people creating the verbal or image measures don't take into account access or physical barriers to opportunities in certain communities, said Linda Alduri, director of the Center for Risk Communication Research at the University of Maryland. With Katrina, people knew the importance of storm warnings and the need to evacuate, but didn't have the physical access to do so. In other words, the Select Committee agreed it should examine to what extent response inadequacies stemmed from the messengers and the message. We wanted to further explore the possibility that different people may hear different things when their elected officials are telling them to evacuate. End of section four. Section five of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepard. A Failure of Initiative. Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Investigation Overview, Part 4. Within a week of its September 15, 2005 creation, the Select Committee held its first hearing. By the end of the month, Chairman Davis and Representative Charlie Mellencon, on behalf of the Select Committee, and in cooperation with the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, had submitted 19 official and comprehensive requests for documents to relevant federal agencies and state governments. By the beginning of January 2006, 67 formal requests for documents had been issued by the Select Committee and the Senate Committee to 29 federal agencies as well as the governments of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana and their subdivisions. In response to those formal requests and numerous other staff requests, the Select Committee received hundreds of thousands of documents. The responses by the federal agencies and state governments inundated the Select Committee. A constant stream of boxes containing responsive documents arrived daily at the Select Committee's door. Select Committee staff worked round the clock to organize and review this stream of documents. Aggressive follow-up by the Select Committee, detailed below, ensured the document production was responsive to the Select Committee's requests. To fulfill its mission, the Select Committee needed to do more than hold hearings. We requested and received more than half a million pages of documents from governmental organizations at all levels, federal, state, and local. The information gleaned from these documents played a critical role in helping the Select Committee paint a picture of what happened and why. Below is a brief overview of what was requested and what was received. Most of the governmental organizations complied with our requests in a timely and complete fashion. Efforts by others to comply, unfortunately, were neither timely nor complete. This is discussed below as well. In September 2005, the Senate Committee chaired by Senator Susan Collins, began its Katrina investigation. In many cases, the two committees desired the same or similar information. To facilitate both investigations and to eliminate waste and unnecessary duplication of efforts, the Select Committee simply asked to receive all documents requested by the Senate. Federal. The Select Committee sent request letters 
to all 15 cabinet-level departments, as well as many independent federal departments including the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, the United States Postal Service, USPS, the Agency for International Development, AID, the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, the Small Business Administration, SBA, the Social Security Administration, SSA, the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC, the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. We also requested information from the White House and the Office of the Vice President. In particular, the Select Committee requested extensive information from the Department of Homeland Security, particularly from two of its constituent agencies, FEMA and the U.S. Coast Guard. We requested documents and communications from before August 23rd related to the threats posed by a hurricane striking New Orleans or the Gulf Coast, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. We also sought documents and communications from between August 23rd and August 29th related to the threat posed by Hurricane Katrina, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. And we requested documents and communications from between August 29th and September 15th related to the impact of Hurricane Katrina, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. In addition, we requested information about the different elements of DHS and the individuals holding key positions. We wanted to know the different roles and responsibilities of those components as well as the actions they took before, during, and after Katrina. We asked for information regarding the activation of the National Response Plan and National Incident Management System, and any discussions about the use of armed forces. We also requested relevant communications, specifically any requests for assistance, communications with local and state authorities, and communications that revealed any plans to prepare for the hurricane or communications that demonstrated possible vulnerabilities to a hurricane. We also wanted any documents containing authorities, regulations, plans, and procedures of the agency, weather reports, information about medical response assets, and the information about DHS and FEMA funding and budgeting. We requested an employee directory and organization chart for FEMA, as well as the individuals in key positions during the hurricane in the affected regions. We asked for documents referring to risks posed by hurricanes or flooding of New Orleans, and documents indicating whether officials knew of those risks. We also requested documents and communications regarding the levee system in New Orleans, including plans, risk assessments, and knowledge of the levee's failure, particularly documents and communications with the Army Corps of Engineers. We sought documents and names of key individuals related to the Hurricane PAM exercise and information about FEMA's chain of command during the storm and FEMA's authorities, plans, and policies relevant to Hurricane Katrina. In addition, we requested after-action reports for past hurricanes, information about the activation of the National Response Plan, qualifications of key FEMA personnel, and contributions of contractors and subcontractors. Finally, we requested a description of the Coast Guard's role with respect to the National Response Plan and other domestic emergencies, specifically Hurricane Katrina. We wanted to know what components will act, who they will cooperate with, and in what capacity. We also requested information about search and rescue, such as command structures, regulations, and assets available. We also requested details about when the Coast Guard learned of certain key information before, during, and after Katrina. DHS responded to most of these requests from the Select Committee, including requests addressed to Secretary Chertoff, Acting Under Secretary Paulson, and Assistant Secretary Robert Steffen. The Department produced over 200,000 pages of documents, including 1. Briefing books, reports, 
and communications from the Secretary's office, two, communications from the Deputy Secretary's office, three, emails from Under Secretary Brown's office, four, emails from FEMA personnel involved in planning and response efforts, five, the National Response Plan, Hurricane Plans, New Orleans and Mobile Area Plans, Incident Action Plans, Operation Manuals and Planning Worksheets, and Katrina-specific plans. 6. Mission Assignments, Task Requests and Logs, Action Requests, Tracking Reports, and Situation Reports. 7. Tasking Logs and Requests. 8. Briefings. 9. Grant Program Documents. 10. Plan Shipments, Resource Tracking Reports, Commodity Maps, and Staging Areas. 11. Audits. 12. Katrina Maps and Graphics and 13 organizational charts. The Select Committee sent specific requests to the Department of Defense as well. We sent request letters to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the National Guard Bureau, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, and North Command, NORTHCOM. Specifically, we requested documents and communications from before August 23rd by officials of the Department of Defense or any constituent agencies related to the threat posed by a hurricane striking New Orleans or the Gulf Coast, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. We requested documents and communications from between August 23rd and August 29th by officials of the Department of Defense or any constituent elements related to the threat posed by Hurricane Katrina, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. And we requested documents and communications, including internal communications from between August 29th and September 15th, by officials of the Department of Defense or any DOD elements related to the impact of Hurricane Katrina, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. We also requested information about DOD's role and legal authority with respect to domestic emergencies and Hurricane Katrina. We wanted organizational charts, after-action reports, and plans with respect to national catastrophes. We requested information about DOD and the events of Hurricane Katrina, such as any guidance provided by the Secretary of Defense before landfall, the preparations made, specific actions taken, and personnel involved. We asked for information about Joint Task Force Katrina and on actions taken during Hurricane Katrina, specifically those of active duty troops and National Guard units, requests for assistance, and information on DOD's chain of command during the incident. The Select Committee initially received responses from the Department of Defense on behalf of Secretary Rumsfeld that only partially complied with the various requests. On November 18th, the Select Committee received a production from the Department containing execution orders, requests for forces, correspondence regarding National Guard authorizations, daily update briefings, and daily executive summaries. On December 14th, the Select Committee received further production containing the Joint Staff of Operations J3 redacted timeline outlining the Department's response actions to Hurricane Katrina and the Joint Task Force Katrina Commander's assessment briefings. In further response to the letter requests, on December 22nd, the Select Committee received the Assistant Secretary for Defense for Homeland Defense's Smart Book, responses to Senate interrogatories of September 28th, National Guard and NORTHCOM timelines, execute and deployment orders, NORTHCOM teleconference minutes, Captain Rick Snyder's, XO USS Bataan, lessons learned package, Vice Admiral Fitzgerald's emails, timelines, and notes, Second Fleet lessons learned, records of annual hurricane exercises, memo to Admiral Starling regarding naval assets in the region, information regarding helicopter assets, Rear Admiral Kilkenny's lessons learned brief, to the Chief of Naval Operations, NORTHCOM requests for forces, NORTHCOM deployment orders, NORTHCOM timeline, 
and twice daily joint operations center emails. In addition, the department produced Joint Forces Command, JFCOM, timeline and logs of verbal orders, JFCOM standard operating procedures, unified command plan, top off exercise paperwork, Commander Fleet Forces Command General Requirement for Humanitarian Response slash Disaster Relief, National Guard Bureau Readiness Documents, National Guard Bureau Senior Leadership Questions, and Katrina Effects on National Guard Bureau Readiness. Despite these significant productions, Chairman Davis was concerned that the communications of senior Defense Department officials, a priority in the first request to the Department, had not been produced. Consequently, after discussions with Representative Mellencon, he issued a subpoena to the Department of Defense on December 14th. The subpoena required the production of the correspondence of senior DOD officials related to Hurricane Katrina. On December 22nd, the Select Committee received documents responsive to the subpoena, including official correspondence from Assistant Secretary Paul McHale, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Peter Verga, Admiral Keating, Lieutenant General Honoré, Lieutenant General Blum, and Colonel John Jordan. On December 30th, the Select Committee received more documents responsive to the subpoena, including DOD official correspondence from Secretary Rumsfeld, Acting Deputy Secretary England, Colonel Daskovich, Brigadier General Sherling, Colonel Robertson, Colonel Chavez, Admiral Keating, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Verga. On January 13th, the Select Committee received further submissions of correspondence from Department officials including Brigadier General Graham, Major General Young. And on January 17th, the Select Committee received the emails of Major General Grass and Lieutenant General Vaughan. The Select Committee also requested information from the White House. Specifically, the Select Committee requested documents and communications from before August 23rd related to the threat posed by a hurricane striking New Orleans or the Gulf Coast, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. We requested documents and communications from between August 23rd and August 29th related to the threat posed by Hurricane Katrina, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. And we requested documents and communications from between August 29th and September 15th related to the impact of Hurricane Katrina, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. Initially, the White House produced more than 4,000 documents in response to these requests. However, the Select Committee was not satisfied with this initial production of documents. In a December 6 letter, William Kelly, White House Deputy Counsel, said the September 3rd and December 1st requests were too broad and asked the Select Committee to narrow their request. In response, the Select Committee insisted on briefings by senior administration officials and the production of certain items, including emails and documents from the White House Situation Room. As a result of our demands, a briefing was provided, and more than 12,000 pages of documents from the Executive Office of the President on the response to Hurricane Katrina were delivered on December 16th. The Select Committee made similar requests to the Vice President's Office, which responded with almost 6,000 pages of documents. While the Select Committee was disappointed and frustrated by the slow pace and general resistance to producing the requested documents by the White House and the Department of Defense, at the end of the day, the Select Committee believes it received enough information through documents, briefings, and interviews to understand the actions and decisions of those entities and reach sound findings on them, without implicating executive privilege. That's what this was about obtaining sufficient information, getting the documents and testimony we needed to make sure Americans are better prepared the next time. Ultimately, our public criticism of the administration's slow pace did the job. At our insistence, the White House provided Deputy Assistant to the President for Homeland Security, Ken Rapuano, for a briefing with staff and members. 
With the president in Texas, Homeland Security Advisor Francis Towsend out of the country, and Chief of Staff Andrew Card in Maine at the time of the storm, Rapuano offered the best view of White House knowledge and actions right before and right after Katrina. In fact, his briefing included more acknowledgments of institutional failure than we had received previously. The agreement with the White House gave us an opportunity to understand the White House role in Katrina while keeping the Select Committee on a parallel track with the Senate, which had not pursued White House subpoenas, and had not even subpoenaed DOD. A subpoena for White House documents would have simply derailed and delayed our inquiry, with the likelihood of a lengthy and unproductive court battle over executive privilege to follow. State. The Select Committee sent request letters to governmental components of the three states hit hardest by Hurricane Katrina, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. In each state, we requested information from both the Office of the Governor and the state's respective agency in charge of homeland security or emergency management. Specifically, the Select Committee asked each state's Governor's Office for documents or communications, including internal communications received, prepared, or sent, up to the date of September 15th, by state officials, related to the threat posed by a hurricane, mitigation measures or projects, emergency preparations, or emergency responses. Also, for each state's office in charge of homeland security or emergency management, the Select Committee requested information about that organization, including organization charts, the agency's responsibilities with respect to emergencies, regulations and procedures, after-action reports for past hurricanes, past requests for federal grants, budgets for the agencies, contractors and subcontractors that assisted with Katrina, a detailed chronology of events and actions taken during, before, and after the hurricane, key state personnel involved with Katrina, and all communications to and from the agencies relevant to the disaster. The Select Committee also requested any state, county, and local emergency plans, and the identity of state and local agencies involved in those plans. Finally, the Select Committee asked for documents from the past five years that evaluate the threats posed by hurricanes and any information about exercises to prepare for hurricanes. The Select Committee sent request letters to the Alabama Department of Homeland Security, ADHS, as well as the Office of Governor Bob Riley. The State of Alabama answered all questions and replied to all requests. The State provided the Alabama Emergency Management Plan, 26 different situation reports, the Governor's proclamations, a timeline, and four incident action plans. The State also provided communications, such as an MOU with Mississippi, Alabama County Emergency Management Standards, and state emergency procedures. In answering the select committee's questions, the state provided organization charts, key personnel, the roles and responsibilities of ADHS, and the Alabama Emergency Management Agency, AEMA, state and county emergency plans, and the state and local agencies involved in the response to Katrina. The state also provided risk assessments and after-action reports and information on exercises to prepare for disasters. Alabama also provided information on budgets for the past five years. The state also provided timelines, a list of actions taken by state agencies in response to Katrina, and a complete set of AEMA internal communications and action tracking system, EM2000, messages. The Select Committee sent requests to both the Louisiana Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, L-O-H-S-E-P, and to the Office of Governor Kathleen Blanco. After asking for a 90-day extension on October 26, due to the need to address immediate hurricane relief, the Governor fully responded on December 1st with tens of thousands of documents on their response and preparation for Hurricane Katrina, including an overview of the Governor's actions, executive orders and declarations, emergency preparedness plans, the LA Citizen Awareness and Disaster Evacuation Guide, official correspondence, organization charts, 
notes, and internal communications. Included was the response of the acting deputy director of LOHSEP, based on the best available information in that agency's possession at that time, including specific responses to the committee's questions in the original Senate committee letter. The Louisiana Attorney General's Office responded with additional information on January 11th, and also informed us that there would be a slight delay in sending two CDs containing emails of the Louisiana National Guard due to technical problems. Those CDs arrived February 2nd. The Select Committee sent request letters to both the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, and the Office of Governor Haley Barber. MEMA provided organization charts and a listing of key personnel. MEMA produced state plans, including the MS Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, CEMP Volume 2, Contra Flow Plan of August 2005, as well as many interagency state plans, such as plans from Louisiana, transportation evacuation plans, and parish city plans. MEMA provided risk assessments for hurricanes, floods, surges, and economic impacts. MEMA also included all Emergency Operations Center, EOC, maps of the state and local jurisdictions. MEMA provided information on plans and training exercises such as Hurricane Pam and Lifesaver 2004. Other items provided? Timeline of events and communications, such as director briefs, news releases, media advisories, MEMA situation reports, incident action plans, EM 2000 messages, and mission assignments. The documents produced by all three states and the federal government allowed the select committee to gain important insights into the workings of government entities stressed to the breaking point by a terrible disaster. They helped reveal the true nature of the relationship of state emergency management operations to the system of federal emergency management support. These documents allowed the select committee to reach conclusions about what worked well and what did not. Those conclusions will help improve preparation and response for the next disaster, protect the public, save lives, and reduce suffering. We don't pretend to have the entire universe of information related to the preparation for and response to Katrina, but we had more than enough to do our job. End of section 5, recording by Doug Shepard. Section 6 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepard. A Failure of Initiative. Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Background, Part 1. This report is a story about federal, state, and local emergency response plans and how they were or were not implemented before and after Katrina. Where there were problems, we asked why. Where even flawless execution led to unacceptable results, we returned to questioning the underlying plans. What this select committee has done is not rocket science. We have gathered facts and established timelines based on some fairly rudimentary but important questions posed to the right people in both the public and private sectors. What did you need and what did you get? Where were you in the days and hours right before, during, and after the storm? Who were you talking to? What were you doing? Does that match what you were supposed to be doing? Why or why not? In other words, the select committee has matched what was supposed to happen under federal, state, and local plans against what actually happened. Our findings emerge from this process of matching. In this lengthy background chapter, we beg your indulgence. We know that most readers do not care about acronyms or organizational charts, about authorities and capabilities, or the concepts of push versus pull. We know you simply want to know who was supposed to do what, when, and whether the job got done. 
and if it didn't get done, you want to know how are we going to make sure it does the next time. We provide this background on the framework for emergency management to set the stage for the story we will tell. To understand the failure of initiative, we need to first explain the tools that were available to so many. National Framework for Emergency Management General Role of FEMA Creation of DHS and FEMA's Absorption into the Department The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, or FEMA, was established in 1979 in an effort to consolidate many of the federal policies related to the management of emergencies, including preparedness, mitigation, disaster response, and recovery. Prior to FEMA's creation, through a mix of legislation and executive decisions, responsibility for federal emergency assistance, as well as the types of assistance and eligibility, underwent numerous changes. For example, administrative responsibility for assistance was shifted among a variety of federal departments, agencies, and the White House. In addition, the kinds of assistance the federal government provided and the types of organizations eligible were increased a number of times by, for example, adding provisions for disaster relief to small businesses and agricultural producers. By the late 1970s, these authorities and administrative changes had developed into a complex mix of federal emergency management missions, with which state, local, and federal officials were dissatisfied characterizing the situation as an inefficient maze of federal policies and responsible administrative entities. In 1978, following the incident at Three Mile Island, President Carter proposed reorganizing many of the emergency operational and coordination functions that had become dispersed throughout the federal government. In a reorganization plan submitted to Congress, the President proposed creating FEMA, FEMA, to administer many of the federal policies related to disasters, doing so based on a number of key principles. Federal authorities to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to major civil emergencies should be supervised by one official responsible to the President and given attention by other federal officials at the highest level. An effective civil defense system requires the most efficient use of all available resources, later embodied in the all-hazards approach through which civil defense capabilities would be available for any disaster, regardless of cause. Whenever possible, emergency responsibilities should be extensions of the regular missions of federal, state, and local agencies, later embodied in federal response plans through which FEMA coordinates and plans the assistance other federal agencies provide, rather than providing the assistance directly. Federal intervention should be minimized by emphasizing hazard mitigation and state and local preparedness, and federal hazard mitigation activities should be closely linked with emergency preparedness and response functions. The President's reorganization plan took effect in April 1979 through two executive orders, which created FEMA and assigned the various responsibilities previously dispersed throughout a number of other agencies. These included, among others, the coordination of civil defense, civil emergency planning and federal disaster relief, federal disaster preparedness, federal flood insurance authorities, dam safety, natural and nuclear disaster warning systems, and coordination of preparedness and planning to reduce the consequences of major terrorist incidents. To meet these responsibilities, FEMA focused on 1. Enhancing the capability of state and local governments to respond to disasters. 2. Coordinating with other federal agencies that provide resources to respond to disasters. 3. Giving federal assistance directly to citizens recovering from disasters. 4. Granting financial assistance to state and local governments. and 5. Providing leadership for hazard mitigation through grants, floodplain management, and other activities. FEMA's transfer to the Department of Homeland Security and role in disaster response. In 2002, Congress created the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, and placed FEMA within the new department. 
Specifically, the Homeland Security Act of 2002, HSA, established in DHS the Emergency Preparedness and Response, EPR, Directorate, placing FEMA, except for its terrorism preparedness functions, into EPR along with a number of additional entities and functions. For example, EPR also assumed responsibility for the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Emergency Preparedness, which manages the National Disaster Medical System, a network of federal, state, local, private sector, and civilian volunteer medical and support personnel, who augment local medical providers during disasters. In addition to these functional responsibilities, the HSA assigned to EPR responsibility for promoting the effectiveness of emergency responders, supporting the Nuclear Incident Response Team, NIRT, through standards, training exercises, and funding, managing, overseeing, and coordinating federal response resources, aiding disaster recovery, creating an intergovernmental national incident management system, consolidating existing federal response plans into one plan, ensuring emergency responders have interoperative communications technology, developing a coordinated strategy for public health-related activities, and using private sector resources. Federal versus state and local roles. Pull versus push system. The federal government responds to most natural disasters when the affected state or states requests help because the disaster is of such severity and magnitude that an effective response is beyond the capability of the state and local governments. This system, in use for most disasters, providing federal assistance in response to requests of the states or local governments via the states, is often referred to as a pull system, in that it relies on states to know what they need and be able to request it from the federal government. In practice, states may make these requests before disasters strike because of the near certainty that federal assistance will be necessary after such an event, example with hurricanes, or afterwards once they have conducted preliminary damage assessments and determined that their response capabilities are overwhelmed. In either case, the resources the federal government provides in any disaster response are intended to supplement state and local government resources devoted to the ongoing disaster relief and recovery effort. In certain instances, however, the federal response may also be considered a push system in which federal assistance is provided and or moved into the affected area prior to a disaster without waiting for specific requests from the state or local governments. As discussed below, DHS's National Response Plan includes a component the Catastrophic Incident Annex that outlines the kinds of events that can cause damage so massive that first responders, local governments, and state governments are unable to request or pull federal assistance in the immediate aftermath of the incident, creating a situation in which pushing the federal resources might be necessary. EMAC system to supplement state and local capabilities. Prior, or in addition, to seeking assistance from the federal governments, states are set up to help each other when disasters or emergencies overwhelm their capacity. States do so through participation in the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, EMAC or EMAC, an interstate mutual aid agreement among the member states to provide assistance after disasters overwhelm the affected state's capacity. Congress approved the creation of EMAC in 1996, building on the earlier efforts of the Southern Regional Emergency Compact that Florida and 16 other states created in 1993, after experiencing dissatisfaction with the state and federal response to Hurricane Andrew in 1992. EMAC provides the legal structure for states to request assistance from one another, as well as a menu of resources such as temporary shelters and cargo aircraft, which may be available from other member states. Importantly, this assistance can, and often does, come from participating states' National Guards. The National Emergency Management Association, the Professional Association of State Emergency Managers, administers the compact. 
Federal Authorities and Capabilities When an incident overwhelms, or is likely to overwhelm, state and local resources, the Stafford Act authorizes the President, in response to a request from the Governor of the affected state, to issue two types of declarations, emergency or major disaster. Emergency Declaration The Stafford Act defines an emergency as any occasion or instance for which, in the determination of the President, federal assistance is needed to supplement state and local efforts and capabilities to save lives and to protect property and public health and safety, or to lessen or overt the threat of a catastrophe in any part of the United States. An emergency declaration is more limited in scope than a major disaster declaration. Generally, federal assistance and funding for emergencies are provided to meet a specific need or to help prevent a major disaster from occurring. Emergency assistance under such a declaration may include grants to state and local governments for debris removal, direct assistance grants to individuals and households for temporary housing and other needs, and assistance to states in distributing medicine and food. Major Disaster Declaration A major disaster can result from a hurricane, earthquake, flood, tornado, or other incident that clearly overwhelms the ability of state or local governments to respond on their own. A presidential declaration of a major disaster usually occurs after local and state governments have responded with their own resources, such as the National Guard conducted damage assessments to determine losses and recovery needs, and determined that the disaster is of such severity and magnitude that an effective response is beyond the capabilities of the state and local governments. Such a declaration sets into motion federal assistance to and support of state and local response efforts as well as long-term federal recovery programs. Principles of the National Response Plan and the National Incident Management System. Broadly speaking, the overall structure for the federal response to most disasters consists of the National Response Plan and the National Incident Management System. The President issued Homeland Security Presidential Directive, HSPD 5, in February 2003, directing DHS to develop a new plan for responding to emergencies regardless of cause. Specifically, HSPD-5 required DHS to establish a single, comprehensive approach to the management of emergency events, whether the result of terrorist attacks or large-scale natural or accidental disasters. According to DHS, the intent of this plan is to align federal coordination structures, capabilities, and resources into a unified, all-discipline and all-hazards approach. To domestic incident management. To implement HSPD-5, DHS developed the National Incident Management System, NIMS, and the National Response Plan, NRP. In short, the NRP defines what needs to be done in a large-scale emergency event, and the NIMS defines how to manage it. The NRP describes the structure and mechanisms for coordinating federal support during emergencies or exercising direct federal authority. It uses the framework of the NIMS to integrate federal government domestic prevention, protection, response, and recovery plans into a single operational plan for all hazards and all emergency response disciplines. The NRP describes operational procedures for federal support to state, local, and tribal emergency managers and define situations in which federal authorities are to provide support and when federal authorities are to assume control. The NRP organizes capabilities, staffing, and equipment resources in terms of functions that are most likely to be needed during emergencies, such as communication or urban search and rescue, and spells out common processes and administrative requirements for executing the plan. DHS issued the NRP in December 2004 and used it for the first time in the preparation for and response to Hurricane Katrina. NIMS consists of six major components of a systems approach to domestic incident management. 
command and management, preparedness, resource management, communications and information management, supporting technologies, and ongoing management and maintenance. According to DHS, NIMS aligns the patchwork of federal special purpose incident management and emergency response plans into an effective and efficient structure. To do so, it defines the roles and responsibilities of federal, state, and local first responders during emergencies and establishes a core set of concepts, principles, terminology, and organizational processes to enable effective, efficient, and collaborative emergency event management at all levels. The concepts, principles, and processes underlying the NIMS are intended to improve the ability of different jurisdictions and first responder disciplines to work together in various areas, such as command and communications. NIMS, according to DHS, is based on an appropriate balance of flexibility and standardization. It allows government and private entities to use an adjustable national framework to work together managing domestic incidents, no matter their cause, size, location, or complexity, and, while doing so, provides a set of standardized organizational structures to improve interoperability among jurisdictions. Beginning in federal fiscal year 2005, state and local governments were required to adopt NIMS in order to receive federal DHS preparedness grants or contracts. The NRP consists of five components. 1. The base plan describes the structure and processes of a national approach to domestic incident management that integrates the efforts and resources of federal, state, local, tribal, private sector, and non-governmental organizations. It includes planning assumptions, example, state and local capabilities may be overwhelmed, roles and responsibilities, a concept of operations, incident management actions, and instructions for maintaining and periodically updating the plan. 2. Appendices provide relevant, detailed supporting information, such as statutory authorities and a compendium of national interagency plans. 3. Support annexes provide guidance and describe the functional processes and administrative requirements for meeting various plan objectives, such as logistics management and coordination with the private sector, including representatives of critical infrastructure resources. 4. Emergency support annexes spell out in detail the missions, policies, structures, and responsibilities of federal agencies for coordinating resource and programmatic support to state, local, and tribal governments, as well as other federal agencies. Each Emergency Support Function, ESF, has a coordinator with ongoing responsibilities throughout the incident, as well as one or more primary agencies responsible for accomplishing the ESF mission. Most ESFs also have support agencies responsible for assisting the primary agency or agencies. 5. Incident annexes address contingency or hazard situations requiring specialized application of the NRP for seven different types of incidents. Biological, catastrophic, cyber, food and agriculture, nuclear, radiological, oil and hazardous materials, and terrorism. Emergency Support Functions the ESFs are the primary vehicle through which the DHS directly responds to disasters and coordinates the direct responses of the other federal agencies as well as groups like the American Red Cross. For each of the 15 ESFs, DHS identifies a primary federal agency, or in one case a lead organization, the Red Cross. For most ESFs, DHS also identifies one or more support agencies. Primary agencies' responsibilities include orchestrating federal support for their ESF, managing mission assignments, and coordinating with state agencies, and executing contracts and procuring goods and services as needed. Support agencies' responsibilities include conducting operations at the request of DHS or the ESF primary agency, 
assisting with situation or damage assessments, and participating in training and other exercises having to do with their prevention, response, and recovery activities. The 15 ESFs and their overall purpose, primary and support agencies are as follows. Emergency Support Function 1. Transportation. Purpose. To support DHS, other federal agencies, state and local responders requiring transportation. Primary agency, the U.S. Department of Transportation. Supporting agencies, Agriculture, Forest Service, DOD, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, DHS, Interior. Emergency Support Function 2, Communications. Purpose, to ensure the provision of federal communication support to federal, state, local, and private sector response efforts during an incident of national significance. Supplement the National Plan for Telecommunication Support in Non-Wartime Emergencies, NTSB. Primary Agency, DHS, Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection, National Communication System. Support Agencies, Agriculture, Forest Service, Interior, FEMA. Emergency Support Function 3, Public Works and Engineering. Purpose, to coordinate and organize the capabilities and resources of the federal government to facilitate the delivery of services, technical assistance, engineering expertise, construction management, and other support relative to the condition of or damage to public works infrastructure and facilities. The primary agency, DOD, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, during response, and FEMA, during recovery. Supporting agencies, USDA, HHS, Interior, EPA, American Red Cross. Emergency Support Function 4. Firefighting. Purpose, to detect and suppress fires resulting from an incident of national significance by providing personnel, equipment, and supplies in support of state, local, and tribal agencies involved in firefighting operations. The primary agency, the Department of Agriculture Forest Service. Support Agencies, Commerce, DOD, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, DHS. Emergency Support Function 5, Emergency Management. Purpose, to support the overall activities of the federal government for domestic incident management by providing the core management and administrative support functions in support of NRCC, RRCC, and JFO operations. ESF 5 is the support ESF for all federal departments and agencies, from prevention to response and recovery. Primary Agency, FEMA. Support Agencies, none. Emergency Support Function 6, Mass Care, Housing, and Human Services. Purpose, to support the state, regional, local, and tribal government and non-governmental efforts to address the non-medical mass care, housing, and human services needs of individuals affected by incidents of national significance. Mass care includes organizing feeding operations and coordinating bulk distribution of emergency relief items. Housing involves providing short-term and long-term assistance with housing needs. And human services includes counseling and identifying support for special needs populations. The primary agency is FEMA and American Red Cross. The support agencies, Agriculture, U.S. Corps of Engineers, DHS, National Disaster Medical System, and Interior. Emergency Support Function 7, Resource Support. Purpose, to assist DHS in supporting federal, state, and local agencies prior to, during, and after incidents of national significance with emergency relief supplies, facility space, office equipment, office supplies, telecommunications, and other services. The primary agency is GSA. The support agencies, DHS. Emergency Support Function 8. Public Health and Medical Services. Purpose, to provide coordinated federal assistance to supplement state and local resources in response to public health and medical care needs for incidents of national significance. Federal support can consist of assessment of public health needs, public health surveillance, medical care personnel, and medical equipment and supplies. Primary Agency, HHS. Support Agencies, DOD, 
U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, DHS, DOT, American Red Cross. Emergency Support Function 9, Urban Search and Rescue. Purpose, to rapidly deploy the National Urban Search and Rescue, USNR, response system to provide specialized assistance to state and local authorities during an incident of national significance. USNR activities include locating and extracting victims and providing on-site medical assistance. Primary Agency, FEMA. Support Agencies, Agriculture, Forest Service, DOD, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, DHS, U.S. Coast Guard, DHS, Border and Transportation Security Directorate, DOT, USAID. Emergency Support Function 10, Oil and Hazardous Material Response. Purpose, to provide a coordinated response to actual or potential oil and hazardous materials discharges or releases during incidents of national significance. ESF-10 operates by placing the mechanisms of the National Oil and Hazardous Substance Pollution Contingency Plan, NCP, within the broader NRP coordination structure. The NCP describes the National Response System, an organized network of agencies, programs, and resources with authorities and responsibilities in oil and hazardous materials response. Primary Agency, EPA, DHS, U.S. Coast Guard. Support Agencies, Commerce, NOAA. Emergency Support Function 11, Agriculture and Natural Resources. Purpose, to support state, local, tribal, and other federal agencies' efforts to 1. Address the provisions of nutrition assistance, including determining needs, obtaining appropriate food supplies, and arranging for delivery of the supplies. 2. Control and eradication of disease outbreaks and plant infestations. 3. Assurance of food safety and security and 4. Protection of natural and cultural resources and historic NCH properties. Primary Agency, Department of Agriculture, Department of Interior, NCH properties. Support Agencies, DOD, American Red Cross. Emergency Support Function 12, Energy. Purpose, to restore damaged energy systems and components during a potential or actual incident of national significance. Collect, evaluate, and share information on energy system damage and estimations on the impact of energy system outages within affected areas. Primary Agency, Department of Energy. Support Agencies, Agriculture, Rural Utilities Service, Commerce, NOAA, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, DHS, Interior, Department of Labor, Department of State, EPA, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Tennessee Valley Authority. Emergency Support Function 13, Public Safety and Security. Purpose, to provide via federal to federal support or federal support to state and local authorities a mechanism for coordinating and providing non-investigative, non-criminal law enforcement, public safety and security capabilities and resources. Primary Agency, DHS, Department of Justice. Support Agencies, Agriculture, DHS, Border and Transportation Security Directorate, DHS, Customs and Border Protection, DHS, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Interior. Emergency Support Function 14. Long-Term Community Recovery and Mitigation. Purpose, to provide a framework for federal support to enable community recovery from the long-term consequences of an incident of national significance. Primary Agency, Agriculture, Commerce, DHS, slash FEMA, HUD, Treasury, SBA. Support Agencies, Commerce, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Energy, HHS, DHS, Interior, Department of Labor, DOT, EPA, Tennessee Valley Authority, American Red Cross. Emergency Support Function 15, External Affairs. Purpose, to provide accurate, coordinated, and timely information to affected audiences, including governments, media, the private sector, and the local populace. Primary Agency, FEMA. Support Agencies, Commerce, slash NOAA, Department of Justice, 
Corporation for National and Community Service. End of section six. Recording by Doug Shepherd. Section seven of a failure of initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepherd. A Failure of Initiative Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives Background Part 2 Catastrophic Disasters and Incidents of National Significance INS Recognizing that certain disasters are so different in terms of size, scope, and damage, that they require a response above and beyond the normal procedures for emergencies and major disasters, DHS defines and has distinct plans for the federal response to catastrophic disasters. Specifically, DHS defines a catastrophic event as any natural or man-made incident, including terrorism, that results in extraordinary levels of mass casualties, damage, or disruption severely affecting the population, infrastructure, environment, economy, national morale, and or government functions. A catastrophic event could result in sustained national impacts over a prolonged period of time. Almost immediately exceeds resources available to state, local, tribal, and private sector authorities in the impacted area, and significantly interrupts governmental operations and emergency services to such an extent that national security could be threatened. Using this definition, DHS makes a number of assumptions about the scenarios that would unfold before, during, and after a catastrophic disaster and attempts to structure the federal response to address those assumptions and their ramifications. DHS assumes a catastrophic incident results in large numbers of casualties and or displaced persons. The incident may cause significant disruption of the area's critical infrastructure, including transportation, telecommunications, and public health and medical systems. Response activities may have to begin without the benefit of a detailed or complete situation and needs assessment because a detailed, credible operating picture may not be possible for 24 or 48 hours or longer after the incident. The federal government may have to mobilize and deploy assets before local and state governments request them via normal protocols, because timely federal support may be necessary to save lives, prevent suffering, and mitigate severe damage. And, large numbers of people may be left temporarily or permanently homeless and require temporary or long-term interim housing. Consequently, in anticipation of or soon after a catastrophic incident, DHS is expected to rapidly and proactively provide critical resources to assist and augment the ongoing state and local responses. To do so, when the Secretary of DHS declares a disaster to be catastrophic, the Department also implements the Catastrophic Incident Annex of the National Response Plan. DHS characterizes this annex as establishing the context and overarching strategy for implementing and coordinating an accelerated proactive national response to certain catastrophic disasters. When this annex is implemented, all federal agencies and others with responsibility under the Emergency Support Functions ESFs, of the National Response Plan are supposed to immediately begin operations. Specifically, DHS expects the federal government and others will need to provide expedited help in one or more of the following areas. Mass care, shelter, food, emergency first aid, etc., housing and human services. Urban search and rescue, such as locating, extricating and providing on-site medical treatment decontamination in incidents involving weapons of mass destruction, 
public health and medical support, medical equipment and supplies, casualty and fatality management and transportation for deceased, injured, or exposed victims, and public information when state and local public communication channels are overwhelmed. Because of fundamental and time-critical differences in catastrophic disasters, FEMA has established protocols to pre-identify and rapidly deploy essential resources. Among other things, FEMA assumes the demands of responding to a catastrophic disaster may mean it has to expedite or even temporarily suspend normal operating procedures for state and local governments to request assistance, doing so proactively rather than in response to things like specific requests based on detailed damage assessments. For catastrophic incidents, DHS is supposed to activate and deploy DHS-managed teams, equipment caches, and other resources in order to accelerate the timely provision of critically skilled resources and capabilities. These can include medical and search and rescue teams, transportable shelters, and preventative and therapeutic pharmaceutical caches that may be necessary to save lives and contain damage. Incidents of National Significance DHS defines incidents of national significance, INS, as those high-impact events that require a coordinated and effective response by an appropriate combination of federal, state, local, tribal, private sector, and non-governmental entities in order to save lives, minimize damage, and provide the basis for long-term community recovery and mitigation activities. All catastrophic incidents are also incidents of national significance. DHS bases this definition of an INS on criteria drawn from HSPD-5. A federal department or agency acting under its own authority has requested the assistance of the Secretary of Homeland Security. The resources of state and local authorities are overwhelmed and federal assistance has been requested by the appropriate state and local authorities in response to major disaster declarations under the Stafford Act, or catastrophic incidents, as defined by DHS above. More than one federal department or agency has become substantially involved in responding to an incident, for example, in response to credible threats or warnings of imminent terrorist attacks, and the President directs the Secretary of Homeland Security to assume responsibility for managing a domestic incident. Managing the federal response to emergencies and disasters and implementing the National Response Plan. To respond to a disaster or a potential situation that is likely to require a federal response, DHS, on its own or acting via FEMA, uses existing Homeland Security monitoring operations creates or activates operational components to manage the federal response, and designates one or more officials to coordinate. The operational components DHS uses, or which can be activated, include the Homeland Security Operations Center, HSOC, the Interagency Incident Management Group, IIMG, a National or Regional Coordination Center, NRCC or RRCC, Emergency Response Teams, an advanced element, ERT-A, and a national team, ERT-N, and the Joint Field Office, JFO, which can have one or two high-level officials directing and coordinating the federal response. Homeland Security Operations Center The Homeland Security Operations Center, which represents over 35 agencies including state and local law enforcement, as well as federal intelligence agencies, is always in operation. It provides situational awareness and monitors conditions in the United States and, in conjunction with the DHS Office of Information Analysis, issues advisories and bulletins concerning specific threats to the nation. The HSOC continually monitors potential major disasters and emergencies and, when an event occurs, or as likely, provides primary situational awareness to the Secretary and the White House. 
Depending on the nature of the incident and the response it demands, the HSOC may activate the Interagency Incident Management Group, IIMG. Interagency Incident Management Group DHS is supposed to convene the IIMG when it declares a situation to be an incident of national significance. In addition, DHS should convene the IIMG when it determines that there is a need to do so in response to incidents such as major disasters, a heightened threat situation, or high-profile large-scale events that present high-risk targets such as National Special Security Events, NSSEs. The IIMG is composed of senior representatives from other DHS agencies, other federal departments and agencies, and non-governmental organizations such as the American Red Cross, as needed. When activated, the IIMG 1. maintains strategic situational awareness of threat assessments and ongoing incident-related operations and activities. 2. Provides decision-making support for incident-related prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery efforts. 3. Synthesizes key intelligence, frames issues, and makes recommendations with respect to policy, operational courses of action, and resource allocation. 4. Anticipates evolving federal resource and operational requirements and 5. Maintains ongoing coordination with the Principal Federal Official, PFO, and the Joint Field Office, JFO, Coordination Group. Regional Response Coordination Center, National Response Coordination Center. For most major disasters, incidents, or emergencies, DHS, via FEMA, establishes a Regional Response Coordination Center, RRCC using staff from regional offices. The RRCC coordinates the initial regional and field activities such as deployment of advanced teams of FEMA and other agency staff and implements local federal program support until a multi-agency coordination center can be established. Depending on the scope and impact of the event, DHS via FEMA may also establish a National Response Coordination Center NRCC, comprised of ESF representatives and FEMA support staff to carry out initial activation and mission assignment operations from FEMA headquarters. The NRCC supports the operations of the RRCC. Emergency Response Team Advanced Element National Emergency Response Team FEMA's Emergency Response Team, ERT, is the principal interagency group that staffs the multi-agency coordination center where federal, state, and local officials coordinate and direct response and recovery operations. Each FEMA region maintains an ERT ready to deploy in response to threats or incidents. Before a disaster or incident, when there is a warning, or soon thereafter, the RRCC typically deploys an Emergency Response Team Advanced Element, ERT-A, to the affected area or areas. The ERTA conducts preliminary damage and needs assessments and begins coordinating with the state as well as any federal resources that may be part of the initial deployment. For large-scale high-impact events or when FEMA otherwise determines it is needed, FEMA also deploys a National Emergency Response Team, ERT-N, which is a national-level field response team. FEMA currently has two ERT-Ns. Joint Field Office The Joint Field Office, JFO, is a multi-agency coordination center that FEMA establishes locally to serve as the central point for coordinating and directing the efforts of the federal, state, and local officials involved in the response effort. Often, FEMA establishes the JFO at the state's emergency operations center or other locations from which the affected state is directing response efforts. For a Stafford Act emergency or major disaster declaration, the President must designate a Federal Coordinating Officer, FCO, to direct all Federal assistance in the disaster area. During an incident of national significance, which may or may not involve a Stafford Act declaration, 
the Secretary of DHS may designate a principal federal official, PFO, to act as the Secretary's representative in overseeing and executing incident management responsibilities. The FCO is responsible for managing and coordinating federal assistance in response to declared disasters and emergencies. The FCO has the authority, under the Stafford Act, to request and direct federal agencies to use their authorities and resources to support or conduct response and recovery operations. The FCO provides overall coordination for the federal components of the JFO and works in partnership and support of the state officials to determine and meet state and local needs for assistance. The PFO is the primary point of contact and source of situational awareness for the Secretary of DHS for incidents of national significance. The PFO is expected to facilitate federal support to the unified command structure that is set up in conjunction with state and local officials. Also, PFOs coordinate the overall federal incident management and assistance activities throughout all phases of emergency management, prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. In carrying out this coordination role, the PFO does not have direct authority over the FCO or other federal and state officials. The role of DOD, the National Guard, and the U.S. Coast Guard. The Department of Defense, DOD, makes a distinction between homeland security and homeland defense in defining mission responsibilities. Whereas homeland security refers to a concerted national effort to secure the homeland from threats and violence, including terrorism, homeland defense refers to military protection of United States territory, domestic population, and critical defense infrastructure against external threats and aggression. In the context of homeland security, DOD operates only in support of a civilian-led federal agency referred to as Civil Support, CS. In the area of Homeland Defense, HD, however, DOD is the lead agency. The Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense, ASDHD, is charged with leading the Department's activities in Homeland Defense and serves as DOD's interagency liaison. Under the National Response Plan, NRP, and the recently released DOD Joint Doctrine on Homeland Security, military support to civil authorities, MSCA, is normally provided only when local, state, and other federal agencies are overwhelmed, and the lead federal agency, LFA, responding to an incident or natural disaster requests assistance. This is a fundamental principle of DOD's approach to civil support. It is generally a resource of last resort. An exception is in cases of immediate response authority, a scenario entailing imminent serious conditions resulting from any civil emergency or attack requiring immediate action where local military commanders may take such action as necessary to save lives, prevent human suffering, and mitigate great property damage. The federal military role described in the NRP and the MSCA is apart from National Guard resources available to governors of affected states. Governors may utilize their own National Guard units, as well as other National Guard's units made available by state EMAC compacts. In most circumstances, National Guard troops fall under the command of the governor and the state adjutant general and they follow state emergency procedures. When in state active duty status, the National Guard remains under the command of the governor, not DOD. The National Guard can also be federalized by the president to be placed under the command of DOD. As discussed below, a governor may also seek Title 32 status for the National Guard, which leaves the governor and the state adjutant general in command but provides federal funding and benefits. Natural Disasters and Man-Made Disasters In the event of a natural disaster or emergency, the NRP stipulates that DOD may be asked to provide assistance to DHS and FEMA in an attempt to save lives, protect property, and lessen the threat of catastrophe in the United States. When disasters occur and a military response is anticipated, DHS-FEMA 
will request a Defense Coordinating Officer, DCO, to serve as the single DOD point of contact within the disaster area. The DCO will be the operational contact to the designated combatant commander and designated Joint Task Force JTF commander. In situations when a disaster is anticipated and DOD wants to be forward-leaning, Northern Command has designated a DCO prior to a DHS-FEMA request. This is done informally and is intended to allow the DCO to integrate into the State Emergency Operations Center, EOC, as early as possible to begin assessing the needs of the affected area. This has been done in the absence of a presidential directive and before state authorities have made specific requests for DOD support via FEMA. Additionally, the doctrine of immediate response is a DOD directive which allows deployment of some DOD resources prior to receiving formal requests from the lead federal agency. Northern Command Within the DOD Joint Staff, civil support responsibilities reside with the Joint Director of Military Support. Northern Command, NORTHCOM, is the DOD Coordinating Command for Domestic Terrorist and Natural Disaster Incidents. Northern Command carries out civil support missions with forces assigned as required from all the armed services, typically through the creation of a joint task force. NORTHCOM has a permanently assigned Joint Interagency Coordination Group, comprised of liaison officers from other DOD components and other federal agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security. As discussed above, unless there is a specific direction from the President, requests for military assistance must originate from a lead federal agency. Typically, this falls to FEMA in natural disasters. Requests are submitted to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, OSD, where they are evaluated by the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense, ASDHD, according to the following criteria, legality, readiness, lethality, risk, cost, and appropriateness. Once the requests are approved by OSD, they are forwarded to the Joint Director of Military Support within the Joint Staff, who in turn provides the appropriate orders to Northern Command. A Defense Coordinating Officer is designated and deployed to the area of incident. When the size of the response is of greater scale, a Joint Task Force will be created, with the DCO normally serving as Task Force Commander. The DCO then serves as the single point of contact for DOD resources, but does not have operational control of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or National Guard personnel operating in state activity or Title 32 status. The process for requesting DOD active duty forces has several layers of review. Requests for DOD assistance are to be generated at the state level. These go from the state to FEMA's Federal Coordinating Officer, who in turn requests assistance from the DCO. The DCO passes these requests to the Joint Task Force, which routes it through NORTHCOM to the Office of the Secretary of Defense Executive Secretariat to the Joint Directorate of Military Support. At each stage, the requirement is validated to ensure that the request can be met and that it is legal to provide the requested assets. Once vetted, the request is tasked to the services and coordinated with Joint Forces Command and forces or resources are then allocated to the Joint Task Force which in turn gets the support down to the user level by way of the DCO. This process is in place not only to satisfy DOD internal requirements, but to ensure maximum coordination with both FEMA and state governments. National Guard Bureau The National Guard is the nation's first military responder to events within the United States. Governors historically rely on the Guard to assist civilian authorities during times of natural or man-made disasters. In particular, the National Guard is a major asset in responding to any catastrophic incident within the United States. The National Guard is a reserve component of the Departments of the Army and the Air Force, at times called in to support federal operations. The National Guard is also a force for each state. 
deploying four state duty status under the control of the governor. Only the National Guard has the unique dual mission of providing forces at both state and federal level, and is the only service that abides by two oaths of office, one to the governor and one to the President of the United States. The governor has command and control of the National Guard, either in state activity or Title 32 status, unless units are federalized. If federalized under Title 10, the Guard falls under the command and control of the President. While on state active duty status, the Guard's mission is to serve its state or territory during times of crisis, disaster, civil disturbance, or other threats to life and property, as directed by the Governor. They are funded by state dollars and are entitled to state benefits and compensation. Under Title 32 status, the National Guard is trained and resourced to support federal war fighting operations, yet remains under control of the Governor, while supported by federal funds with Secretary of Defense approval. During Hurricane Katrina, the Governors of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana requested that all National Guard forces deployed to their states operate under Title 32 status. This request was granted retroactively to August 29th by the Secretary of Defense. Under Title 32, the Governors were in command of all National Guard assets and actions during Hurricane Katrina. The National Guard may also be called up by a Governor at his or her own initiative, paid by the State, to respond to a State emergency or protect State facilities. Many States do not have the fiscal resources to use the National Guard extensively in this manner. The National Guard Bureau, NGB, is the home of the leadership of the National Guard, headed by a Chief, who is supported by the Director of Army National Guard and the Director of the Air National Guard. These positions, filled by Military Guard personnel, are Title X positions. The current Chief of the National Guard Bureau is Lt. Gen. H. Stephen Blum, and although he is the Senior Guard Officer, he does not command National Guard forces. Lt. Gen. Daniel James III is the Director of the Air National Guard, and Lt. Gen. Clyde A. Vaughan is Director of the Army National Guard. Under the National Response Plan, the role of the National Guard Bureau is not defined. However, in roughly 50% of the states and territories, the Adjutant General also serves as the state's senior emergency management official, responsible for coordinating and integrating all response agencies. The National Guard Bureau and the National Guard of the individual states and territories work on a daily basis with local, state, and federal civilian agencies in various communities in all of the states and territories. United States Coast Guard The Coast Guard is a military, multi-mission maritime service within the Department of Homeland Security and one of the nation's five armed services. Since its founding as the Revenue Cutter Service in 1790, the Coast Guard has provided maritime safety and security capabilities and is renowned worldwide for its Search and Rescue, SAR, capabilities, whether near shore or hundreds of miles at sea. Title 14 of the United States Code requires the Coast Guard to develop, establish, maintain, and operate rescue facilities for the promotion of safety on, under, and over the high seas and waters subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Additionally, with the passage of the Maritime Transportation Security Act, MTSA, in 2002, the Coast Guard was given added responsibilities for the enforcement of port safety, security, and maritime environmental regulations, including the protection and security of vessels, harbors, and waterfront facilities, deep water ports, and waterways safety. The Coast Guard has a long-standing history in the Gulf of Mexico region. The current 8th Coast Guard District, headquartered in New Orleans, covers all or part of 26 states throughout the Gulf Coast and heartland of America. It stretches from the Appalachian Mountains and Chattahoochee River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west and from the U.S.-Mexican border in the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border in North Dakota, which includes 15,490 miles of coastline and 10,300 miles of 
inland navigable waterways. Within the Coast Guard's district boundaries, the operational Coast Guard is organized into sectors, which oversee response, prevention, and logistics units, and coordinate Coast Guard operations within the sector's geographic boundaries. The areas most affected by Hurricane Katrina are those that fall within the boundaries of Sector New Orleans and Sector Mobile, Alabama. End of Section 7, recording by Doug Shepard. Section 8 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepard. A Failure of Initiative. Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Background, Part 3. Private Authorities and Capabilities. Role of the American Red Cross. The American Red Cross, Red Cross, is the only non-governmental organization with lead agency responsibilities under the NRP. The Red Cross is an independent non-governmental organization, NGO, that operates as a non-profit, tax-exempt, charitable institution, pursuant to a charter granted by the United States Congress. It has the legal status of a, quote, federal instrumentality, unquote, due to its charter requirements to carry out responsibilities delegated by the federal government. Among those responsibilities are to perform all duties incumbent upon a national society in accordance with the spirit and conditions of the Geneva Convention, to which the United States is a signatory, to provide family communications and other forms of assistance to members of the U.S. military, and to maintain a system of domestic and international disaster relief, including mandated responsibilities under the Federal Response Plan coordinated by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, FEMA. The Red Cross is not a federal agency nor does it receive federal funding on a regular basis to carry out its services and programs. It receives financial support from voluntary public contributions and from cost recovery charges for some services. Its stated mission is to, quote, provide relief to victims of disasters and help people prevent, prepare for, and respond to emergencies, unquote. To meet its mandated responsibilities under the NRP, the Red Cross functions as an ESF primary organization in coordinating the use of mass care resources in a presidentially declared disaster or emergency. As the lead agency for ESF No. 6, dealing with mass care, housing and human services, the Red Cross assumes the role of providing food, shelter, emergency first aid, disaster welfare information, and bulk distribution of emergency relief items. ESF-6 includes three primary functions, mass care, housing, and human services. Mass care involves the coordination of non-medical care services to include sheltering of victims, organizing feeding operations, providing emergency first aid at designated sites, collecting and providing information on victims to family members, and coordinating bulk distribution of emergency relief items. Housing involves the provision of assistance for short-term and long-term housing needs of victims. Human services include providing victim-related recovery efforts, such as counseling, identifying support for persons with special needs, expediting processing of new federal benefits claims, assisting in collecting crime victim compensation for acts of terrorism, and expediting mail services in affected areas. Function 1. Mass Care The NRP describes the mass care function as comprised of six elements. Coordination, shelter, feeding, emergency first aid, disaster welfare information, DWI, and bulk distribution. 
The coordination element relates to assisting victims obtain various forms of available federal assistance, as well as gathering information about shelters and food kitchens for victims. The shelter element includes the use of pre-identified shelters, creating temporary facilities capable of housing victims and coordination of obtaining shelters outside of the immediate incident area. The feeding element includes a variety of food distribution sites, from mobile food carts to kitchens to bulk distribution of food. The emergency first aid element consists of assisting victims with the most basic first aid needs, as well as coordinating the referral of victims to local hospitals, if needed, and other appropriate medical treatment options. The Disaster Welfare Information, DWI, element provides for family connectedness services. It aims to reconnect families displaced or separated by the incident as well as assist victims of the incident to connect with family or friends located outside the area of the incident. The bulk distribution element provides emergency relief items, principally ice, water and food, at specific sites to meet the urgent needs of victims within the affected area. Function 2. Housing. The housing function addresses both the short-term and long-term housing needs of victims affected by an incident. It is effectuated through programs designed to meet the individualized needs of victims and includes a variety of options, including provisions of temporary housing, rental assistance, or financial assistance for the repair or replacement of original residences. Function 3. Human Services. The Human Services function implements programs and services to assist victims restore their livelihoods. It acts as a broad-based, multi-purpose effort to support divergent needs such as rerouting of mail, assistance with processing federal benefits-related paperwork, assuring the provision of necessary mental health services, and providing other important, sometimes victim-specific services. The wide range of services may include support for victims with disabilities and victims who do not speak English. With its shelters, feeding kitchens, and blood distribution capabilities, the Red Cross has long played an important role in assisting those affected by natural disasters, especially hurricanes. Due to the frequency of hurricanes in the United States, the Red Cross has developed an expertise in deploying its resources and operational capabilities to help those affected by hurricanes. In its 23-page Tropical Storm and Hurricane Action Plan, the Hurricane Plan, the Red Cross outlines its systematic approach to preparing for and responding to storms and hurricanes. The report says, quote, The objective of this plan is to enable the Red Cross to be ready to deliver immediate services and assistance needed by those threatened and affected by such storms at an appropriate scope and scale." Unquote. Additionally, as the NRP model to disaster planning takes shape, the Red Cross's preparation regime is being bolstered with a standard operating procedure document for ESF No. 6. Although not formally adopted, and still in the draft stage, the document identifies the procedures, protocols, information flows, and organizational relationships for the activation, implementation, and operation of the Red Cross responsibilities under ESF No. 6. There is also an Interim Shelter Operations Management Toolkit, which provides Red Cross chapters and shelter managers with resources to plan, open, operate, and close shelters. Adhering to the concept of all disasters being local, the Red Cross relies on its field chapters to act as first responders in opening shelters and providing for the feeding of those in need. The first 48 hours of a disaster are usually handled by the local Red Cross chapters and thereafter by national level support as both the federal government, FEMA, and the Red Cross National Headquarters begin to reach the affected area. The National Red Cross is structured to provide relief mostly shelter and feeding, from days 2 through 30 of a disaster. The local chapter ultimately is supported by its service area, of which there are eight in the United States, 
followed by support from national headquarters in Washington, D.C. For disasters such as hurricanes, the Red Cross's actions prior to landfall typically begin with activating the chapter response plans in all of the areas threatened by the storm. Simultaneously, the jurisdictional service areas move into the service area major disaster response structure, disaster response structure. At this time, the service areas establish their contacts with the affected state's emergency operations center, EOC. This often involves positioning a Red Cross official at the state EOC. The service area then begins deploying resources to the threatened areas as called for under the chapter's planning requirements. Also, at this pre-landfall time, a Disaster Relief Operations Headquarters is established. During the pre-landfall stage, the local chapter is to focus on several key activities. Sheltering, feeding, public information, fundraising, and maintaining contact with government officials, especially emergency management officials. While the chapter response operation is arming itself with the necessary resources, the service areas shift into their disaster response structure. The service area personnel are responsible for implementing the necessary facility arrangements so that storm victims can be sheltered and fed. The service area also deploys additional personnel to the chapter regions. Once the disaster response structure is opened, the National Headquarters shifts its Disaster Operations Center into Hurricane Response Mode. At this point, personnel from Headquarters Preparedness and Response Division are able to monitor developments and deploy additional resources as necessary. Following landfall of a hurricane, the affected chapters continue their focus on the key activities of sheltering, feeding, disaster assessment, providing public information, and liaising with government officials. After the shelters and feeding kitchens are opened, the chapters expand their role to include bulk distribution of supplies. Supplies include toiletries packages, clothing and blankets, and as the storm passes, clean up supply packs, including mops, rakes, trash bags, and cleaning supplies to assist storm victims clean their residences and neighborhoods. As the impact of the disaster becomes better understood, a Disaster Relief Operations Headquarters is established in the region. The Operations Headquarters is activated, meaning operational oversight and direction of Red Cross relief activities is transferred to the on-site headquarters. As the Disaster Headquarters staffs up, the service area's role decreases. Outside of the affected region, other service areas and the national headquarters remain poised to assist as necessary. The main opportunities for other service areas involve shifting resources, such as cots, blankets, and other warehouse supplies, to the affected region. Personnel at national headquarters monitor events in the field and leverage relationships with national agreements with suppliers, partner groups, and agencies. Service Area Major Disaster Response Structure Upon the approach of a threatening hurricane, the service area reconfigures its structure, priorities, and actions to provide support, guidance, and resource assistance to its threatened chapters. The disaster response structure, led by a response manager, is comprised of four departments or cells. These are the Planning Cell, Forward Headquarters Cell, information and resource management cell, and the service area response operations. Planning cell. The planning cell is focused on ensuring adequate services and logistics support. The planning cell develops an anticipated service delivery plan and deploys the forward headquarters cell, which enables the relief operations to begin service delivery immediately after the storm makes landfall. The planning cell is tasked with determining the necessary scope of Red Cross service delivery, an estimated budget, and the estimated length of time needed to serve the affected area. The planning cell is the heart of decision making as it relates to what people need, where they need it, and, based on a damage assessment, how long will services be necessary. Response Manager 
The response manager oversees the disaster response. The manager's responsibilities include ensuring adequate levels of staffing throughout the response organization, conducting staff meetings with the disaster response team, leading conference calls with the affected chapters, ensuring that adequate reports are compiled for coordination with state and federal emergency management officials, and assuring the sufficient movement of assets, both human and material, to the affected region. Forward Headquarters Cell The forward headquarters cell is the deployed unit of the planning cell. Its most important task is to establish a relief operation headquarters and to receive Red Cross personnel, both paid Red Cross employees and volunteers, and material resources. Essentially, this group serves as the advanced team prior to the opening of a headquarters operation near the affected area. Information and Resource Management Cell The Information and Resource Management Cell is a tactical team that concentrates on gathering information and supporting the local chapters in the evacuation of people. While the Red Cross does not physically transport evacuees, it is often the recipient of a large percentage of evacuees as shelters are established. This group establishes reporting requirements, coordinates data gathering, such as shelter tallies, monitors the inbound flow of resources to the shelters, helps acquire vehicles, and handles all issues related to the immediate deployment of resources including maintaining computer systems, managing supply warehouses, and ensuring all invoices are properly processed. Service Area Response Operations The day-to-day -day paid operations staff of the service area coordinate fundraising and communications and provide the institutional knowledge of the affected area. Armed with the right data and knowledge of the area, the Information and Resources Management Cell can help provide essential services to those in need. State, local, and private authorities and capabilities. Typical local and state emergency management responsibilities. Whether the response is coming from local or state officials, or both, most emergency management agencies and government plans assume it may take 24 to 72 hours to get assistance to individuals, particularly those who remain in affected areas. Consequently, successful emergency management can, in part, depend on individuals' willingness to evacuate to places where more immediate assistance may be available, when time and circumstances permit, and or their preparedness to survive independently for 24 to 72 hours that responders expect it will take to first deliver assistance. Nonetheless, as discussed elsewhere in this report, Primary responsibility for the first response to any potential or imminent incident or disaster begins, and often stays, at the local and state levels. In most situations, emergency management in the U.S. envisions a process of escalation up from the local level as incidents grow or as it becomes known that an incident has overwhelmed local and state capabilities. Local Emergency Management First responders, local fire, police, and emergency medical personnel who respond to all manners of incidents, such as earthquakes, storms, and floods, have the lead responsibility for carrying out emergency management efforts. Their role is to prevent, protect against, respond to, and assist in the recovery from emergencies, including natural disasters. Typically, first responders are trained and equipped to arrive first at the scene of an accident and take action immediately, including entering the scene, setting up a command center, evacuating those at the scene, tending to the injured, redirecting traffic, and removing debris. Local governments, cities, towns, counties, or parishes, and the officials who lead them are responsible for developing the emergency operations and response plans by which their communities respond to disasters and other emergencies, including terrorist attacks. Local emergency management directors are also generally responsible for providing training to prepare for disaster response, and they seek assistance from their state emergency management agencies when the situation exceeds or exhausts local capabilities. In many states, 
They may also negotiate and enter into mutual aid agreements with other jurisdictions to share resources when, for example, nearby jurisdictions are unaffected by the emergency and are able to provide some assistance. Particularly relevant to the preparation for Hurricane Katrina, local officials have significant responsibilities for either setting evacuation laws and policies or working with their state government to enforce state laws pertaining to evacuations. According to the National Response Plan, depending on the terms of the state or local laws, local officials have, quote, extraordinary powers, unquote, to, among other things, order evacuations. In addition, local officials may suspend local laws and order curfews. State Emergency Management As the state's chief executive, the governor is responsible for the public safety and welfare of the state's citizens and generally has wide-ranging emergency management responsibilities, including requesting federal assistance when it becomes clear the state's capabilities will be insufficient or have been exhausted. Governors are responsible for coordinating state resources to address the full range of actions necessary to prevent, prepare for, and respond to incidents such as natural disasters. Upon their declaration of an emergency or disaster, governors typically assume a variety of emergency powers, including authority to control access to an affected area and provide temporary shelter. Also, in most cases, states generally authorize their governors to order and enforce the evacuation of residents in disaster and emergency situations. The federal government generally defers to the states to enact laws dealing with evacuation, with local officials, as mentioned earlier, typically responsible for working with state officials to enforce those laws. Governors also serve as the commanders-in-chief of their state military forces, specifically the National Guard when in state active duty or Title 32 status. In state active duty, to which governors can call the Guard in response to disasters and other emergencies, National Guard personnel operate under the control of the governor, are paid according to state law, and can perform typical disaster relief tasks such as search and rescue, debris removal, and law enforcement. Most governors have the authority to implement mutual aid agreements with other states to share resources with one another during disasters or emergencies when, for example, others, particularly nearby states, are unaffected by the emergency and are able to provide assistance. Most states request and provide this assistance through the EMAC. State emergency management agencies, reporting to their respective governors, have primary responsibility for their state's disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery activities. These agencies typically coordinate with other state agencies, as well as local emergency response departments, to plan for and respond to potential or imminent disasters or emergencies. Among other things, state emergency management agencies are responsible for developing state emergency response plans, administering federal grant funding, and coordinating with local and federal agencies to provide training and other emergency response related activities. Some states, such as Louisiana and Mississippi, spell out specific tasks or preparatory steps emergency management agencies must take to meet their responsibilities. For example, Louisiana requires that its Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness determine the requirements for food, clothing, and other necessities and procure and preposition these supplies in the event of an emergency. Similarly, Mississippi requires its Emergency Management Agency to determine needs for equipment and supplies and plan and procure those items as well. End of Section 8, recording by Doug Shepard. Section 9 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepard. A Failure of Initiative. Final report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to investigate the preparation for and response to 
Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives Background, Part 4 Specific State and Local Emergency Management and Homeland Security Laws and Roles and Responsibilities Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and the City of New Orleans Alabama Governing Statutes Two Alabama statutes address how the state prepares for and responds to emergencies and disasters. The Alabama Emergency Management Act of 1955, EMA, and the Alabama Homeland Security Act of 2003, HSA. The EMA authorizes the state to prepare for and manage disasters and emergencies. It also authorizes the state to make grants to local governments, to assist their emergency management activities and improve preparedness. The HSA establishes a State Department of Homeland Security and other entities to coordinate and undertake state homeland security preparedness, planning, and emergency activities. Roles and Responsibilities State documents detail the specific options and steps available to the Chief Executive including an analysis of gubernatorial prerogatives, including, first and foremost, the governor must understand and accept the fact that he, she, is the primary person responsible for response and crisis management within his, her state. All citizens look to their governor as the person ultimately responsible. That is not to take away from the local responsibility of mayors, city councils, and county commissions, but in truth and in fact, quote, the buck stops at the governor, unquote. Secondly, although the governor must be the leader of his, her state, the governor must also be prepared to delegate. This statement may seem rather simplistic, since every governor in the United States is confronted with so many governmental and administrative decisions on a daily basis that they obviously need to be able to delegate. On the other hand, in the case of an emergency catastrophe situation, the number of issues that arise are exponentially greater than ordinary day-to-day -day issues of government. They are unusual, sometimes technical in nature. They require instantaneous decisions, as opposed to general governmental issues, which commonly allow for consideration and even collaboration among advisors and affected entities. In these regards, in order to delegate, it is extremely important that the governor has surrounded himself, herself, with an outstanding group of cabinet officials who are not only qualified, but who are both qualified and capable of responding to emergency situations. This is most particularly true of the Adjutant General of the State's National Guard, the Director of the State's Department of Homeland Security, and the Office of the Director of the State's Office of Emergency Management. Obviously, each of these positions is a key appointment for every governor, but when confronted with a catastrophic emergency, the importance of the quality and qualifications of the persons holding these positions becomes extraordinarily important. Thirdly, an emergency operations center and a communication system which are capable of and designed to operate under emergency conditions become a key element of the governor's ability to communicate, manage, and lead through the crisis. Finally, there must be pre-planning, emergency operations plan, that sets out clearly policies, procedures, and responsibilities that will be required to meet all known emergency catastrophe situations. These must be coordinated with local emergency management officials and local government officials. Consistent with the National Response Plan and the practice of other states, in Alabama, responsibility for emergency preparedness and response begins at the local level and escalates as the emergency exceeds the capabilities of each level of government. The state's Emergency Operations Plan, EOP, spells this out, specifying that when a disaster is imminent or has occurred, local governments have the primary responsibility and will respond to preserve life and property. When disaster conditions appear likely to exceed the combined capabilities of a local jurisdiction and mutual aid compact signatories, local governments will request the support of the state. 
if the capabilities, financial or operational, of state government are exceeded, the government can request federal disaster emergency assistance. Alabama statutes authorize and direct local governments to establish emergency management organizations, agencies, appoint directors for these organizations, and confer police officer powers on their officials. In addition, local directors of emergency management may develop mutual aid agreements with public or private agencies, such as nearby counties, for emergency aid and assistance during disasters and emergencies. These local directors and some of their personnel must, if they choose to receive state funding, meet state set performance and competent standards. Alabama's statutes outline specific responsibilities of the state's emergency management agency as well as its Department of Homeland Security. The state EMA has overall responsibility for preparing for and managing disasters and emergencies. Its director is appointed by the governor and also serves as an assistant director for the state's Department of Homeland Security. To meet its obligations, the state EMA promulgates a statewide emergency operations plan with policy and guidance for state and local disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery operations. The plan also outlines state and local government responsibilities in relation to federal disaster assistance programs under the Stafford Act. Alabama's Director of Homeland Security, also appointed by the Governor, heads the state's Department of Homeland Security and has overall responsibility for the state's homeland security preparedness and response activities. Specific State Department of Homeland Security responsibilities include receiving and disseminating federal intelligence, planning and executing simulations, ensuring cooperation among public officials and the private sector, coordinating receipt and distribution of homeland security funding, and coordinating state strategy and standards for homeland security efforts. Mississippi Governing Statutes The Mississippi Emergency Management Law outlines the specific responsibility of key state entities and emergency responders and provides for the coordination of emergency preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation activities among state agencies, local and federal governments, and the private sector. The law establishes the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, confers emergency powers on the governor, MEMA, municipal and county governments, and authorizes the establishment of the Mississippi Emergency Operations Plan, MEOP. Roles and Responsibilities Consistent with the National Response Plan and the practices of other states, in Mississippi, responsibility for emergency preparedness and response begins at the local level and escalates as the emergency exceeds the capabilities of each level of government. Among other things, Mississippi's governing statute spells out that state policy for responding to disasters is to support local emergency response efforts, but it also recognizes that catastrophic disasters can overwhelm local resources and that, as a result, the state must be capable of providing effective, coordinated, and timely support to communities and the public. The state statute authorizes, but does not direct, counties and municipalities to create emergency management organizations, which are in turn authorized to do the various things necessary to handle emergency management functions in a disaster. Local governments are also authorized to enter into mutual aid agreements within the state, for example, with nearby counties, for emergency aid and assistance during disasters and emergencies. If a disaster or emergency exceeds the capability of local resources and personnel, state resources may be available through coordination with MEMA. Local authorities are mandated to recognize the severity and magnitude of the emergency by 1 declaring a local emergency, two, utilizing the locality's own resources, and three, designating one capable person to make requests to MEMA for additional resources. The Governor of Mississippi is granted broad powers to deal with a natural disaster 
and may assume direct operational control over all state emergency management functions. For example, the governor is authorized to determine needs for food, clothing, and other necessities in the event of attack, natural, man-made, or technological disasters, and to procure supplies, medicines, materials, and equipment. As commander-in-chief of the state militia, the governor may order the Mississippi National Guard into active state service. The MEMA director, appointed by the governor, is responsible for, among other things, working with the governor to prepare and implement an emergency management plan that is coordinated with federal and state plans to the fullest extent possible, adopting standards and requirements for local emergency management plans, determining needs for equipment and supplies, planning for and procuring supplies, medicine, and equipment, and assisting political subdivisions with the creation of urban search and rescue teams. In addition, the MEMA director is authorized to create mobile support units to reinforce disaster organizations in stricken areas. MEMA's director also serves as a liaison to the emergency management agencies of other states and the federal government. Louisiana. Governing Statutes. The Louisiana Homeland Security and Emergency Assistance and Disaster Act outlines the specific responsibilities of key state entities and emergency responders and provides for the coordination of activities among state agencies and local and federal governments. The law establishes the Louisiana Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, L-O-H-S-E-P, confers emergency powers on the governor and parish and municipal governments, and requires the establishment of the Louisiana Emergency Management Plan, EOP. Roles and Responsibilities In Louisiana, parish and municipal governments' chief executives by law have overall responsibility for the direction and control of emergency and disaster operations and are assisted by a local Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness Director. Their responsibilities include the development and implementation of emergency management programs to provide for rapid and effective action to direct, mobilize, staff, train, and coordinate use of local resources. Louisiana's governor has overall responsibility for emergency management in the state and is assisted in these duties by the LOHSEP director in meeting dangers to the state and people presented by emergencies or disasters. The governor is authorized, for example, to declare a disaster or emergency if he or she finds that one has occurred or the threat is imminent, and coordinate delivery of all emergency services, public, volunteer, and private, during a natural disaster. By making a disaster or emergency declaration, the governor activates the state's Emergency Response and Recovery Program, which is under the command of the LOHSEP director. This authorizes the governor to, among other things, 1. Utilize all available resources of the state government and of each political subdivision of the state as reasonably necessary to cope with a disaster or emergency. 2. Direct and compel the evacuation of all or part of the population from any stricken or threatened areas within the state, if deemed necessary for the preservation of life. And three, prescribe routes, modes of transportation, and destination in connection with evacuation. The LOHSEP, within the military department, and under the authority of the governor and the adjutant general, is responsible for emergency preparedness and homeland security in the state. The LOHSEP prepares and maintains a Homeland Security and State Emergency Operations Plan, EOP, which establishes the policies and structure for the state's management of emergencies and disasters. The EOP prescribes the phases of emergencies and disasters, preparedness, response, recovery and prevention, mitigation, and outlines the roles and responsibilities of the state's emergency support functions, ESFs, which mirror those in the National Response Plan. The EOP is an all-hazards plan, 
assigning responsibilities for actions the state will take to provide for the safety and welfare of its citizens against the threat of natural and man-made emergencies and disasters. The EOP is designed to coordinate closely with the Federal National Response Plan as well as Parish Emergency Operations Plans. New Orleans The City of New Orleans Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, New Orleans Plan, is consistent with the State of Louisiana Emergency Management Plan. The plan reflects the principle that city government bears the initial responsibility for disaster response and relief. It is therefore the mayor of the city of New Orleans who must initiate, execute, and direct the operations during any emergency or disaster affecting the city of New Orleans. According to the New Orleans plan, if it becomes clearly evident that local resources are inadequate to fully manage the effects of an emergency or disaster, the mayor may request state and or federal assistance through LOHSEP. The New Orleans Office of Emergency Preparedness, NOOEP, will coordinate with the LOHSEP to assure the most effective management of such assistance. The plan also says the authority to order the evacuation of residents threatened by an approaching hurricane is conferred to the governor by Louisiana statute. But this power is also delegated to each political subdivision of the state by executive order. This authority empowers the chief elected official of New Orleans, the mayor of New Orleans, to order the evacuation of the parish residents threatened by an approaching hurricane. For example, New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagan, according to the plan, is responsible for giving the order for a mandatory evacuation and supervising the actual evacuation of the population. The city's Office of Emergency Preparedness must coordinate with the state on elements of evacuation and assist in directing the transportation of evacuees to staging areas. The New Orleans plan states the safe evacuation of threatened populations is one of the principal reasons for developing a comprehensive emergency management plan. The city's evacuation plan states the city of New Orleans will utilize all available resources to quickly and safely evacuate threatened areas. The plan also directs special arrangements will be made to evacuate persons unable to transport themselves or who require specific life-saving assistance. Additional personnel will be recruited to assist in evacuation procedures as needed. The evacuation plan further warns that if an evacuation order is issued without the mechanisms needed to disseminate the information to the affected persons, then we face the possibility of having large numbers of people either stranded and left to the mercy of the storm or left in areas impacted by toxic materials. Threats and Vulnerabilities Related to Hurricanes General Threats Frequency of Hurricanes and Vulnerable Coastal Areas in the U.S. Hurricanes threaten the United States, particularly the coastal areas along the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean virtually every year. While Florida is the state most frequently hit, other states, particularly Texas, Louisiana, and North Carolina, have frequently been struck by hurricanes according to the records of the National Hurricane Center, NHC. The coastal areas of these and other states are among the most vulnerable to storm surge, which carries the greatest potential for loss of life in a hurricane. Storm surge is the water that swirling hurricane force winds push toward the shore as the storm advances. Combined with normal tides, this can increase the average water level by 15 feet or more. Flooding is also a serious threat to lives and property in a hurricane. The NHC reports that, although storm surge has the greatest potential to take lives, in the last 30 years more people have died from hurricane-induced inland flooding. Tornadoes can also add to the destructive power of a hurricane. While not all hurricanes produce them, according to the NHC, Studies have shown that more than half of the hurricanes that reach landfall produce at least one tornado. Specific Vulnerabilities of New Orleans Inherent Vulnerability to Flooding 
Metropolitan New Orleans is built on subsiding swampland on the delta of the Mississippi River, which makes the city inherently vulnerable to flooding. The city of New Orleans is shaped like a bowl, with an average elevation six feet below sea level. Some elevations are as high as 12 feet above sea level, and some elevations are as low as nine feet below sea level. The Mississippi River, which flows through the middle of New Orleans, is on average 14 feet above sea level, and Lake Pontchartrain, which establishes the northern border of New Orleans, is on average one foot above sea level. New Orleans and its surrounding areas have experienced numerous floods from both the Mississippi River and hurricanes. A major flood on the Mississippi River completely inundated New Orleans in 1927, and others, following severe rainstorms, damaged parts of the city in 1979 and 1995. Several hurricanes have hit New Orleans, including Hurricane Betsy in 1965, Hurricane Camille in 1969, Hurricane George in 1998, and Hurricane Lily in 2002. The greatest threat from hurricanes is not wind, but storm surge, which accounts for most of the damage and deaths caused by hurricanes. Levees designed and built to address vulnerabilities. After Hurricane Betsy in 1965, federal and state governments proposed a number of flood control projects to deal with the threat of hurricanes and the flooding they might cause in New Orleans. These included a series of control structures, concrete flood walls, and levees along Lake Pontchartrain and several other waterways. One of the major projects is formally called the Lake Pontchartrain and Vicinity Louisiana Hurricane Protection Project. This project included levees along the Lake Pontchartrain lakefront, the 17th Street Canal, the London Avenue Canal, the Intercoastal Waterway, the Industrial Canal, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, and others. Although the project was federally authorized, it was a joint federal, state, and local effort with shared costs. End of section 9, recording by Doug Shepard. Section 10 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Ship. A Failure of Initiative Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives Pre-Landfall Preparation and Katrina's Impact Part 1 Preparing for an event like Hurricane Katrina or any natural disaster, we should never feel like we are completely prepared. We can always do better. Robert R. Latham, Jr., Executive Director, Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, Select Committee Hearing, December 7, 2005. Pre-Landfall Preparation and Katrina's Impact As Hurricane Katrina entered the Gulf of Mexico, Gulf Coast states and the federal government prepared for landfall in the region. Pre-Landfall Preparation by FEMA The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, positioned an unprecedented number of resources in affected areas prior to Katrina's landfall. Indeed, FEMA's efforts far exceeded any previous operation in the agency's history. A staggering total of 11,322,000 litres of water, 18,960,000 pounds of ice, 5,997,312 meals ready to eat, MREs, and 17 truckloads of tarps were staged at various strategic locations in and near the Gulf region prior to Katrina's landfall. FEMA also pre-positioned 18 disaster medical teams, medical supplies and equipment, and nine urban search and rescue task forces, US and R, and incident support teams. Rapid needs assessment teams also were deployed to Louisiana on the Saturday before landfall. 
In Louisiana alone, on August 28th, a total of 36 trucks of water, 18,000 litres per truck, and 15 trucks of MREs, 21,888 per truck, were pre-staged at Camp Beauregard. FEMA's Hurricane Liaison Team, which consists of FEMA, the National Weather Service and state and local emergency management officials and is tasked with coordinating closely with FEMA headquarters staff by phone and video conferencing systems, was activated and deployed to the National Hurricane Center on August 24th in anticipation of Hurricane Katrina's making landfall. FEMA's Mobile Emergency Response Support Detachments were pre-positioned in Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama to provide emergency satellite communications capability. According to former FEMA Director Michael Brown, prior to landfall, FEMA reached out to other agencies for assistance, such as the Department of Defense, DOD, for potential movement of strategic airlift support. By 10 a.m. on Monday, August 29th, the morning Katrina made landfall, 31 teams from the National Disaster Medical System, NDMS, had been deployed to staging areas in Anniston, Alabama, Memphis, Tennessee, Houston, Dallas, and New Orleans, including 23 disaster medical assistance teams. The teams, trained to handle trauma, paediatrics, surgery and mental health problems, brought truckloads of medical equipment and supplies with them. By September 1st, 72 hours after landfall, FEMA had deployed more than 57 NDMS teams and 28 US and R teams with nearly 1,800 personnel to save lives and render medical assistance. FEMA had also supplied generators and thousands of cots and blankets. Pre-landfall preparation in Mississippi Preparations for Hurricane Katrina in Mississippi involved an array of actions, including county and state preparedness and disaster response training in the months leading up to the storm. The establishment of local, state and federal command structures by way of emergency proclamations, Activation of Emergency Operation Centers, EOCs. Evacuations, many of them mandatory, of the areas and types of homes most in danger from a hurricane, and the opening of emergency shelters to which those evacuating could flee. Preparation by the military in Mississippi largely took place through activation of the state's National Guard and some initial requests for Emergency Management Assistance Compact, EMAC, assistance with security, engineering support and helicopters. Following a request from Governor Haley Barber, on Sunday, August 28th, President Bush issued an emergency declaration for Mississippi. Following a further request from Barber on Monday, August 29th, President Bush declared a major disaster in Mississippi. Disaster Preparedness Training, Mississippi for several years, Mississippi's Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, has been using federal emergency preparedness grant funds to improve its county's abilities to prepare for and respond to disasters. In 2000, 43 of Mississippi's 82 counties had active county emergency management programs. MEMA used DHS Emergency Management Performance Grant Funds, including a $1.3 million allocation in fiscal year 2005, to increase this to 79 active county programs in 2005. In addition, the MEMA reported that, as of early 2005, over 1,200 first responders had received training in the National Incident Management System, NIMS. During the summer of 2005, the director of MEMA, Robert Latham, his key staff and most of Mississippi's county emergency management directors underwent training in NIMS and the NIMS Incident Command System, ICS. At approximately the same time, the FEMA officials who would later lead the federal response in Mississippi, Bill Carwile and Robert Fenton, also participated in extensive ICS training. Fenton was described by Carwile as having been involved for a long time in developing training for subjects such as the ICS and as an expert in how to adapt it for large-scale operations, such as the response to Katrina. 
Carwell and Latham said they believe their training in the ICS and the ability it gave them to quickly establish a unified command were positive elements of the state's preparation for and response to Katrina. Establishment of Command Structures in Mississippi Mississippi issued its first Hurricane Katrina situation report on August 23rd and through Thursday, August 25th, continued monitoring the storm. According to this situation report, during these three days, MEMA conducted executive planning sessions to develop an EOC activation timeline as well as plans for protective actions and a proactive response. It also established contact with a FEMA logistics cell and began encouraging the public to prepare for the storm. On Friday, August 26th, Mississippi activated its National Guard and MEMA activated its EOC on Saturday, August 27th. At that time, it also deployed county liaisons to six counties, Jackson, Harrison, Hancock, Pearl River, Stone and George, and activated its State Emergency Response Team, CERT, for deployment to Camp Shelby the next day, August 28th. The CERT established forward operations at Camp Shelby at 3 p.m. on August 28th. According to the MEMA's director's brief, as of about 7 p.m. on August 28th, 18 counties and 11 cities and towns had issued local emergency proclamations. By early morning of August 29th, this had increased to 41 counties and 61 cities and towns. FEMA's liaison arrived at the state's EOC on Saturday, August 27th. FEMA's emergency response team A, ERT A, arrived the same day, August 27th, when the state activated its EOC. On August 28th, MEMA reported that FEMA was deploying resources to a regional mobilization center in Selma, Alabama, and that FEMA's ERT A would be able to supply large quantities of water and ice to the hardest hit areas. Evacuations in Mississippi Although the governor could order mandatory evacuations, long-standing practice in Mississippi rests that authority with local governments. However, the state is generally included in any discussions about evacuation orders because once a city or county chooses to make such an order, state responsibilities for managing traffic, including contraflow, and opening shelters can come into play. In preparing for Hurricane Katrina, the state worked through the MEMA liaisons it dispatched to the counties along or near the Gulf Coast, as well as a representative it had stationed in Louisiana's EOC because of contraflow agreements between Mississippi and Louisiana that provide for evacuations out of southeast Louisiana through Mississippi. Emergency Shelters, Mississippi On August 27th, MEMA urged Mississippi's coastal counties not to open local shelters in order to encourage people to evacuate north. MEMA described coastal county shelters as an option of last resort. On Sunday, August 28th, MEMA reported that Red Cross shelters were open and on standby in the coastal counties. Mississippi began opening shelters as early as August 28th. MEMA reported 51 shelters open, with 475 persons registered at that time and 36 additional shelters available on standby as needed. In addition, MEMA indicated the Jackson Coliseum had been open as a shelter and individuals were authorised to bring pets, and three special needs shelters had been established. According to the director's brief, also on August 28th, MEMA reported the Red Cross had begun opening shelters that morning, bringing the total available shelters to 68 prior to the opening of the Jackson Coliseum. By August 29, just prior to landfall, MEMA reported 57 shelters were open, with 7,610 persons registered in them. An additional 31 shelters were available on standby to open based on need. The Jackson Coliseum opened as expected the day before, and by early morning August 29 was reported by FEMA to be at capacity. Similarly, all Red Cross Central Mississippi shelters were reported to be full as of 4.30 a.m. on August 29th. Two additional special needs shelters opened, bringing their total to five. 
Military Preparation in Mississippi Military preparation in Mississippi began as early as August 26th, when, as noted earlier, the governor activated the state's National Guard. Mississippi's National Guard has over 12,000 troops, with Army and Air National Guard components, both under the direction of the Adjutant General, TAG, Major General Harold A. Cross. Throughout the preparation and response to Katrina, Mississippi's Guard reported to and received taskings, or mission assignments, from MEMA. The Mississippi National Guard has an operations plan, OPLAN MSTAD, on top of MEMA's comprehensive emergency management plan that was used during Hurricane Katrina. Refined and updated in an order issued to Mississippi Guard on June 1st, 2005, this operations plan was validated during Hurricane Dennis, July 7th to 10th, 2005. On August 27th, Mississippi's Guard accelerated its preparations by alerting state emergency personnel to assemble for hurricane operations on the Mississippi Gulf Coast under Joint Task Force Magnolia. In doing so, Mississippi's National Guard assembled and prepositioned at all three coastal county EOCs its special hurricane strike squads. Each squad consisted of 10 military police, MPs, 15 engineers and 5 trucks. In addition, the Guard placed on alert the following units from throughout the state. 223rd Engineering Battalion, Count McCain, Mississippi, Grenada, Mississippi, 890th Engineering Battalion, Home Station Armouries, located in the coastal region. 112th MP Battalion, Camp Shelby, Mississippi, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. 367th Maintenance Company, Home Station, Philadelphia, Mississippi. 1687th Transport Company, Home Station, South Haven, Mississippi. 1,387th QM Water, Home Station, Leland, Mississippi. 210th Finance, Home Station, Jackson, Mississippi. 172nd AW, Home Station, Jackson, Mississippi. 186th ARW, Home Station, Meridian, Mississippi. Cross noted that these assets were sufficient for a Category 2 storm, but as Katrina approached the Gulf Coast on August 28th, it became apparent that additional forces from outside the state would be required. As a result, that afternoon, he initiated requests for assistance via the EMAC. The first such request, relayed to the on-site National Guard Bureau Liaison Officers, LNO, was for an additional MP battalion, two more engineering battalions, and three CH-37 helicopters. That same day, August 28th, the National Guard Bureau Joint Operations Center in Washington, D.C. sent LNOs to Mississippi, with the first going to Mississippi's Joint Force Headquarters, followed by officers sent to the three coastal county EOCs and to MEMA's operations cell to facilitate out-of-state National Guard assets. In addition, Cross established at Gulfport a forward operations centre that eventually combined state and federal, including active duty, logistics support personnel. In response to questions regarding the Guard's preparations, including the EMAC assistance it received, Cross said, This greatly assisted in the command and control and situational awareness of all operations. As forces flowed into the state, more liaison teams were established in each county EOC that had guard operations in that county. This was a very efficient system since the National Guard headquarters was linked directly with each county for coordination of relief efforts. The Guard's preparation in Mississippi was not unfortunately without incident. Prior to the storm's landfall, Sergeant Joshua Russell, Detachment 1, Company A, 89th Engineers, was killed when attempting to rescue an elderly couple in Harrison County. Pre-landfall preparation in Alabama Final preparation for Katrina in Alabama began in earnest four days prior to landfall, when it became evident the path of the storm pointed towards the Gulf Coast. Three days prior to landfall, the Governor's staff participated in frequent video conference calls with personnel from FEMA, the National Hurricane Center, including its director, Max Mayfield, 
senior staff at the White House, and senior staff from the governor's offices from Louisiana and Mississippi. The governor's staff indicated they were satisfied with the federal support they received and that Max Mayfield's briefings were particularly valuable. In Alabama's southernmost counties, Baldwin and Mobile, preparations began five days before the storm, when they started regular consultations with the National Hurricane Center, the State of Alabama Emergency Management Agency and the National Weather Service in Mobile to discuss the storm's likely path and strength. Information was then disseminated to all local officials and first responders and staff prepared to activate the EOCs. On August 28, 2005, Governor Riley wrote to President Bush asking that he declare an emergency disaster declaration for the state of Alabama as a result of Hurricane Katrina beginning on August 28, 2005 and continuing. That same day, President Bush declared an emergency for the state of Alabama. The next day, Monday, August 29th, Riley wrote to President Bush again, this time asking him to declare an expedited major disaster as a result of Hurricane Katrina beginning on August 28, 2005 and continuing. That same day, President Bush issued a major disaster declaration for Alabama. Establishment of Command Structures in Alabama on Friday, August 26th, Riley declared a state of emergency to handle what was then thought would be a surge of evacuees from the Florida panhandle. The state went into what they call Level 2 response and expected to receive 10 to 15 percent of Florida's evacuees. A Level 2 response activates the Alabama EOC on a 24-hour basis and all relevant agencies are activated and necessary personnel are assigned to staff the EOC. One day later, on Saturday, August 27th, a Level 1 response was activated. The EOC was operating in full force, with desks staffed for each ESF. A FEMA emergency response team advance, ERT-A, was on site late in the day. An ERT-A team is a small FEMA contingent with capabilities for planning, operations, communications and logistics. A total of five to eight people from the Atlanta-based FEMA Region 4 were on site at the EOC. The Alabama Emergency Management Agency, AEMA, expressed some frustration with FEMA's late arrival. AEMA officials believed that had FEMA been on site sooner with a larger contingent, Alabama may have been able to acquire needed resources and commodities more quickly. President Bush spoke to Riley on Saturday, August 27th, two days prior to landfall, to ensure the governor had everything he needed. The governor's staff indicated they felt they were better prepared for Katrina than they were for Hurricanes Dennis and Ivan. In addition to implementing many of the lessons learned from previous hurricanes, the governor's staff believes one key element of the state's response to Katrina was the state's proactive communication strategy. On Friday, August 26th, as the storm gathered in the Gulf, the governor personally visited all of the counties in the Gulf, holding numerous press conferences to urge local residents to evacuate, pursuant to the mandatory evacuation orders. In Alabama, the failure to obey a mandatory evacuation order is a misdemeanor, enforced by county or municipal police. The Alabama EOC is divided into five clusters of desks, and each desk is equipped with computers, telephony and other management tools. The five clusters are Emergency Services, ESF numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 13, Human Services, ESF numbers 6, 8, 11, Infrastructure and Support, ESF numbers 10, 12, Operation Support, ESF numbers 14, 15, and Information and Planning, ESF numbers 5, 7. There is a station for each ESF function and stations for all of the involved agencies, federal and state, including FEMA, EMAC, Army Corps of Engineers, National Guard, Alabama State Police, among others. One of the tools Alabama uses to respond to local disaster needs is the EM2000 Incident Log, a Lotus Notes-based system which captures, in logbook fashion, emergency events and requests from each of the 67 counties. 
Each activity or request logged into the system gets assigned to one of the desks in the EOC for attention. If a report comes in regarding individuals who are trapped and in need of rescue, the event will be assigned to the personnel in the emergency services cluster. Multi-ESF teams involving state police, ESF number 13, transportation, ESF number 1, and urban search and rescue, ESF number 9, huddle to coordinate the optimal response. Events can be reported and tracked by ESF, by status, by county, and by a number of other custom data elements. Documents related to information requests, as opposed to action requests, are later scanned and attached. The EM2000 data files appear to serve as the central universe of actions and documents related to the state's response to the storm. Applying the lessons learned from Hurricane Ivan, the state upgraded the tracking system used to determine hospital bed vacancies, giving state officials real-time visibility of surge capacity and making it possible to better direct those with special medical needs to appropriate sites. The State Health Office also has the capability to conduct daily conference calls with county health staff to assess status and needs. Health officials staff their own emergency operations center linked by computer and phone to the main state EOC in Clanton. Evacuations in Alabama Even before any evacuations began, AEMA and state transportation officials participated in the FEMA Regional Evacuation Liaison Team conference calls during which emergency managers from Florida, Louisiana and Mississippi shared information on the status of evacuation routes, road closures, traffic volumes, hotel availability and other interstate implications of significant population migrations in the region. On the morning of August 29th, Shelby County, Alabama, posted a message on the statewide EM2000 system saying the Shelby County Humane Society will house animals during the emergency, can house small animals as well as farm animals for a short duration. More than 50 pets were evacuated from Mississippi and brought to Maxwell Air Force Base where they were taken in by families on the base until the pet owners could be located. Pre-landfall preparation in Louisiana On Saturday, August 27th, Louisiana Governor Blanco wrote to President Bush requesting that he declare an emergency for the state of Louisiana due to Hurricane Katrina for the time period beginning August 26, 2005 and continuing. Later that same day, President Bush declared an emergency for the state of Louisiana. William Loki was named Federal Coordinating Officer. On Sunday, August 28th, in recognition of the potential catastrophic impact of Hurricane Katrina, Blanco asked President Bush, prior to landfall, to declare an expedited major disaster for the state of Louisiana as Hurricane Katrina, a Category 5 hurricane, approaches our coast, beginning on August 28, 2005 and continuing. The next day, President Bush declared a major disaster for Louisiana. End of section 10. Section 11 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Shipp. A Failure of Initiative Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives Pre-Landfall Preparation and Katrina's Impact Part 2 Establishment of Command and Safeguarding of Assets the state of Louisiana took a number of steps to prepare for the arrival of Hurricane Katrina, including getting the EOC up and running with its full staff complement by the afternoon of Friday, August 26th. The EOC conducted communications checks with all the state agencies and parishes on Thursday, August 25th, four days before landfall. 
The state EOC then began holding regular conference calls with other state agencies, key parishes, federal agencies, other states and the Red Cross to coordinate pre-landfill activities among all the different authorities. These calls began at 5pm on Friday, August 26th, with five calls on Saturday, four calls on Sunday and a final call Monday morning as the storm hit but before communications went out. In addition, several state agencies moved key assets northward, stockpiled critical supplies, positioned teams to do post-landfall damage assessments or otherwise prepared for the hurricane. The Louisiana Department of Fish and Wildlife coordinated with the Louisiana National Guard in advance to get boats placed on trailers and pre-positioned at Jackson Barracks in New Orleans in anticipation of flooding and the need for waterborne search and rescue. There were also preparations at the parish level. As noted, the parishes participated in conference calls with the state. Plaquemines Parish, one of the southern parishes most exposed to the storm, parked vehicles on high ground, gathered administrative records and moved them north, transferred prisoners to upstate facilities and set up an emergency command post in a local high school. Jefferson Parish, part of metropolitan New Orleans, also took a number of preparatory steps. According to Emergency Management Director Walter Maestri, they implemented their doomsday plan to hunker down in their EOC with a skeleton crew to minimize the number of people exposed to the hurricane's damage. The Louisiana National Guard, Lang, and other state agencies went on alert and began staging personnel and equipment. By Saturday, August 28th, the day prior to landfall, the Lang had prepositioned 9,792 MREs and 13,440 litres of water at the Superdome, the shelter of last resort. The state also had positioned teams north, out of harm's way, prior to landfall, and the first requests for EMAC teams were issued as well. On Saturday, August 28th, the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority, RTA, fueled up its fleet based at its eastern New Orleans facility and moved buses, not providing service, to higher ground on a wharf near downtown New Orleans. Buses that were providing regular service were also eventually moved to the wharf as well. Evacuations in Louisiana the state was actively involved in executing the Southeast Louisiana Evacuation Plan, with the Department of Transportation and Development and the Louisiana State Police working to manage traffic and implement contraflow, making all highway lanes outbound to maximize traffic flow and minimize traffic jams. The governor was personally involved in monitoring contraflow, which ran from Saturday at about 4 p.m. to Sunday at about 6 p.m. State officials coordinated the contraflow with the states of Mississippi and Texas since Louisiana interstates fed into these states. In a conference call at 6.30 a.m. Saturday morning, it was recommended that the evacuation plan for southeast Louisiana be implemented. The state began staging assets necessary to execute an evacuation, including alerting and activating National Guard troops, pre-deploying traffic cones and barriers to key locations and coordinating plans among all of the parishes. Some parishes had already begun evacuation proceedings. By 6pm on Sunday, August 28th, traffic was light, so contraflow was halted, but residents could still evacuate on the outbound lanes once the highways were returned to their normal configuration. Up to 1.2 million Louisiana residents followed the evacuation orders and evacuated themselves in their private vehicles. However, it later became apparent that thousands of residents, particularly in New Orleans, did not evacuate or seek shelter but remained in their homes. The parishes began declaring evacuations on Saturday, August 27th at 9am. These declarations had been coordinated among the state and parishes in advance as part of Louisiana's emergency evacuation plan, which calls for the most southern parishes to evacuate first, so that as they drive north they do not encounter traffic bottlenecks in New Orleans or Baton Rouge. While some parishes, e.g. Plaquemines and St. Charles, began the process with mandatory evacuation orders, most parishes began with recommended evacuation orders and upgraded these to mandatory orders later on Saturday or Sunday. Some of the parishes farther north, 
e.g. St. Tammany, Tangipaho, declared mandatory evacuation orders only for residents living in low-lying areas or manufactured homes. Some parishes also asked non-governmental organizations to help evacuate those residents that did not have their own vehicles. Both New Orleans and Jefferson Parish have a program called Brothers Keeper, run by the parishes in conjunction with local churches and the Red Cross. According to Maestri, the parish had a phone bank in the EOC manned by volunteers that helped take the calls and match up riders with drivers once the evacuation was announced. By Sunday evening, most of the parishes reported empty streets and had declared dusk-to-dawn curfews. Emergency Shelters in Louisiana Louisiana also set up shelters as part of its evacuation plan. A sheltering task force led by the Department of Social Services and the Department of Health and Hospitals coordinated its activities with the state EOC and parishes through the aforementioned conference calls. Specific shelters were designated along the main evacuation routes, including both general population shelters and special needs shelters. These efforts were coordinated with both Mississippi and Texas, which set up shelters once Louisiana shelters began to fill. Several parishes also established shelters of last resort for residents that could not evacuate or had delayed leaving. Parish officials Ebert and Maestri told select committee staff they purposefully designate these shelters at the last minute so people will not use them as an excuse to avoid evacuation. New Orleans, which had already designated the Superdome as a shelter for the special needs population, also designated that facility as a shelter of last resort on Sunday, August 28th. The Louisiana National Guard pre-positioned 9,792 MREs and 13,440 litres of water at the Superdome. Also in New Orleans, the RTA began running special service from 12 sites across the city to take riders to the Superdome. The RTA also ran at least 10 paratransit vehicles to the Superdome and then on to the Baton Rouge area for special needs citizens. Each of these vehicles made at least two trips. All service ceased at approximately 7pm Sunday night, approximately 11 hours before Katrina was due to make landfall and as conditions worsened. Jefferson Parish also designated four facilities as shelters of last resort. According to Maestri, unlike the Superdome, these locations in Jefferson Parish did not have any pre-positioned medical personnel or supplies, but they did have pre-positioned food and water. Pre-landfall preparations by DOD, the National Guard, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and U.S. Coast Guard. DOD in preparation for the last part of the 2005 hurricane season, the Secretary of Defense approved a standing order on August 19th that allowed the commander, U.S. Northern Command, to use military installations and deploy Defense Coordinating Officers, DCO, as needed, to coordinate directly in support of FEMA in affected states. As the force provided to Northern Command, the U.S. Joint Forces Command issued general instructions on August 20th on how it would task units in support of any Northern Command requests to support FEMA. On August 23rd, Northern Command began tracking the tropical depression that became Hurricane Katrina. On August 24th, the officer of the Secretary of Defense, OSD, Northern Command and the National Guard Bureau participated in a teleconference with FEMA on what would be needed to respond to Katrina. Joint Forces Command issued a warning order to military services to be ready to support requests for assistance. Northern Command issued a similar warning order on August 25th, the day Katrina struck Florida as a Category 1 storm. On August 26th, Northern Command issued an execute order, setting initial DOD relief actions into motion. The initial response was focused on Florida, but DCOs were also activated for Georgia, Alabama and Mississippi. On August 27th, Northern Command received its first mission assignment from FEMA to provide Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana as a federal operational staging area. The same day, the Corps of Engineers positioned teams and supplies in Alabama, Louisiana and Mississippi. In New Orleans, the commander of the Corps, New Orleans District, evacuated most of his staff to alternate locations to be ready to respond when the storm passed. Other active military units ordered similar evacuations of personnel and equipment. 
In addition, the Louisiana National Guard Aviation Officer requested helicopter support from the National Guard Bureau and support was coordinated through the EMAC. On August 28th, DCOs were deployed to Mississippi and Louisiana. Northern Command took several additional steps to organize military assets that might be needed, including deployment of Joint Task Force Forward, eventually Joint Task Force Katrina, to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and a general alert to DoD assets potentially needed, particularly aviation assets. On the day Katrina made landfall, August 29th, the Deputy Secretary of Defence led an 8.30am meeting to get damage assessment for DOD facilities and review resources that might be required from DOD to support hurricane relief. The Secretary of Defence was briefed on DOD's readiness and Northern Command issued several more alerts in anticipation of requests for assistance. National Guard at the beginning of each hurricane season, National Guard Bureau, NGB, personnel participate in an interagency conference to assess potential response shortfalls and identify potential solutions that could be resolved through EMAC requests. NGB planners conducted this EMAC conference in the spring of 2005 with participants from Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, North Carolina, New York and South Carolina. The Joint Staff J3 Joint Director of Military Support, JDOMS, also participated. The participants in these conferences believe that EMAC is capable of providing most military capabilities needed by states for hurricane disaster relief operations. The role of the NGB grew in preparation for guard response to Hurricane Katrina. On August 24th, it issued an executive order calling on its joint staff to provide proactive planning and staffing support to states potentially affected by then tropical storm Katrina. NGB liaison teams, LNOs, were sent to Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana. On Wednesday, August 24th, the first teleconference between NORTHCOM, the Joint Staff Guard Headquarters and FEMA was held to discuss DOD support to federal authorities. The Joint Operations Centre at the NGB geared up as the Operations Centre for Katrina Response. The heads of the Army and Air National Guard also used this centre for coordination of effort. During Hurricane Katrina preparation and response, the Joint Operations Centre provided daily intelligence updates, logs of current operations, daily teleconferences and coordination with states on logistical assistance, maintained communications with states and other agencies and coordinated guard aviation assets. On August 25th, the NGB began hosting daily conferences with the operations officers of the Gulf States Adjutant Generals. The Adjutant Generals reported their preparations to respond and were asked if they needed out-of-state assistance. Some of them had already contacted or were contacted by other nearby states to arrange for assistance via the EMAC in the form of personnel and equipment that might be needed. On Sunday, August 28th, reports into NGB by State Adjutant Generals indicated that 4,444 Army National Guard and 932 Air National Guard in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana were ready to respond. Both General Bennett C. Landrino of Louisiana and Cross of Mississippi requested additional aircraft from EMAC via NGB. Consequently, these requests were considered state-to-state -state requests for assistance, not federal requests involving FEMA or OSD, even though NGB facilitated the assistance. On Monday, August 29th, NGB noted that 65 Army National Guard aircraft were in position in Florida, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana and Mississippi. Louisiana National Guard the Louisiana National Guard is an integral part of managing emergencies in the state. The Adjutant General, Landrino, wears two hats, as he is head of both the National Guard and the Louisiana Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, LOSEP. The National Guard plays a significant role in emergency command and control because of the dual role of the Adjutant General. Also, many of the personnel who staff the state's EOC are guardsmen. On Friday, August 26th, Blanco authorised the mobilisation of 2,000 Louisiana Guardsmen. The next day, Landrino called an additional 2,000 to active duty. By the end of the day, on Saturday, 3,085 Louisiana National Guard troops had been fully activated. 
Coordination also began with other states for additional aviation assets for search and rescue and EMAC support if needed. The Louisiana National Guard participated in a number of preparation missions, including law enforcement, traffic control, shelter support, and security and securing operations at the Superdome. Many guardsmen were also embedded with state and parish officials and later used their radios to help these officials re-establish some minimal level of communications. Before Katrina hit, guardsmen provided support for general purpose shelters and special needs shelters by providing medical personnel. Alabama National Guard The Alabama National Guard has 13,200 troops with Army and Air National Guard components falling under its Adjutant General, Major General Mark Bowen. The Adjutant General is also a member of the Governor's Cabinet, but is not dual-hatted as the Emergency Response Coordinator. Although he participates in the state's EOC, Bowen's chain of command is a direct line to the Governor. The Alabama Guard has developed and is organized around mission-oriented joint force packages, i.e. hurricanes, snow and ice storms. Task forces typically include security forces, engineers, medical, communications, special operations forces, logistics and a command and control cell. Alabama also has a voluntary state militia that is administered by the National Guard. They are used to augment the Guard force and have approximately 2,000 to 3,000 members. During the Alabama National Guard's preparation phase, which began six days before Katrina hit, Guard assets monitored the storm track and began discussions with the NGB. By August 26th, Riley ordered 3,000 Alabama National Guard soldiers and airmen to state active duty and requested Secretary of Defense approval of 180 days of military duty. Approval was granted by DOD on September 7th and was retroactive to August 29th. Two days before the storm, a National Guard liaison officer was dispatched to the state EOC in Clanton. On August 28th, two National Guard task forces were formed, gathered pre-positioned supplies, food, water, ice, gas, from Maxwell Air Force Base and equipment including generators, fuel trucks and aviation assets. Guard assets also began deployment to assist Mobile and Baldwin County emergency management activities. Mississippi National Guard the Mississippi National Guard has 12,041 troops, with Army and Air National Guard components falling under Adjutant Major General Harold A. Cross. The Adjutant General reports directly to the Governor, but is not dual-hatted as the State Emergency Management Officer. Mississippi's emergency response is handled by the State's Emergency Management Agency, MEMA. On August 28, 2005, the Mississippi National Guard alerted state emergency personnel to assemble for hurricane operations on the Mississippi Gulf Coast under Joint Task Force Magnolia. National Guard Special Hurricane Strike Squads were pre-positioned at all three coastal county EOCs. Recommended but voluntary evacuation of civilians brought bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic along Highway 49 northbound from the beaching Gulf port to Jackson. By Sunday evening, numerous mandatory evacuation orders were in effect, and Mississippi National Guard soldiers took shelter at Camp Shelby, 62 miles north of the predicted landfall area. These Guard personnel moved south after the storm had passed to begin assisting with response and recovery efforts. End of section 11. Section 12 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Ship. A Failure of Initiative. Final report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to investigate the preparation for and response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Pre-Landfall Preparation and Katrina's Impact, Part 3 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers the Army Corps of Engineers, USAIS, another active duty military unit, provided substantial resources to prepare for and respond to Hurricane Katrina. Under the National Response Plan, the USAIS 
as the lead federal agency for public works and engineering esf number three provides relief and response support to fema to meet these responsibilities usace has pre-awarded competitively bid contracts for all of these functions to allow quick deployment of resources prior to and immediately after an event these pre-awarded contracts are part of USACE's Advanced Contracting Initiative, ACI, which has been in place for about six years. USACE took a number of preparatory steps in anticipation of the hurricane season in general and for Hurricane Katrina specifically. Over the summer, the USACE New Orleans District participated in an annual hurricane preparedness exercise conducted by the regional headquarters. In July 2005, the district sponsored a hurricane preparedness conference for federal, state and local emergency managers. In addition, USACE had equipment and supplies, including those needed to repair levees, pre-positioned in various locations along the Gulf of Mexico. When Katrina approached, the New Orleans district monitored the situation and evacuated most staff establishing a temporary district headquarters in vicksburg mississippi the district commander and eight staff remained in new orleans retreating to a bunker designed to withstand a category five hurricane their objective was to monitor the levee system stay in contact with local officials and provide post-storm assessments to the usace chain of command u s coast guard well before arriving in the gulf of mexico Hurricane Katrina was closely watched by Coast Guard officials as the storm approached and eventually passed through southern Florida. By Thursday, August 25th, the 7th Coast Guard District, based in Miami, had prepared for Katrina's arrival by partially evacuating Coast Guard boats, aircraft and personnel and closely monitoring Katrina's progress across the Florida Peninsula. As Katrina cleared the 7th District, the 8th District was busy executing hurricane plans in anticipation of Katrina's arrival. On August 27th, the 8th Coast Guard District's Incident Management Team, IMT, based in New Orleans, relocated to St. Louis in accordance with Coast Guard hurricane plans. The 8th District set heightened readiness for all units, ordered the evacuations of personnel and dependents from units along the Gulf Coast in the anticipated impact zone, and closed the entrance to the lower Mississippi River to all commercial maritime traffic. On August 28th, the Coast Guard activated personnel to support air and swift boat operations under ESF-1, and positioned liaison officers at FEMA Regions 4 and 6, and to state EOCs in Florida, Louisiana and Mississippi. The Coast Guard's computer hub in New Orleans dropped offline, resulting in no computer or internet connectivity to all coastal ports within the 8th District. Coast Guard units resorted to using phone and fax machines to communicate. The 8th District Commander requested additional Coast Guard air assets and personnel to support rescue and recovery operations. Coast Guard aircraft and crews from Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, New Jersey, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Georgia and Texas were pre-staged to provide rapid support. 8th District Commander Rear Admiral Robert Duncan contacted Blanco to discuss damage assessments and response efforts. Sector New Orleans Operations and Critical Communications personnel evacuated to Alexandria, Louisiana. Non-essential Coast Guard personnel and dependents in the New Orleans area evacuated to the Naval Air Station in Meridian, Mississippi. Coast Guard helicopters, originally located in New Orleans, relocated to Houston and Lake Charles, Louisiana, to avoid Katrina's path and prepare to begin rescue operations. All Coast Guard cutters and small boats relocated to safe locations or travelled out to sea to avoid the storm. In Mississippi, a Coast Guard incident management team was established in Meridian. Duncan contacted Barber to discuss damage assessments and response efforts. Non-essential personnel and dependents from the Gulfport and Lockport areas relocated to Naval Air Station Meridian. In Alabama, helicopters from Aviation Training Center Mobile deployed to Shreveport and Jacksonville for storm avoidance and prepared to respond. 
Also, a transportable multi-mission communication center was pre-staged at Sector Mobile to provide temporary communication support. Non-essential Coast Guard personnel and dependents relocated to Maxwell Air Force Base. On August 29th, the day Katrina made landfall, the Sector New Orleans Incident Management Team was established in Alexandria, Louisiana. Outside of the forecasted area of impact, Coast Guard disaster assistance teams from Ohio, Kentucky, St. Louis, Pittsburgh and Miami were pre-positioned to the region to respond as soon as conditions permitted. During normal conditions, there are 15 helicopters assigned within the 8th Coast Guard District, along with four fixed-wing aircraft and 16 cutters. Within 12 hours of Hurricane Katrina making landfall, the Coast Guard assigned 29 helicopters, eight fixed-wing aircraft and 24 cutters to the area to support rescue operations. Pre-landfall preparations by the American Red Cross The Red Cross's Gulf Coast area preparation was far along two days before Katrina made landfall in the Gulf Coast. As of 2 p.m. on August 27th, Carol Hall of the Red Cross reported to the White House and the Department of Homeland Security, among other governmental organizations, that it has every resource at its disposal on alert, moving in anticipation of this event to include personnel, equipment and materials. According to Hall, key aspects of this preparation included chapters across the region opened shelters in support of evacuations in all states, 275,000 heater meals were staged in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 225,000 heater meals were staged in Montgomery, Alabama. 15 sites were identified to bring in big kitchens with the support of Southern Baptists to provide 300,000 meals per day feeding capability. All 14 disaster field supply center warehouses loaded supplies, including 50,000 cots, 100,000 blankets, comfort and clean-up kits. All vehicles in the Red Cross fleet across the country were placed on alert for possible deployment and were dispatched to staging areas. All eight emergency communications response vehicles, ECRVs, deployed to staging areas, Red Cross staff deployed to NRCC, Region 6 RRCC, Region 4 RRCC, ERT A's and other ESF No. 6 posts. By August 28th, the Red Cross started to understand the magnitude of Katrina. One of its disaster operations reports remarked, if Katrina makes land for its current pressure, it will be the most intense storm to hit the U.S. mainland. On the same day it was reported, for the first time ever, an ESF-6 coordination centre will be set up tomorrow at American Red Cross National Headquarters to coordinate the deliver sick mass care services with our governmental and non-governmental organisation partners. As Katrina made landfall on August 29th, the Red Cross was fully staffing all of the relevant state and federal EOCs, including Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, FEMA Regions 4 and 6's RRCC, FEMA's NRCC, as well as ERTA teams in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana. Sites for 25 kitchens to feed as many as 500,000 people were identified and pre-staged. Trajectory and Impact of Hurricane Katrina Finding the accuracy and timeliness of National Weather Service and National Hurricane Center forecasts prevented further loss of life. Timeline of Hurricane Katrina and NWS warnings to federal, state and local officials. At 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, EDT, 4 o'clock Central Daylight Time, CDT, the National Weather Service, NWS, reported that Katrina's projected path had shifted 150 miles to the west toward Mississippi and projected that Katrina would make landfall as a Category 4 storm. By 10 p.m. CDT that same night, the NWS projected that landfall was most likely at Burris, Louisiana, 65 miles south-southeast of New Orleans. NWS proved extremely accurate. The final landfall location was only 20 miles off from Friday's forecast. 
since meteorological conditions that affect the track and intensity of the storm were relatively stable nws was especially certain of the accuracy of its prediction even fifty six hours from landfall at 10 a.m. CDT on Saturday, August 27th, the National Hurricane Center, NHC, issued a hurricane watch for southeast Louisiana, including New Orleans, which was extended to Mississippi and Alabama later that afternoon. Later that evening, between 7.30 and 8 p.m. CDT, 35 hours before landfall, Max Mayfield, the director of the NHC, called state officials in Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama to inform them of the storm's intensity and its potential to be devastating and catastrophic. At Governor Blanco's urging, Mayfield also called Ray Nagin. Despite media reports indicating Mayfield encouraged Nagin to immediately order a mandatory evacuation, Mayfield just told officials the nature of the storm and that he probably said to the mayor that he was going to have some very difficult decisions ahead of him. Similarly, Mayfield said that the purpose of his calls there to the governors of Louisiana and Mississippi was really just to make absolutely sure that they understood how serious the situation was. In public advisories issued at 10 p.m. CDT Saturday, 32 hours before prior to landfall, NHC warned of storm surge forecasts. At 7 a.m. on Sunday, August 28th, NWS advisories characterized Katrina as a potentially catastrophic storm. Additionally, at 4 p.m. CDT on Sunday, the storm surge was predicted to be 18 to 22 feet and locally as high as 28 feet with large and battering waves on top of the surge, meaning some levees in the greater New Orleans area could be overtopped. Although it was reported that Mayfield cautioned the levees would be breached, no such warning was issued. What I indicated in my briefings to emergency managers and to the media was the possibility that some levees in the greater New Orleans area could be overtopped, depending on the details of Katrina's track and intensity, Mayfield said. Also, on Sunday, August 28th, the NW office in Slidell, Louisiana, which is responsible for the New Orleans area, issued warnings saying most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks, perhaps longer and predicting human suffering incredible by modern standards. Ultimately, NWS and NHC proved remarkably accurate in capturing Katrina's eventual wrath and destruction. It is important to note the hurricane risk to New Orleans and the surrounding areas was well recognized and predicted by forecasters long before Hurricane Katrina. The 33 years that I've been at the Hurricane Center we have always been saying, the directors before me and I have always said, that the greatest potential for the nightmare scenarios in the Gulf of Mexico anyway is that New Orleans and southeast Louisiana area, Mayfield said. The NWS and NHC are not without critics though. AccuWeather Inc., a private weather service company, has said the public should have received earlier warnings that Gulf Coast residents and New Orleans residents in particular were directly in Katrina's path. AccuWeather issued a forecast predicting the target of Katrina's landfall nearly 12 hours before the NHC issued its first warning and argued the extra time could have aided evacuation of the region. Responding to this criticism, Mayfield said premature evacuation can lead too large of an area to evacuate, causing unnecessary traffic and congestion on the roads. As Mayfield testified, the mission here of the National Hurricane Center and then the National Weather Service is to provide the best forecast that we possibly can, and then the emergency managers at the local and state levels will use that, then they will call for evacuations. Ultimately, as Mayfield tried to convey, NHC and NWS can only forecast, issue warnings and provide timely information to the state and local decision makers who determine who and when to evacuate. The timeliness and accuracy of the forecasts saved lives. No government can blame inadequate response or lack of advanced warning. Katrina makes landfall. Hurricane Katrina made landfall at Buras, Louisiana, on the southeast corner of Louisiana at 610 CDT on Monday, August 29th. Katrina had maximum sustained winds of 121 miles an hour and was unusually large, measuring approximately 400 miles across. 
its eye was at least thirty miles wide. Though it had weakened from a Category 5 to a strong Category 3 storm by landfall, the damage and loss of life from the storm was staggering, with effects extending from Louisiana through Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and the Florida Panhandle. The three states most directly affected, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, each suffered significant damage, with NHC noting that many of the most severely affected areas along the Gulf Coast could take years to completely rebuild. Alabama, Impact of Hurricane Katrina Though Alabama was not where Hurricane Katrina made landfall, damages there were substantial. According to the NHC, despite being more distant from the eye of Katrina, the storm surge over Dauphin Island, Alabama, destroyed or damaged dozens of beachfront homes and cut a new canal through the island's western end. Two deaths were reported during Hurricane Katrina in Alabama, However, these deaths were the result of an auto accident and unrelated to the hurricane. Katrina caused significant damage along its coast with a wave surge of 13.5 feet, exceeding the 100-year flood level of 12 feet. Bayou La Batra and, as noted above, Dauphin Island received the brunt of the storm in Alabama, losing 800 and 200 homes respectively. The storm caused wind damage as far north as Tuscaloosa County. Mobile Bay spilled into downtown and flooded large sections of the city, destroying hundreds of homes. The sheer power of the storm dislodged a nearby oil drilling platform, which became caught under the U.S. Highway 98 bridge. As of early January 2006, federal assistance to Alabama had exceeded $500 million. Specifically, FEMA reported that, to date, it had provided $117 million in assistance to individuals and families for housing and rental assistance, and $348 million for public assistance, crisis counselling, disaster unemployment assistance, and various mission assignments to other federal agencies during the disaster response. The public assistance funds were provided for, among other things, infrastructure costs, debris removal, and road and bridge repair. The costs for mission assignments to other federal agencies included the use of military aircraft for rapid needs assessments, shipments of ice, 280 truckloads, water, 186 truckloads, MREs, 103 truckloads, generators, 11 truckloads, cots, 27 truckloads, and blankets, 32 truckloads. The Small Business Administration, SBA, has approved over $68 million in loans to homeowners, renters, and businesses. Mississippi, Impact of Hurricane Katrina In reporting casualty and damage statistics for Hurricane Katrina, NHC noted that the storm surge of Katrina struck the Mississippi coastline with such ferocity that entire coastal communities were obliterated. Some left with little more than the foundations upon which homes, businesses, government facilities and other historical buildings once stood. According to the NHC, the Hancock County EOC recorded a storm surge of as high as 27 feet. This surge likely penetrated at least six miles inland in many portions of the Mississippi coast and up to 12 miles inland along bays and rivers. Even in areas that may have been spared the destruction of the storm surge, hurricane-force winds wreaked havoc. According to Pearl River County EMA Director Bobby Strahan, for example, his EOC, one county inland, twice registered wind speeds of 135 miles per hour. All told, at least 231 Mississippians died during Hurricane Katrina. In the three coastal counties alone, 66,000 may have been displaced from their homes due to flooding and or structural damage to their homes. At peak levels on August 31st, Mississippi's power companies reported 958,000 customers were without power and that over 19,000 households were still powerless as of the end of September. Damages to Mississippi's economy were also substantial. The state's agricultural, forestry, gaming, maritime and poultry industries all suffered extensive damages. For example, the state reported that its two biggest crops, poultry and forestry, were very hard hit, with at least two years' worth of timber destroyed, 
worth $1.3 billion, and the value of the poultry industry dropping by 6% due to hurricane damage, including the estimated loss of 8 million birds and damage to 2,400 of the state's 9,000 poultry houses, 300 of which were totally devastated. The state's dairy industry suffered losses estimated to exceed $6 million, and 20% of the expected rice and corn harvests may have been lost. The costs and volume of response and clean-up activity in Mississippi reflect the enormous damage Katrina left behind. For example, a month and a half after landfall, the state reported the total cost of assistance it received via EMAC was over $327 million, $176 million in civilian costs and $151 million in National Guard expenses. According to the National Emergency Management Association, NEMA, which administers the EMAC, commonly requested resources included firefighters, search and rescue personnel, hazmat personnel, emergency medical technicians, state police, sheriffs, fish and wildlife personnel, corrections personnel, livestock inspectors, bridge inspectors, airport maintenance personnel, ambulances, medical doctors, registered nurses and National Guard troops. In total, at least 33 states aided the law enforcement response effort in Mississippi through the EMAC. Federal costs in Mississippi have also been substantial. FEMA reports that as of January 4, 2006, it had dispersed in Mississippi just over $1 billion in assistance via its Individuals and Households program and obligated to the state and local governments $666 million in public assistance to repair things like roads and bridges. SBA, FEMA reports, has approved home, business and economic injury loans totaling over $529 million. USACE has installed nearly 50,000 temporary roofs through its Operation Blue Roof program, making that effort 99% complete, and in addition to the efforts of local governments and contractors, removed more than 23 million cubic yards of debris. While just over 30,000 FEMA travel trailers and mobile homes are now occupied in Mississippi, four shelters housing 759 people remained open at year's end. Louisiana impact of Hurricane Katrina. On August 28th at 10 a.m. CDT, the NWS field office in New Orleans issued a bulletin predicting catastrophic damage to New Orleans, including partial destruction of half of the well-constructed houses in the city, severe damage to most industrial buildings rendering them inoperable, the creation of a huge debris field of trees, telephone poles, cars and collapsed buildings, and a lack of clean water. As previously noted, NWS predicted the impact on Louisiana would be a human suffering incredible by modern standards. Unfortunately, much of what the NWS predicted came to pass. With intense gale force winds and massive storm surge, the effect of Hurricane Katrina on southeast Louisiana was indeed catastrophic. After 11 a.m. CDT on August 29th, several sections of the levee system in New Orleans breached and 80% of the city was under water at peak flooding, which in some places was 20 feet deep. The extensive flooding left many residents stranded, long after Hurricane Katrina had passed, unable to leave their homes. Stranded survivors dotted the tops of houses citywide. Flooding in the Ninth Ward sent residents onto rooftops seeking aid. Many others were trapped inside attics, unable to escape. Some chopped their way to their roofs with hatchets and sledgehammers, which residents had been urged to keep in their attics in case of such events. Clean water was unavailable, and power outages were expected to last for weeks. Katrina took approximately 1,100 lives in Louisiana, most due to the widespread storm surge-induced flooding and its aftermath in the New Orleans area. Fatalities included some of those widely seen on the media, Bodies at refugee centres, such as an old woman in a wheelchair who'd been covered with a cloth, and a man dead on the interstate. In addition to flooding, contaminated water also caused deaths. On September 6th, E. coli was detected in the water supply, and according to the Centres for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, five people died from bacterial infections caused by the toxic waters. The economic and environmental ramifications of Katrina have been widespread, 
and could in some respects be long-lasting due to effects on large population and tourism centres the oil and gas industry and transportation the hurricane severely damaged or destroyed workplaces in new orleans and other heavily populated areas of the northern gulf coast resulting in thousands of lost jobs and millions of dollars in lost tax revenues for the affected communities all told forty one of louisiana's sixty four parishes suffered serious damage thousands of homes and businesses throughout entire neighborhoods in the new orleans metropolitan area were destroyed by the flood strong winds also caused damage in the new orleans area including downtown where windows in some high-rise buildings were blown out and the roof of the louisiana superdome partially peeled away as of mid-january two thousand six the federal costs fema reported for louisiana were enormous specifically fema said it had provided four billion dollars directly to katrina victims for financial and housing assistance through its individuals and housing program an amount it projected will eventually grow to a total of seven point seven billion dollars including costs from hurricane rita in late september two thousand five fema had paid out an additional three point one billion dollars in housing assistance to victims of katrina and rita and projected it will pay seventeen billion dollars in claims under the national flood insurance program to policyholders in louisiana likewise loan activity in the wake of hurricanes katrina and rita has been substantial fema has approved five hundred and thirty nine million dollars in community disaster loans in louisiana for essential public services in hard-hit communities including a one hundred and twenty million dollar loan to the city of new orleans and sba has approved one point three billion dollars in loans to homeowners and renters and two hundred and fifty two million dollars in disaster assistance loans to businesses End of section 12. Section 13 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. A Failure of Initiative final report of the select bipartisan committee to investigate the preparation for and response to hurricane katrina by the united states house of representatives hurricane pam the hurricane pam exercise reflected recognition by all levels of government of the dangers of a catastrophic hurricane striking new orleans one of the key planning and preparedness steps many of the local state and federal officials involved in the response to katrina in louisiana took part in was the july two thousand four exercise commonly known as hurricane pam fema funded and participated in this disaster simulation exercise in which a fictional strong category three with qualities of a category four hurricane named pam hit the New Orleans area. Emergency officials from 50 parish, state, federal, and volunteer organizations faced this scenario during the five-day exercise held at the Louisiana State Emergency Operations Center in Baton Rouge. The purpose of the exercise was to help officials develop joint response plans for a catastrophic hurricane in Louisiana. While many found the PAM exercise to be useful in executing a better response to Katrina, the exercise also highlighted lessons learned that were not implemented, and did not anticipate certain weaknesses that Katrina exposed. The Hurricane PAM scenario focused on 13 parishes in southeast Louisiana, Ascension, Assumption, Jefferson, Lafourche, Orleans, Plaquemines, St. Bernard, St. Charles, St. James, St. John, St. Tammany, Tangipahoa, and Terrebonne. Representatives from outside these primary parishes, including officials from Mississippi's Emergency Management Agency, EMA, participated because hurricane evacuation and sheltering involve communities throughout Louisiana and into Arkansas, Mississippi, and Texas. The Hurricane Pam exercise scenario was prescient. 
The virtual storm brought sustained winds of 120 miles per hour, up to 20 inches of rain in parts of southeast Louisiana, and storm surges that topped the levees and flooded the New Orleans area. The exercise assumed that 300,000 people would not evacuate in advance. 500,000 to 600,000 buildings would be destroyed. Phone and sewer services would be knocked out and chemical plants would be flooded. 97% of all communications would be down. About 175,000 people would be injured. 200,000 would become sick, and more than 60,000 would be killed. About 1,000 shelters would be needed for evacuees. Boats and helicopters would be needed for thousands of rescues because many residents would be stranded by floodwaters. A catastrophic flood would leave swaths of southeast Louisiana uninhabitable for more than a year. The PAM simulation was designed and run by a private contractor, Baton Rouge-based Innovative Emergency Management Incorporated, IEM. FEMA issued the request for proposal in 2004, asking for speedy execution of the catastrophic planning project. IEM was awarded the contract for more than a half million dollars in May 2004, and was told by FEMA it had 53 days to mount the exercise. As it can take up to eight months to write an emergency plan, six to twelve months to train on that plan, and about one year to issue the report, PAM was clearly a different type of plan in scope, execution, and timing. According to IEM President Madhu Berawal, Hurricane PAM was a planning exercise designed to develop usable information in a much shorter time frame. FEMA and Louisiana officials accelerated the planning process because of the overwhelming consensus that a Category 5 hurricane hitting New Orleans was one of the most likely and devastating disaster scenarios our nation faced, Barry Wall explained. This effort was part of FEMA's larger initiative for conducting catastrophic disaster planning, in which it chose 25 disaster scenarios based on priority of risk. A hurricane hitting New Orleans was picked as the first scenario to be studied, According to Berrywall, we were still fairly early in the process of developing a formal response plan for New Orleans when Katrina made landfall. In July of 2004, IEM held its first workshop. The initial eight-day workshop had over 300 participants from federal, regional, and local agencies. The first three days were dedicated to establishing the specifics of the disaster scenario and pre-landfall planning, the remaining five days to post-landfall logistics. Officials were presented with a hurricane scenario designed by Louisiana State University, LSU, researchers. Ivor Van Heerden, an LSU professor who used computer modeling to help create a realistic hurricane, said, It was a slow-moving Category 3 storm, something that could quite easily happen and designed so that it totally flooded the city, so that the participants could try to understand the full impact of a flooded New Orleans. Indeed, experts involved in the Hurricane Pam exercise were struck by the similarity of the simulation to the actual destructive conditions wrought by Katrina. According to Berrywall, Pam's slow-moving Category 3 made it virtually equal in force and devastation to Katrina's Category 4, based on its surge and wind capacity, and of course Katrina itself was later recategorized as a strong Category 3. During the PAM simulation, participants broke into groups and devised responses as the disaster scenario unfolded. The workshop focused on issues ranging from search and rescue and temporary sheltering to unwatering, debris removal, and medical care. Not all issues, however, were covered in the workshop. Berrawal said, while issues related to security and communications were on the agenda, the development of a plan to coordinate the displacement of schoolchildren took precedence. Berrawal also said the issue of pre-landfall evacuation was not addressed, although Exercise PAM did make the basic presumption that the state and locals were responsible for pre-landfall evacuations. 
Apparently FEMA directed IEM to emphasize post-landfall and recovery issues in the PAM exercise, as pre-landfall evacuation had always been a focal point in prior emergency disaster planning sessions. The Southeast Louisiana Catastrophic Hurricane Plan was the product of these series of workshops. The plan was designed to be the first step towards producing a comprehensive hurricane response plan, jointly approved and implemented by federal, state, and city officials. By January 2005, IEM sent a draft planning document to the state and localities based on the planning derived from the July workshop. The delivery of the draft was expedited to give the Southeast Louisiana Emergency Management Planners time to prepare for the 2005 hurricane season. Indeed, IEM scurried to make the plan available at this early date, so officials could use it and translate it into individual detailed operational plans. Verawal noted the plan was not meant to provide operational detail, but rather was designed to provide general guidance, a sort of to-do list for state and localities. Berrawal further characterized the exercise as a work in progress. She described IEM's role as facilitator and assessors of consequences. The plan itself outlines 15 subjects that emergency managers should address during and after a catastrophic storm hitting New Orleans. The report is detailed in certain respects. It includes diagrams for makeshift loading docks to distribute water, ice, and food to storm victims, color-coded to show where pallets, traffic cones, and trash bins would be placed. Yet in other places, the report is less specific. It does not identify, for example, what hospitals or airports would be used. Numerous action plans, ranging from debris removal to sheltering to search and rescue, were developed. For example, state transportation officials took the lessons learned from the PAM exercise and previous hurricanes and revised the state's contraflow plan. The revisions included making adjustments to traffic lights, cessation of construction, and greater coordination with the private sector. State officials reported that Hurricane Pam greatly improved the state's contraflow evacuation plan. In fact, federal, state, and local officials across the board agreed the contraflow plan was a success story of Katrina's emergency response. Over 1.2 million were evacuated in the 48 hours prior to landfall. As part of the PAM exercise, planners also identified lead and support agencies for search and rescue, and established a command structure that would include four areas with up to 800 searchers. For example, the Search and Rescue Group developed a transportation plan for getting stranded residents out of harm's way. The Medical Care Group reviewed and enhanced existing plans. The Medical Action Plan included patient movement details and identified probable locations such as state university campuses, where individuals would receive care and then be transported to hospitals, special needs shelters, or regular shelters as necessary. Workshops, subsequent to the initial five-day Hurricane Pam exercise, were held in November 2004 and August 2005. A second Hurricane Pam exercise was planned for the summer of 2005, but did not take place, apparently due to lack of funding. Agencies had anticipated expanding on aspects of response and recovery that were not explored in the 2004 exercise. Finding. Implementation of lessons learned from Hurricane Pam was incomplete. While state and local officials turned some lessons from the Hurricane Pam exercise into improvements of their emergency plans, other important changes were not made. State health officials said the exercise had helped them better prepare for evacuation of hospital patients and special needs people. Since Pam was a catastrophic hurricane with flooding of New Orleans, it required them to consider the issue of evacuating New Orleans hospitals and the Superdome's special needs shelter. Subsequent to the exercise, medical officials held planning sessions focused on post-landfall care and evacuation. 
The contingency plan for the medical component was almost complete when Katrina made landfall. Officials said, although the plan was not yet finalized, it proved invaluable to the response effort. Further, in the aftermath of Katrina, varying opinions have surfaced as to the roles and responsibilities established during the Hurricane Pam exercise. Some state and parish officials said they saw Pam as a contract of what the various parties were going to do, and the federal government did not do the things it had committed to doing. According to Dr. Walter Maestri, the Jefferson Parish Director of Emergency Management, he understood that FEMA may not provide help until 48 to 72 hours later. But then he expected help. That is, once the state cleared the roads, he anticipated that FEMA trucks would arrive with large quantities of water, food, and ice. Although these were the parish's planning assumptions, he said FEMA did not get substantial relief to the parish until 11 days after landfall. Dr. Maestri also said the Hurricane Pam documentation makes it clear what FEMA was supposed to do, but FEMA did not do those things. Berrywall said, however, the plan derived from the Pam exercise was intended as a bridging document designed to serve as a guide and road map to be used by emergency operational officials at the state and local level. In other words, it was up to the state and local officials to take the plan and turn it into more detailed individual operational plans. Yet according to Scott Wells, Deputy Federal Coordinating Officer from FEMA, there were several Hurricane Pam exercise to-do items state and local governments did not complete. For example, the state was supposed to develop more detailed concepts and plans in several areas. 1. Search and Rescue. 2. Rapid Assessment Teams. 3. Medical Evacuation. 4. Sheltering and Temporary Housing. 5. Commodity Distribution. and 6. Debris Removal. The state's previous Louisiana Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness Deputy Director had laid these six areas out as priorities for the state to work on. In Wells's view, the only one of these where the state made some progress was medical evacuation. Wells also said, however, that the need to shelter special needs people in the Superdome showed the state and city had not taken steps, which they had agreed to do after the PAM exercise, to coordinate the movement and sheltering of these people further north, away from the Gulf. As a result of the exercise and subsequent planning workshops, the state was supposed to develop hasty plans to address all these areas. He said although he had tried to get state officials to focus on these hasty plans just before landfall, they would not do so. According to Wells, the state had also agreed to learn and exercise a unified command through the incident command system. Wells said the state did not do so, which led to major command and control problems during Katrina. Conclusion Hurricane Katrina highlighted many weaknesses that either were not anticipated by the PAM exercise, or perhaps were lessons learned but simply not implemented. For example, Hurricane PAM has been criticized for its emphasis on managing the aftermath of the catastrophe, and not creating initiatives that would diminish the magnitude of the catastrophe. Indeed, much of the recrimination over the Hurricane Katrina response came because government authorities apparently failed to have a plan in place to assist in evacuating individuals without transportation, nor did they appear to have an adequate sheltering plan in place. With Hurricane Pam's striking resemblance to Katrina in force and devastation, many have been left wondering at the failure to anticipate and plan for these essentials. Is a plan that leaves 300,000 in a flooded city and results in 60,000 deaths acceptable? End of section 13. Section 14 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
a failure of initiative final report of the select bipartisan committee to investigate the preparation for and response to hurricane katrina by the united states house of representatives chapter fourteen levies part one Quote, what happened to us this year however can only be described as a catastrophe of biblical proportions we in louisiana know hurricanes and hurricanes know us we would not be here today if the levees had not failed kathleen babineau blanco governor state of louisiana select committee hearing december fourteenth two thousand five summary the levees protecting new orleans were not built to survive the most severe hurricanes it was a well-known and repeatedly documented fact that a severe hurricane could lead to overtopping or breaching of the levees and flooding of the metropolitan area in fact for years the u s army corps of engineers u s a c e has had a written plan for underwatering i e draining new orleans in such a contingency this well-known threat was the motivation for fema to sponsor the hurricane pam exercise the potential for katrina to be the big one and breach the levees was also the key reason for the national weather service governor of louisiana and mayor of new orleans to issue such dire warnings once construction of the levees was completed by u s a c e the responsibilities for operating and maintaining the levees were split among many local organizations which is the standard cooperation agreement for carrying out flood control projects nationwide the costs of constructing these projects are shared with operation and maintenance being a one hundred per cent local responsibility these include levee boards in each parish as well as separate water and sewer boards the number of organizations involved and disagreements among them makes accountability diffuse and creates potential gaps and weaknesses in parts of the flood protection system in one case improvements to levee strength which may have mitigated or prevented some of the critical breaches that flooded downtown new orleans were rejected by the competing local organizations there also appear to have been lapses in both maintenance and inspections of selected levees including those that breached also prior to hurricane katrina residents along those same levees reported they were leaking another potential lapse in maintenance despite the well-known importance of the levees and the consequences of failure the local levee boards responsible for maintaining and operating the levees did not have any warning system in place while federal regulations require that they monitor levees during periods of potential flooding the requirement is impractical to implement during a hurricane in addition to no warning system the loss of communications situational awareness and only sporadic reports of flooding from a variety of sources made it difficult to confirm that there were breaches in the levees and then to assess the damage these factors as well as physical difficulties of getting to the breach sites combined to delay repair of the levee breaches the ultimate causes of the levee breaches and subsequent flooding of new orleans are yet to be determined at least four forensic investigations are under way to examine scientific evidence and determine the reasons for levee breaches these include investigations by usace's engineer research and development center the National Science Foundation, NSF, the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, and Louisiana State University, LSU. Possible causes include, one, the design was not appropriate for the purpose, two, the storm exceeded levee design standards, three, the levees were not actually built to the original design standards, four, the levees were not properly maintained, or five a combination of these and other factors finding levees protecting new orleans were not built for the most severe hurricanes new orleans is protected from flooding by a system of levees as noted in the background chapter hurricanes threaten the gulf coast every year and new orleans is particularly vulnerable because of its location and topography the majority of the metropolitan area is below sea level over the years the city has continued to sink due to drainage subsidence and compaction of the soils 
as an example of previous damage hurricane betsy brought extensive destruction to new orleans when it made landfall in louisiana in september nineteen sixty five unfortunately many of the descriptions and photos from hurricane betsy sound and look familiar to our nation as it considers the damage from hurricane katrina forty years later according to usace's after action report on hurricane betsy point she left in her wake a path of destruction unparalleled by any other storm in the recorded history of louisiana point betsy inundated over five thousand square miles of louisiana including highly populated urban areas in orleans and st bernard parishes point extensive flooding was caused by overtopping and breaching of existing protection levees in orleans plaquemine and st bernard parishes point as betsy's winds and tidal surge rolled inland entire buildings were swept away from their foundations and floated as far as ten miles away point betsy left eighty one dead over seventeen thousand six hundred injured and caused the evacuation of two hundred and fifty thousand to storm shelters point betsy left thousands homeless in south louisiana returning refugees often found only a pile of debris where their homes had stood just days before point betsy left numerous towns in south louisiana with no means of communication after hurricane betsy in nineteen sixty five federal and state governments proposed a number of flood control projects to deal with the threat of hurricanes and the flooding they might cause in new orleans these included a series of control structures concrete flood walls and levees along lake pontchartrain and several other waterways one of the major projects is formally called the lake pontchartrain and vicinity louisiana hurricane protection project this project included levees along the lake pontchartrain lakefront the seventeenth street canal the london avenue canal the orleans avenue canal the intercoastal waterway the industrial canal the mississippi river gulf outlet and other areas although the project was federally authorized it was a joint federal state and local effort with shared costs levees were designed for a standard hurricane not the most severe hurricanes the levees protecting new orleans were not designed to withstand the most severe hurricanes according to usace's plans for underwatering new orleans Quote, the hurricane protection system is not designed for the largest storms and as a result the metropolitan area is vulnerable to flooding from hurricane storm surges End quote. usace originally designed the levees around new orleans to protect against a hurricane intensity that might occur once every two to three hundred years this protection level was used by USACE in consultation with the U.S. Weather Bureau to develop specific criteria for a standard project hurricane. The standard project hurricane is a statistical compilation of many combined hurricane parameters or characteristics intended to simulate a natural hurricane occurrence in southeast Louisiana the standard project hurricane was used not only for the lake pontchartrain project but also nationwide for all hurricane protection projects where the loss of human life is possible according to usace the standard project hurricane was used to design the new orleans levees and is roughly equivalent to a fast moving or moderate category three hurricane however there is no direct comparison of the standard project hurricane to a specific category on the saphir simpson hurricane scale which did not exist when the levees were designed as shown in the table below the standard project hurricane is equivalent to a hurricane with category two winds category three storm surge and category four barometric pressure in addition there is no standard hurricane the actual forces that levees need to withstand are a function of several factors according to the preliminary nsf study quote, the actual wind wave and storm surge loadings imposed at any location within the overall flood protection system are a function of location relative to the storm wind speed and direction orientation of levees local bodies of water channel configurations offshore contours vegetative cover etc 
they also vary over time as the storm moves through the region End quote. similarly usace documents indicate that quote, overtopping will depend upon the intensity of the storm the track that the center or eye of the storm follows and the speed at which it travels along the track End quote. Although the Lake Pontchartrain project is named a hurricane protection project, a number of factors other than saving lives and property are included in the design of such projects. For example, in addition to protecting urban and community lives and health, the design of such projects must include environmental and economic effects and ensure that benefits of the completed project outweigh its cost of construction. In discussing the design of the Lake Pontchartrain project in a 1978 hearing, USACE District Commander for New Orleans, Colonel Early Rush, stated, quote, Even though economists may, and in this case did, favor protection to a lower scale to produce a higher ratio of benefits to projected costs, the threat of loss of human life mandated using the standard project hurricane. End quote. Potential for Katrina to breach levees was well known, leading to urgent warnings. Even with its hurricane protection system, it was common knowledge that New Orleans was susceptible to hurricane-caused flooding. The risks of a major hurricane and flooding in New Orleans had been covered in the general media by Scientific American, October 2001, and National Geographic, October 2004, as well as in emergency management literature. A recent article in the Natural Hazards Observer stated, quote, When Hurricane Katrina came ashore on August 29, she ended decades of anticipation. There were few hazards in the United States more studied by scientists and engineers, and there was ample warning that a strong storm could cause the city of New Orleans to flood. End quote. Emergency planners in the local area were particularly knowledgeable about this potentiality. A November 2004 article in Natural Hazards Observer, written by Shirley Laska of the Center for Hazards Assessment, Response and Technology at the University of New Orleans, laid out the hypothetical case that Hurricane Ivan had hit New Orleans. The article cites a fictional situation that is now all too real to the nation. Quote, New Orleans was spared this time, but had it not been, Hurricane Ivan would have caused the levees between the lake and the city to overtop and fill the city bowl with water from lake levee to river levee, in some places as deep as 20 feet. Recent evacuation surveys show that two-thirds of non-evacuees with the means to evacuate chose not to leave because they felt safe in their homes. Other non-evacuees with means relied on cultural traditions of not leaving or were discouraged by negative experiences with past evacuations. Should this disaster become a reality, it would undoubtedly be one of the greatest disasters, if not the greatest, to hit the United States, with estimated costs exceeding $100 billion. Survivors would have to endure conditions never before experienced in a North American disaster. Hurricane Ivan had the potential to make the unthinkable a reality. Next time, New Orleans may not be so fortunate. End quote. Because of the well-known potential for flooding, USACE has had a plan for several years for draining New Orleans. Underwatering plan, Greater Metropolitan Area, New Orleans, Louisiana, dated August 18, 2000. This plan provides details on the hurricane protection system and describes methods to get the water out after catastrophic flooding from a hurricane. The premise of the plan is that a Category 4 or 5 hurricane may produce storm surge water levels of sufficient height to overtop the existing protection system. The plan lays out a series of scenarios that could occur and suggests appropriate emergency responses to unwater the area. For example, in one case, quote, there is catastrophic flooding due to complete overtopping of the levees and flood walls and inundation of the protected area. There will be extensive and severe erosion of levees and perhaps complete breaches. Due to the high water levels, all of the pumping stations will probably be flooded with major damages. The levee districts and drainage departments may be dysfunctional to some degree. End quote. 
in more recent years well before hurricane katrina questions were raised about the ability of the lake pontchartrain project to withstand more powerful hurricanes than the standard project hurricane such as a category four or five hurricane u s a c e had discussed undertaking a study of modifications needed to increase the strength of the existing levees but no formal study was undertaken as discussed earlier in the hurricane pam chapter fema sponsored the hurricane pam exercise to look at the response to and recovery from a catastrophic hurricane hitting new orleans and flooding the city in that scenario quote, it was a slow-moving category three storm something that could quite easily happen and the exercise scenario was designed so that it totally flooded the city so that the participants could try to understand the full impacts of a flooded new orleans end quote. according to ivor van heerden the lsu professor who used computer modeling to help create a realistic hurricane for the exercise again the key reason for that exercise was the well-known potential for levee failure and catastrophic flooding in the metropolitan area as katrina turned and began its track toward new orleans the potential for the levees overtopping or breaching and flooding new orleans resulted in a number of dire warnings from federal state and local officials as also discussed in the evacuation chapter the national weather service issued a warning on sunday august twenty eighth stating that katrina was quote, a most powerful hurricane with unprecedented strength that devastating damage was expected and that most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks and that there will be human suffering incredible by modern standards end quote governor blanco also made dire predictions stating in several interviews on saturday and sunday that flooding in new orleans was a major concern on saturday at approximately eight p m she appeared on c n n and said that in new orleans quote, the storm surge could bring in fifteen to twenty feet of water people in the city of new orleans will not survive that if indeed that happens end quote similarly in a news conference on sunday morning mayor nagin said quote, the storm surge most likely will topple our levee system End quote. finding responsibilities for levee operations and maintenance were diffuse u s a c e oversees design and construction then turns levees over to local sponsors several organizations are responsible for building operating and maintaining the levees surrounding metropolitan new orleans u s a c e generally contracts to design and build the levees after construction u s a c e turns the levy over to a local sponsor u s a c e regulations state that once a local sponsor has accepted a project u s a e c may no longer expend federal funds on construction or improvements this prohibition does not include repair after a flood. Federally authorized flood control projects, such as the Lake Pontchartrain project, are eligible for 100% federal rehabilitation if damaged by a flood. The Mississippi River levees are the exception to the arrangement just described. USAEC operates and maintains these levees these levees generally withstood hurricane katrina except for a breach south of new orleans in plaquemines parish the parish that took the full force of hurricane katrina at landfall the local sponsor has a number of responsibilities in accepting responsibilities for operations maintenance repair and rehabilitation the local sponsor signs a contract called a cooperation agreement agreeing to meet specific standards of performance this agreement makes the local sponsor responsible for liability for that levy. For most of the levies surrounding New Orleans, the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development was the state entity that originally sponsored the construction. After construction, the state turned over control to local sponsors. These local sponsors accepted completed units of the project from 1977 to 1987, depending on when the specific units were completed. The local sponsors are responsible for operation, maintenance, repair, and rehabilitation of the levees when the construction of the project or a project unit is complete. Local sponsors do not have control over all factors that could affect their parts of the levee system. 
the local sponsors include a variety of separate local organizations for example different parts of the lake pontchartrain and vicinity louisiana hurricane protection project were turned over to four different local sponsors to include the orleans east jefferson lake bourne and pontchartrain levee districts in addition there are separate water and sewer districts that are responsible for maintaining pumping stations the USACE unwatering plan notes these arrangements by stating that, among other factors, quote, the political boundaries with internal local levies have resulted in this series of loops or bowls of low-lying ground encircled by levees and flood walls. Each of these areas is served by its own drainage collection and pumping stations, end quote. The different local organizations involved had the effect of diffusing responsibility and creating potential weaknesses. For example, levee breaches and distress were repeatedly noted at transition sections where different organizations were responsible for different pieces, and thus two different levee or wall systems joined together. According to USACE, quote, at sections where infrastructure elements were designed and maintained by multiple authorities and their multiple protection elements came together, the weakest or lowest segment or element controlled the overall performance. End quote. Similarly, a scientist working on the NFS study, Raymond Seed, stated there needs to be better coordination of these transition sites. Peter Nicholson, head of an ASCE team investigating the levees, said in response to a question of whether transition sections mattered, quote, Well, certainly we find that each individual organization will do as they see fit, and when the two sections of the flood control system operated or owned, designed, maintained by each of those different organizations come together, they may be in two different manners. They may have two different heights. They may be two different materials. The different organizations also have different agendas, and sometimes these can thwart efforts to improve the safety of the overall system. Seed also provided an example where USACE had suggested improvements to the strength of the system that were rejected by the competing organizations. According to Seed, quote, no one is in charge. You have got multiple agencies, multiple organizations, some of whom aren't on speaking terms with each other, sharing responsibilities for public safety. The Corps of Engineers had asked to put floodgates into the three canals, which nominally might have mitigated and prevented the three main breaches that did so much destruction downtown. But they weren't able to do so because, unique to New Orleans, the reclamation districts who are responsible for maintaining the levees are separate from the water and sewage district, which does the pumping. Ordinarily, the reclamation district does the deep water pumping, which is separate from the water system. These guys don't get along. End quote. While required inspections of levees were done, some deficiencies in maintenance were not fully addressed. Both USACE and the local sponsors have ongoing responsibility to inspect the levees. Annual inspections are done both independently by USACE and jointly with the local sponsor. In addition, federal regulations require local sponsors to ensure that flood control structures are operating as intended and to continuously patrol the structure to ensure no conditions exist that might endanger it. Records reflect that both USACE and the local sponsors kept up with their responsibilities to inspect the levees. According to USACE, in June 2005, it conducted an inspection of the levy system jointly with the state and local sponsors. In addition, GAO reviewed USACE's inspection reports from 2001 to 2004 for all completed project units of the Lake Pontchartrain project. These reports indicated the levees were inspected each year and had received, quote, acceptable ratings, end quote. However, both the NSF-funded investigators and USACE officials cited instances where brush and even trees were growing along the 17th Street and London Avenue canals levees, which is not allowed under the established standards for levee protection. Thus, although the records reflect that inspections were conducted and the levees received acceptable ratings, the records appeared to be incomplete or inaccurate. In other words, they failed to reflect the tree growth, and, of course, neither USACE nor the local sponsor had taken corrective actions to remove the trees. 
in addition there was apparently seepage from one canal before hurricane katrina indicating problems had developed in the levee after construction specifically residents of new orleans who live along the seventeenth street canal said water was leaking from the canal and seeping into their yards months before hurricane katrina caused the levee system to collapse the leaks they said occurred within several hundred feet of the levee that later failed national public radio which reported the story said quote, state and federal investigators say that a leak may have been an early warning sign that the soil beneath the levee was unstable and help explain why it collapsed they also say if authorities had investigated and found that a leak was undermining the levee they could have shored it up and prevented the catastrophic breach End quote. National Public Radio also reported that work orders confirm that the Sewage and Water Board had visited the location of the seepage a number of times. However, both USACE and the Orleans Levy District, with shared responsibilities for inspecting the levees, reported that they had not received any reports of seepage at the site. End of Section 14 Section 15 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A Failure of Initiative. Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Levies, Part 2 Finding The Lack of a Warning System for Breaches and Other Factors Delayed Repairs to Levies Actual Levy Breaches Caused Catastrophic Flooding in New Orleans Katrina made landfall as an extraordinarily powerful hurricane. Katrina was expected to be a Category 4 or 5 storm, although a recent updated analysis from the National Weather Service concluded it made landfall at the upper end of a Category 3 hurricane, with estimated maximum sustained winds of 110 knots, near Burris, Louisiana. While Katrina had weakened from its peak intensity of Category 5, it remained a very large hurricane. The extent of tropical force and hurricane force winds were as large as predicted when Katrina was at maximum intensity. Due to Katrina's large size, it is possible that sustained winds of Category 4 strength briefly affected the extreme southeastern tip of Louisiana. However, the sustained winds over all of the metropolitan New Orleans and Lake Pontchartrain likely remained weaker than Category 3 strength. The storm surge, not the winds, is the most destructive part of a hurricane, and Katrina produced a massive storm surge. A precise measurement of Katrina's storm surge in the New Orleans area is difficult to measure, in part because of the widespread failures of tide gauges. However, various efforts are underway to make a definitive determination, particularly near the levees. While the surge varied by location, some preliminary estimates are that the storm surge off Lake Bourne, which abuts New Orleans, was approximately 18 to 25 feet. One of the highest credible reports of storm surge came from the Hancock County, Mississippi Emergency Operations Center, where the storm surge was 27 feet. One reason for the large size of the storm surge was that Katrina, although making landfall as a strong Category 3, had already generated large northward propagating swells when it was a Category 4 and 5 hurricane during the 24 hours before landfall. One of the instrument buoys located south of Dauphin Island, Alabama, measured a wave height of 55 feet, which matches the largest significant wave height ever measured by such a buoy. Because the eye of Katrina passed just slightly to the east of New Orleans, the hurricane threw unusually severe wind loads and storm surges on the flood protection systems. The surge overtopped large sections of the levees during the morning of August 19, east of New Orleans, in Orleans and St. Bernard parishes, and it also pushed water up the intercoastal waterway and into the industrial canal. The water rise in Lake Pontchartrain strained the flood walls along the canals adjacent to its southern shore, including the 17th Street Canal and the London Avenue Canal. 
breaches along all of these canals led to flooding of eighty per cent of new orleans to depths up to twenty feet the flooding of central new orleans led to the most widespread and costly damage of the hurricane it also led to the difficulties encountered by emergency responders that are documented elsewhere in this report the lack of warning systems and degraded communications prevented situational awareness of the breaches in the levees and delayed repairs despite the well-known importance of the levees and the consequence of failure the local levee boards responsible for maintaining and operating the levees do not have any warning system in place federal regulations require local sponsors to ensure that flood control structures are operating as intended and to continuously patrol the structure during flood periods to ensure that no conditions exist that might endanger it however it would be impractical to monitor the levees during a hurricane the executive director of the orleans levee district max hearn stated quote, as the hurricane approached and the water levels began to rise district employees monitored the water levels and patrolled the flood control system as weather conditions deteriorated and became unsafe the district's employees were pulled into sheltered areas to ride out the storm End quote. Again, with the large number of local organizations involved, it was not always clear who would be responsible for monitoring the levees and sounding the alarm if there was a breach. According to one scientist, quote, If the lines of responsibility and who is in charge aren't clear, it is very hard to decide who needs to be issuing warnings and public notices. End quote. Given that Hurricane Katrina led to the loss of power and severely degraded communications, as discussed in the Communications and Command and Control chapters, it is not clear that any warning system would have survived or have been effective. In the absence of communications that would have provided situational awareness, there were many rumors of flooding and its causes that had to be confirmed before assessment teams and repair teams could be dispatched. There were many sources of these reports of flooding. Point. Monday, August 29, at 6 a.m., floodwaters began flowing into Jackson Barracks, according to Louisiana National Guard officers. Jackson Barracks is near the Orleans Parish, St. Bernard Parish line, and the floodwaters were determined later to be from the Industrial Canal breach. By late Monday morning, the floodwaters were 8 to 10 feet deep at Jackson Barracks, requiring the Louisiana National Guard to abandon their operations center and reestablish it at the Superdome. Point. Monday, August 29th at 7.30 a.m., the State of Emergency Operations Center, EOC, received reports of flooding in the last conference call before communications were lost. Jefferson Parish relayed unconfirmed reports of significant flooding in the East Bank. New Orleans reported extensive flooding in the East and on the lakefront. St. Bernard Parish reported overtopping of the Industrial Canal and three feet of water in Araby. When the State Coordinating Officer, SCO, Jeff Smith, asked if those flooding rumors were confirmed, the parish deputy sheriff said they were confirmed and noted that his building was surrounded by whitecaps. Smith also stated he was aware of three to four feet of floodwaters at Jackson Barracks. Point. Monday, August 29, morning. Exact time unknown. USACE District Commander first heard sporadic reports about levee overtopping and breaches. The sources of these early reports included local radio stations and a USACE employee reporting overtopping at the Industrial Canal. Later that day, the USACE district commander issued a situation report noting flooding with 4 to 5 feet of water in Kenner, Jefferson Parish, flooding with 10 feet of water in Araby, St. Bernard Parish, and water coming into Lakeview, New Orleans, from the 17th Street Canal. The report also said that there was a one-block section of the industrial canal that had breached. Point. Monday, very late evening, exact time unknown, off-duty police officers began calling their police stations from their residences to report flooding near the 17th Street and London Avenue canals, according to the New Orleans Police Department. 
deputy chief lonnie swain said that these reports were the department's first knowledge that flooding was moving into central new orleans they had been aware of flooding in east new orleans from lake pontchartrain and the lower ninth ward from the industrial canal beyond these reports known to the national guard the eoc and the new orleans police department u s a c e was trying to determine the detailed status of the levee system however the u s a c e district commander in new orleans also suffered from a lack of communications capabilities as noted earlier there is no early warning system for levee breaches in new orleans on monday at about three p m the commander and a team ventured out to conduct early assessments of the situation they were unable to conduct a thorough review because of the high winds debris and flooding although they had to return to the bunker it was clear to them at that point that new orleans had suffered catastrophic flooding and they began to review plans for unwatering new orleans on tuesday august thirtieth at about nine a m the u s a c e district commander was able to get a helicopter and see the extent of flooding from the air the u s a c e district office began to develop more detailed plans for repairing the levees after the airborne reconnaissance on august thirty u s a c e has authority to provide a variety of emergency response actions when levees fail or are damaged any repairs to federally constructed levees are funded one hundred per cent by the federal government there were also physical barriers that made assessments and repair difficult specifically emergency repair operations to close some of the branches were seriously hampered by lack of access roads u s a c e regulations generally require access roads on top of levees to allow for inspections maintenance and flood fighting operations and most u s a c e levees built in the united states meet this requirement however in new orleans exceptions were made to these regulations because of its highly urban nature access roads were foregone when it was decided to use eye walls in the levee crowns to minimize right-of-ways into surrounding neighborhoods when hurricane katrina led to the breaches in the levees the lack of access roads atop the levees resulted in very significant increases in time and cost to repair the damaged areas poor communications difficulties in doing assessments and physical barriers all served to delay efforts to repair the levees levee repairs did not begin until wednesday when u s a c e began marshalling resources such as contractors materials and equipment at the seventeenth street canal site the louisiana national guard was also involved in these early efforts to conduct emergency repairs of the seventeenth street canal that afternoon u s a c e began dropping three thousand pound sandbags into the breach the next day contractors started delivering sand gravel and rock to the breach site on a newly built access road at both the seventeenth street canal and the london avenue canal army chinook and black hawk helicopters dropped seven thousand pound sandbags an average of six hundred per day into the breaches one breach took over two thousand sandbags before engineers could see the bags under the water surface according to one witness before the select committee the need for sand was so great that u s a c e broke into a local business and took five hundred and eighty thousand dollars worth of sand one week later the seventeenth street canal breach was closed once the levee repairs were under way u s a c e turned its attention to unwatering new orleans and other flooded areas since at least two thousand u s a c e has had a detailed plan for unwatering greater new orleans in the event of flooding these unwatering plans were also discussed in the hurricane pam exercise discussed previously the exercise assumed the levees did not breach however there was flooding due to overtopping which inundated new orleans with at least ten feet of water the purpose of the u s a c e unwatering mission was to remove water from flooded areas new orleans seal off canals from lake pontchartrain repair breaches create a series of deliberate breaches in the levee system to help drain them and pump out final excess with existing and temporary pumps through an emergency contracting process u s a c e contracted four companies to complete the unwatering activities and according to u s a c e only one company shaw environmental of baton rouge could respond in a timely manner 
projections made prior to hurricane katrina that it would take nine weeks to unwater new orleans proved unfounded on october thirteenth forty three days after katrina landfall u s a c e reported that all flood waters had been removed from the city of new orleans finding ultimate cause of levee failures is under investigation results to be determined several investigations are under way to assess causes of levee failure there are at least four ongoing forensic investigations to determine the cause of the levee breaches around new orleans these are being done by usace's engineer research and development center the center for the study of public health impacts of hurricanes lsu the national science foundation and asce each of these investigations has somewhat similar charters and overlapping membership point interactive performance evacuation task force ipet the usace chief engineer appointed the ipet headed by the engineer research and development center to examine and analyze data in a variety of areas e g geodetic reference datum storm and surge wave modeling hydrodynamic forces at the request of the secretary of defense the results will be analyzed independently by asce and the national research council point louisiana state university lsu the hurricane center was appointed by the state of louisiana to lead the state's forensic investigation of the hurricane katrina levee failures the investigation team includes engineers and coastal scientists conducting analysis of the storm surge levels, levee construction, and levee failures. Point. National Science Foundation, NSF. NSF assembled a levee investigation team consisting of leading national and international experts in major disasters. Participating teams of scientists are from the University of California, Berkeley, the Geo Institute of ASCE, the Coasts, Oceans, Ports, and Rivers Institute of ASCE, and the Hurricane Research Center of LSU. Point. American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE. ASCE assembled an independent team of experts consisting of professional engineers with a wide range of geotechnical engineering expertise in the study, safety, and inspection of dams and levees. The purpose of the team is to collect data and make observations to determine why certain sections of the levee system failed and others did not. Preliminary results suggest some levees did not withstand forces they were designed to withstand. Some of the investigators testified or released reports on their preliminary findings. For example, at a November 2, 2005 Senate hearing, witnesses include Paul Mlakar of IPET, Ivor Van Heerden of LSU, Raymond Seed of the University of California, Berkeley, representing the NSF, and Peter Nicholson of the University of Hawaii, representing the ASCE. These witnesses, except Mlakar, testified on the preliminary findings from their investigations. In addition, the NSF and ASCE investigators released a joint interim report with initial findings at that hearing. A month after the Senate hearing, IPET released an interim report with a summary of its field observations, which generally concurred with the NSF-ASCE interim report. In evaluating the causes of levee and flood wall failure, these preliminary reports indicated the impact of the hurricane and thus the potential causes of the breaches varied by location. According to preliminary information from NSF, ASCE, and LSU, most of the levees and flood wall breaches on the east side of New Orleans were caused by overtopping as the storm surge rose over the tops of the levees and or their flood walls and produced erosion that subsequently led to breaches. A variety of factors led to overtopping of the Industrial Canal and the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, MRGO. An LSU scientist, Hassan Madriqui, said the MRGRO worked as a funnel which increased the height of the storm surge and, quote, 
cause floodwaters to stack up several feet higher than elsewhere in the metro area and sharply increased the surge's speed as it rushed through the MRGO and into the industrial canal. End quote. The overtopping eroded the backside of the canals, scoured out the foundations, and led to their collapse and thus major flooding of adjacent neighborhoods. According to Seed, quote, a majority of them, levee breaches, were the result of overtopping, and that simply means that the hurricane was bigger than the levees were built to take. End quote. In contrast, there was little or no overtopping along most of the levees in the vicinity of Lake Pontchartrain. The only breach along Lake Pontchartrain was in New Orleans East, which was probably due to overtopping. But in the drainage canals that feed into Lake Pontchartrain, the 17th Street and London Avenue Canal, there was no overtopping, and the failures were likely caused by weaknesses in the foundation soil underlying the levees, the weakness in the soils used to construct the earthen levee embankments themselves, or weaknesses caused by vegetation growing along the levees. These were the most costly breaches, leading to widespread flooding of central New Orleans, to include the downtown area and several large residential neighborhoods. According to Van Heerden of LSU, quote, the surge in Lake Pontchartrain wasn't that of a Category 3 storm, and nor did it exceed the design criteria of the standard Project Hurricane. Nicholson of ASCE concurred with this assessment, adding, Quote, if the levees on Lake Pontchartrain had done what they were designed to do, a lot of the flooding of New Orleans would not have occurred, and a lot of the suffering that occurred as a result of the flooding would not have occurred. End quote. However, these findings are preliminary. Most of the investigations will not issue their final reports until the spring or summer of 2006. For example, the USACE IPET report is scheduled to be completed in June 2006. Possible causes of the levy breaches include a design not appropriate for the actual application, indicating a shared deficiency, storm conditions simply too overwhelming for the designed levies to withstand, indicating an act of nature, levee walls not secured deeply enough into the soil or otherwise improperly constructed, indicating a USACE deficiency, improper maintenance of the levees, indicating a local deficiency, or a combination of factors. Conclusion Hundreds of miles of levees were constructed to defend metropolitan New Orleans against storm events. These levees were not designed to protect New Orleans from a Category 4 or 5 monster hurricane, and all the key players knew this. The original specifications of the levees offered protection that was limited to withstanding the forces of a moderate hurricane. Once constructed, the levees were turned over to local control, leaving the USACE to make detailed plans to drain New Orleans should it be flooded. The local sponsors, a patchwork quilt of levee and water and sewer boards, were responsible only for their own piece of the levee. It seemed no federal, state, or local entity watched over the integrity of the whole system, which might have mitigated to some degree the effects of the hurricane. When Hurricane Katrina came, some of the levees breached, as many had predicted they would, and most of New Orleans flooded to create untold misery. The forces that destroyed the levees also destroyed the ability to quickly assess damage and make repairs. The reasons for the levee failures appear to be some combination of nature's wrath, the storm was just too large, and man's folly, an assumption that the design, construction, and maintenance of the levees would be flawless. While there was no failure to predict the inevitability and consequences of a monster hurricane, Katrina in this case, there was a failure of initiative to get beyond design and organizational compromises to improve the level of protection afforded. End of section 15. Section 16 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. A Failure of Initiative. Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee 
to investigate the preparation for and response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Chapter 7, Part 1, Evacuation At the local level, I think the biggest failure was leadership didn't take into account the fact that poor residents had no way of evacuating. I also think Governor Blanco should have called for a mandatory evacuation sooner, and that Mayor Nagin should have coordinated better with Amtrak. Terrell Williams, New Orleans Citizen and Evacuee, Select Committee Hearing, December 6, 2005. We estimate that over one million people, or approximately 90% of the affected parishes' populations, evacuated in about a 40-hour period. I don't know of any other evacuation that has occurred with that many people under these circumstances, with that high percentage of people being evacuated in that short of a time period. Colonel, retired, Jeff Smith. Deputy Director, Louisiana Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. Select Committee Hearing, December 14, 2005. Evacuation Failure of complete evacuations led to preventable deaths, great suffering, and further delays in relief. Summary Evacuation is a critical part of emergency preparation for a hurricane. Such preparation includes both detailed evacuation planning and implementation of the evacuation plan in potentially affected areas once a hurricane is projected to make landfall. The states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and many of their localities, for example, New Orleans, have hurricane evacuation plans and years of experience implementing them. In Alabama and Mississippi, the state or localities declared mandatory evacuations as Hurricane Katrina approached, and implementation of their evacuation plans went relatively well. In Louisiana, the state and local implementation of evacuation plans for the general population also went well, resulting in one of the largest emergency evacuations in history. Two of Louisiana's most populous localities, New Orleans and Jefferson Parish, declared mandatory evacuations late, or not at all. While the definition of mandatory evacuation and the associated obligations and liabilities that local governments assume are still being debated, Early designation of the evacuation of New Orleans as mandatory could have increased the number of people that left, resulting in a more complete evacuation, saving lives, and reducing suffering. New Orleans city officials, who were responsible for executing an evacuation plan, and who had the authority to commandeer resources to assist in the evacuation, failed to evacuate or assist in the evacuation of more than 70,000 individuals who did not leave either before the announcement of the mandatory evacuation or before the storm hit. Those who did not evacuate included many who did not have their own means of transportation. Despite the declaration of a mandatory evacuation on Sunday before landfall, New Orleans officials still did not completely evacuate the population. Instead, they opened the Superdome as a shelter of last resort for these individuals. Problems sheltering this population, beyond emergency planners' general preference for evacuation, were exacerbated by inadequate preparations for a large population at the Superdome. For those with medical or special needs, New Orleans and other institutions also failed to evacuate them, but instead sheltered them, a decision that also had negative consequences and is discussed in detail in the medical care chapter. Those individuals in all states who had the means to evacuate but did not do so 
must also share the blame for the incomplete evacuation and the difficulties that followed. The failure of a more complete evacuation led to catastrophic circumstances when Katrina made landfall, particularly in New Orleans, where the force of the hurricane breached the levee system in multiple locations throughout the metropolitan area. As the resulting floodwaters spread through low-lying urban areas, thousands of people who were trapped in their homes climbed onto their roofs or fled into flooded streets. Fortunately, thousands of these people were saved by a massive and heroic search-and-rescue effort. But many were not as fortunate, and hundreds of people died in their homes or other locations, presumably from drowning. Those who were in the Superdome, or those who found shelter and high ground at other locations, suffered horrible conditions. The flood waters, which had been anticipated and even predicted from a large hurricane such as Katrina, furthered the misery and delayed the immediate relief of the remaining population. The incomplete evacuation and flood waters also required a post-hurricane evacuation for which federal, state, and city officials had not prepared. Because of a lack of preparations, planning had to be accomplished in emergency circumstances, where communications and situational awareness were in short supply. Requirements for buses kept growing, as a lack of willing drivers and diversions of buses continued to delay the evacuation of the Superdome and other locations. Finally, the combination of more buses and supplemental airlifts resulted in a complete evacuation of New Orleans. Finding. Evacuations of general populations went relatively well in all three states. Evacuation is a critical part of emergency preparation for a hurricane. Because of the destructive forces of hurricanes, evacuation planning is very important. Preparation for an approaching hurricane includes both detailed evacuation planning and implementation of that plan in potentially affected areas once a hurricane is projected to make landfall. Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, officials told select committee staff that emergency planners prefer evacuation to sheltering people within affected areas because the sheltered population is subject to the most intense dangers of the storm, and because it may be a slow and difficult operation to get relief personnel and supplies back into hurricane-ravaged areas. The state of Louisiana has an evacuation plan, which was revised following Hurricane Ivan in 2004. The evacuation for that storm had caused massive traffic jams leading out of New Orleans, those traffic jams were the result of the southernmost parishes trying to evacuate at the same time as Orleans and Jefferson parishes, the two most populous parishes. The new plan called for a staged evacuation, with the southernmost parishes evacuating first, followed by lower Orleans and Jefferson parishes, and then upper Orleans and Jefferson parishes facilitated by the implementation of contraflow, one-way outbound traffic, on the highways leading out of New Orleans. In addition to the Louisiana state plan, local governments have emergency evacuation plans. The City of New Orleans Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, the New Orleans Plan, provides the authority to order the evacuation of residents threatened by an approaching hurricane, is conferred to the governor by Louisiana statute, but this power is also delegated to each political subdivision of the state by executive order. The New Orleans plan further explains, This authority empowers the chief elected official of New Orleans, the mayor of New Orleans, to order the evacuation of the parish residents threatened by an approaching hurricane. Under this authority, the mayor of New Orleans is responsible for giving the order for a mandatory evacuation and supervising the actual evacuation of his population. 
the mayor's office of emergency preparedness must coordinate with the state on elements of evacuation and assist in directing the transportation of evacuees to staging areas the importance of evacuations is expressed in the new orleans plan the safe evacuation of threatened populations is one of the principal reasons for developing a comprehensive emergency management plan in furtherance of that goal the city of new orleans will utilize all available resources to quickly and safely evacuate threatened areas mississippi also has a state evacuation plan one that takes account of local plans because of the key role that counties play in declaring evacuations according to the testimony of the director of the mississippi emergency management agency m e m a robert latham the authority to make decisions about mandatory evacuations in mississippi rests with local governments however the state is generally included in any discussions about evacuation orders because once a city or county chooses to make such an order state responsibilities for managing traffic including contraflow and opening shelters can come into play in preparing for hurricane katrina the mississippi officials worked through the mema liaisons it dispatched to the counties along or near the gulf coast as well as a representative it had stationed in louisiana's emergency operations center because of contraflow agreements between mississippi and louisiana that provide for evacuations out of southeast louisiana through mississippi alabama also has an evacuation plan and recently revised it lessons learned during alabama's response to hurricanes ivan and dennis helped refine the state's actions as Katrina neared. Having been criticized for triggering evacuations that turned out to be unnecessary, Alabama officials practiced to reduce the time required to reverse traffic flows on the major routes, and encouraged county and local officials to define smaller evacuation zones within their jurisdictions to better target evacuation actions according to governor riley on katrina there was an evacuation plan that was a little more moderate than i hoped for and we convinced everyone in the room to expand it the time before as i said earlier we got some criticism because we may have expanded it too much we have gone back and built a zone type process but we take all of the local team because you have to have local buy-in because it won't work if you don't alabama state and county officials testified that one of their difficulties in planning evacuations is that the army corps of engineers data used as the basis for evacuation plans and models is outdated according to alabama emergency management agency aema director bruce bauman the two coastal counties have had studies done by the army corps of engineers those studies were about five years old in the case of mobile county the data did not include the wind fields so it doesn't give you complete information when you are trying to make decisions on clearance times it is based upon dated information baldwin county has grown by leaps and bounds so that you have got a higher population and not only that before labor day you have got probably a hundred thousand people as far as outside individuals that are tourists down in that area and that is not computed into your clearance times what we have done is we have taken the data that is available that is between twenty two and twenty four hour clearance times for those two counties and generally we allow twenty six to twenty eight hour clearance times but that is a best guess what we need to do is based upon some real-time data so other studies need to be done in that particular area that used to be funded out of the hurricane preparedness program and those studies are lagging way behind mississippi declared mandatory evacuations which generally went well 
Mississippi evacuations were generally mandatory and went relatively well. Five Mississippi counties, Hancock, Jackson, Harrison, Stone, and Pearl River, issued mandatory evacuation orders on or before August 28th for specific areas or zones of their counties and or those living in mobile homes. For example, Harrison County first issued a mandatory evacuation order for its zones A and B, which include all of its gulf front and low-lying areas, at 10 a.m. on August 28th. It strongly advised, but did not mandate, that residents in its highest elevations, Zone C, evacuate the county. According to Governor Haley Barber, he has the authority to usurp county officials' decisions, that is, order a mandatory evacuation if they have not, but he chose not to do so because county officials are closer to the situation than he is. During the evacuation, Mississippi Department of Transportation personnel collected and reported traffic flow information along evacuation routes, including areas where contraflow was in place for those evacuating Louisiana. At 7 p.m. on August 28, traffic counts were consistently high, and the contraflow areas showed a continuous increase in traffic. According to traffic counts, by 11 p.m. that evening, traffic along the evacuation contraflow routes had decreased substantially. Representative Jean Taylor asserted, however, that evacuation planning ought to include providing people with gasoline, especially at the end of the month. The other thing that I find interesting is that in all these scenarios that I'm sure you've thought out, did FEMA bother to realize that it is the 28th of the month? A lot of people live on a fixed income, be it a Social Security check or a retirement check. They've already made their necessary purchase for the month. What they couldn't envision is having to fill up their gas tank one more time, at almost three bucks a gallon, just to get the heck out of there. What I think no one is really focused on is a heck of a lot of people who stayed behind were people with limited means. Former Under Secretary Brown strongly opposed the suggestion that FEMA should have supplied gasoline. Congressman, FEMA is not there to supply gasoline, transportation. It is not the role of the federal government to supply five gallons of gas for every individual to put in a car to go somewhere. I personally believe that is a horrible path to go down, and while my heart goes out to people on fixed incomes, it is primarily a state and local responsibility. Whether providing gasoline should be a federal or state and local responsibility, there may very well have been victims of Hurricane Katrina who did not evacuate because at the end of the month they had run out of money for gasoline and found no other way to get gasoline or evacuate. Alabama mandatory evacuations also went relatively well. Alabama began implementing the evacuation early, and its evacuation also went well. Even before any Alabama evacuations began, AEMA and state transportation officials participated in the FEMA Regional Evacuation Liaison Team conference calls, during which emergency managers from Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi shared information on the status of evacuation routes, road closures, traffic volumes, hotel availability, and other interstate implications of significant population migrations in the region. As it became clear Katrina would have a significant impact on the Alabama coast, Baldwin County emergency management officials called for a voluntary evacuation of all coastal, flood-prone, and low-lying areas at 5 p.m. on Saturday, August 27th. State emergency management officials asked the governor to declare a mandatory evacuation for threatened areas of Baldwin and Mobile counties, on Sunday, August 28th. According to the announcement released by the governor's office, 
In Baldwin County, the order calls for the evacuation of those on Plash Island, the Fort Morgan Peninsula, and all areas south of Fort Morgan Road for Gulf Shores. The order also calls for the evacuation of those living in Perdido Key and south of Perdido Beach Boulevard. Those in all low-lying and flood-prone areas south of I-10 in Baldwin County, and those living along the Mobile Bay area and other water inlets, also fall under the evacuation order. Governor Riley testified, We made it voluntary 36 hours out, and then shortly thereafter we made it mandatory. As it comes closer, as the cone begins to funnel in, and we have a higher likelihood that it is going to happen, we make it mandatory. We ask people to leave. We do everything we can to encourage them to leave. But again, the limiting factor is the amount of time. The difference between trying to evacuate our beaches before Labor Day and after Labor Day is like daylight and dark, because we have so many more vacationers there. And then, when you layer on top of that the number of people that will be coming out of the Florida panhandle that will come through Alabama, if we don't start it three days early, you just physically do not have the capability to take care of it. Alabama did not implement reverse lane strategies, that is, counterflow, in response to Hurricane Katrina, as road closures were limited and traffic volume never warranted it. The state reported 118,900 applications for evacuation assistance by Alabama residents, of which 23,853 were by out-of-state residents. Louisiana evacuation of general population was very successful. The Louisiana evacuation for the general population, including contraflow, worked very well. Governor Kathleen Babineau Blanco and other state officials labeled the implementation of this evacuation as masterful and as one of the most successful emergency evacuations in history. Based on National Weather Service reports of Katrina's dramatic shift toward Louisiana on Friday, the state had less time than planned to prepare for contraflow and had to implement it in a compressed time frame. Nevertheless, the contraflow planning and implementation went smoothly. The state effectively used conference calls to coordinate among the parishes. Some parishes declared some level of evacuation for the entire parish as early as Saturday morning, August 27th, at 9 a.m. These were generally the lower parishes, La Fourche, Plaquemines, St. Bernard and St. Charles, which was consistent with the Louisiana state plan for getting these populations to evacuate ahead of the metropolitan New Orleans population. The parishes generally started with the declaration of a recommended evacuation and changed these to a mandatory evacuation as Katrina got closer. The state also coordinated closely with Mississippi and Texas, on traffic and or sheltering issues. For example, Friday afternoon, Blanco called Barber to coordinate that portion of the contraflow plan that involved highways leading out of Louisiana into Mississippi, and Governor Barber agreed to the contraflow plan. End of Section 16Section 17 of A Failure of Initiative. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. A Failure of Initiative. Final Report of the Select Bipartisan Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina by the United States House of Representatives. Chapter 7, Part 2. Evacuation Continued. Finding. Despite adequate warning 56 hours before landfall, 
Governor Blanco and Mayor Nagin delayed ordering a mandatory evacuation in New Orleans until 19 hours before landfall. Terms for voluntary and mandatory evacuations lack clear definitions. A wide variety of terms were used to describe the levels of evacuation orders, indicating a lack of clarity and a potential point of confusion for the resident population. For example, the different parishes used a wide variety of terms to describe the level of evacuation imposed before declaring a mandatory evacuation. These terms included a precautionary evacuation, a voluntary evacuation, a recommended evacuation, a highly recommended evacuation, and a highly suggested evacuation. It appeared many of these officials were bending over backward to avoid using the term mandatory. Throughout our discussions in all three states, select committee staff were unable to find a clear and consistent definition of a mandatory evacuation. However, there was a consensus among almost all officials in all three states that even under a mandatory evacuation, authorities would not forcibly remove someone from their home. For example, in the case of Louisiana, both Blanco and LOH SEP Deputy Director Colonel Jeff Smith emphatically rejected the idea that people could be forcibly removed from their homes even under a mandatory evacuation order. Blanco said, Well, in the United States of America, you don't force people out of their homes. You urge them. Smith said, It is America. You can't force people onto buses. You can't go into their houses at gunpoint and leave. Under Alabama state law, a mandatory evacuation declaration by the governor is required before counties can take certain actions to ensure maximum compliance with local orders by those at risk. But regarding the practical meaning and effect of mandatory versus voluntary evacuations, Riley said, We probably need to come up with a better definition of what mandatory is, we call it a mandatory evacuation because everyone else calls it a mandatory evacuation. But do we arrest anyone? No. Do we send people door to door? Absolutely. We have a phone system that they can explain to you in just a moment, where we have an automated system that calls every resident, asks them to leave, advises them with a phone message of how important it is. We keep doing it until we get in touch with everyone. Do you ever get to the point that everyone is going to leave? I don't think so. Nevertheless, it is clear to the select committee that declaring a mandatory evacuation delivers a more powerful statement to the public than declaring a voluntary or similarly worded evacuation. A mandatory evacuation implies that individuals do not have a choice that the government will not be able to protect them and provide relief if they remain, and it generally conveys a higher level of urgency. Federal, state, and local officials recognized the potential for catastrophe and flooding and communicated that potential among themselves and to the public. Regardless of the various terms used for evacuations, Federal officials fully informed Blanco and New Orleans Mayor C. Ray Nagin about the threat to New Orleans. On the evening of August 27th, National Hurricane Center Director Max Mayfield called Blanco and later spoke to Nagin about the power of Hurricane Katrina. Also on Sunday, President Bush called Blanco to express his concern for the people of New Orleans and the dangers they faced and urged a mandatory evacuation. On Sunday, the Slidell Office of the National Weather Service issued a very strongly worded warning at approximately 10 a.m. Devastating damage expected. Hurricane Katrina, a most powerful hurricane, with unprecedented strength, rivaling the intensity of Hurricane Camille of 1969, most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks, perhaps longer. 
at least half of well-constructed homes will have roof and wall failure. All gabled roofs will fail, leaving those homes severely damaged or destroyed. Water shortages will make human suffering incredible by modern standards. State and local officials also urged the public to evacuate by foretelling the potentially catastrophic consequences. For example, beginning on Saturday, August 27th, Blanco publicly urged citizens to evacuate the city, expressing her concern for the strength of the levees against at least a Category 4 storm. In several interviews on Saturday and Sunday, Blanco stated that flooding in New Orleans was a major concern. On Saturday, at approximately 8 p.m., she appeared on CNN and said that in New Orleans the storm surge could bring in 15 to 20 feet of water. People in the city of New Orleans will not survive that if indeed that happens. In the Sunday morning papers it was reported that she had said the water levels could reach as high as 20 feet. In a television interview on Sunday, Blanco was asked if the 15-foot levees could survive the storm, and she replied, I don't think anything can tolerate a storm surge of 15 to 20 feet. In a Fox News interview on Sunday, Nagin was very specific about the threat. He said whether the levees would hold was the big question. He said he hoped people who stayed in the French Quarter would go up to their home's second or third story, and bring something to chop through their roofs. He expressed his worry that the levees have never truly been tested the way they're getting ready to be tested. If there's a breach, and if they start to fail, it probably will create somewhat of a domino effect which would pour even more water into the city. Blanco's staff also called ministers on Saturday to urge them to tell their congregations to get out, and apparently the mayor and his staff did similar things but these steps were clearly insufficient. The declarations of a mandatory evacuation were delayed, or never made, in metropolitan New Orleans. Neither Blanco nor Nagin, however, ordered a mandatory evacuation until Sunday morning. According to the Saturday newspapers, Nagin said he will make a decision about evacuations and other emergency procedures Saturday about noon. At a news conference on Saturday, Nagin announced, Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a test, this is the real deal. But as late as Saturday afternoon, according to news reports, Nagin was consulting city lawyers about legal liability to the city's businesses for lost revenue from evacuating customers. In addition, despite express authority to commandeer resources, and enforce or facilitate the evacuation of the city of New Orleans, and despite recognition of the probability that Hurricane Katrina would cause breaches of the levees and flooding of the city, Blanco and Nagin did not exercise those authorities by declaring a mandatory evacuation, and enforcing it or using state and city resources to facilitate the evacuation, of those who could not or would not, absent extraordinary measures and assistance, evacuate. This extraordinary storm required extraordinary measures which the governor and mayor did not take. Finally, on Sunday morning at around 11 a.m. Central Time, 19 hours before projected landfall, Nagin announced the issuance of a mandatory evacuation order. According to the New Orleans plan, that gave the mayor the authority to direct and compel by any necessary and reasonable force the evacuation of all or part of the population from any stricken or threatened area within the city, if he deems this action necessary for the preservation of life or for disaster mitigation, response, or recovery. As previously noted, the New Orleans plan also recognizes that the safe evacuation of threatened populations when endangered by a major catastrophic event is one of the principal reasons for developing a comprehensive emergency management plan, and that special arrangements will be made to evacuate persons unable to transport themselves or who require special life-saving assistance. 
In a joint news conference on Sunday morning, Blanco and Nagin continued to express their concerns and explain the reason for the mayor's issuing a mandatory evacuation order. Their comments raised the question as to why, given the severity of the predicted catastrophe, the mandatory evacuation was not ordered sooner. Mayor Nagin, Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I had better news for you, but we are facing a storm that most of us have feared. I do not want to create panic, but I do want the citizens to understand that this is very serious, and it's of the highest nature, and that's why we are taking this unprecedented move. The storm is now a Cat 5, a Category 5, as I appreciate it, with sustained winds of 150 miles an hour, with wind gusts of 190 miles per hour. The storm surge most likely will topple our levee system. So we are preparing to deal with that also. So that's why we are ordering a mandatory evacuation. This is a once-in-probably-a-lifetime event. The city of New Orleans has never seen a hurricane of this strength to hit it almost directly, which is what they're projecting right now. During the press conference, Blanco stated, I want to reiterate what the mayor has said. This is a very dangerous time. Just before we walked into this room, President Bush called and told me to share with all of you that he is very concerned about the citizens. He is concerned about the impact that this hurricane would have on our people, and he asked me to please ensure that there would be a mandatory evacuation of New Orleans. The leaders at the highest ranks of our nation have recognized the destructive forces and the possible awesome danger that we are in, and I just want to say we need to get as many people out as possible. The shelters will end up probably without electricity or with minimum electricity from generators in the end. There may be intense flooding that will not be in our control, which would be ultimately the most dangerous situation that many of our people could face. Waters could be as high as 15 to 20 feet. That is what the Miami National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center, has shared with us. That would probably be ultimately the worst situation. We are hoping that it does not happen that way. We need to pray, of course, very strongly that the hurricane force would diminish. But just remember, even if it diminishes to one, there were six people lost in Florida when it was a Category 1 hurricane so there's still imminent danger. There seems to be no real relief in sight, and it has been startling to see how accurate the path was predicted and how it is following the predicted path. So we have no reason to believe right now that it will alter its path. Hopefully, you know, it could move just a little bit in one direction or another and not keep New Orleans in its sights. But we don't know that that would happen. That would be... We would be blessed if that happened. Jefferson Parish, the other major component of metropolitan New Orleans, never did declare a mandatory evacuation, except for the lower parts of the parish on the Gulf Coast. In a conference call among parish officials, Jefferson Parish President Aaron Broussard said he did not have the resources to enforce a mandatory evacuation. Resource or enforcement issues, however, were not raised by any of the other parishes that declared mandatory evacuations. In addition, no one requested that the state or federal government provide resources to supplement those of the parish to implement a more complete evacuation. Finding The failure to order timely mandatory evacuations, Mayor Nagin's decision to shelter but not evacuate the remaining population, and decisions of individuals led to incomplete evacuation. Earlier mandatory evacuation could have helped get more people out. While the mayor and the governor recognized the dangers and expressed them to the public, they did not implement evacuation procedures for all of the citizens of New Orleans that reflected the seriousness of the threat. The results demonstrate the flaw of the evacuation, tens of thousands of citizens did not get out of harm's way. Specifically, the failure to order a mandatory evacuation until Sunday, the decision to enforce that order 
by asking people who had not evacuated to go to checkpoints for bus service, and then using that bus service to take people only as far as the Superdome, did not reflect the publicly stated recognition that Hurricane Katrina would most likely topple the levee system and result in intense flooding and waters as high as 15 or 20 feet, rendering large portions of the city uninhabitable. As a result, more than 70,000 people remained in the city to be rescued after the storm. While Blanco, Nagan, and Broussard, and leaders from other parishes, carefully managed the phased contraflow evacuation, that only facilitated the evacuation of those who had the means to evacuate the city. Nagan testified that on Saturday, August 27th, he called for a strong voluntary evacuation, urging all citizens that were able to evacuate the city. Although Nagan was rightly proud of the achievement of the contraflow evacuation of the region, he also conceded that it probably wasn't as good as we, all of our citizens, needed. Some citizens of New Orleans believed that a mandatory evacuation should have been called earlier, and that the government needed to assist people to evacuate. New Orleans citizen and evacuee Doreen Keeler testified, If a mandatory evacuation order would have been called sooner, it would have been easier to move seniors out of the area, and many lives would have been saved. She further testified that, Go into senior citizens with, Yo, this is a mandatory evacuation. You do not have a choice. You have to leave. I feel would definitely help me to get my senior citizens out, without waiting as long as I did in order to leave. And I think that if by some miracle there was any type of evacuation plan available, it could have been put into play earlier if a mandatory evacuation had been called. New Orleans citizen and community leader Diane French asked, why would you get in a public media and ask a city where 80% of its citizens ride public transit to evacuate? What were they supposed to do? Fly? New Orleans citizen and evacuee Terrell Williams observed, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the destruction that we saw, that persons were unable to safely evacuate, was because they were basically poor. Which was echoed by Doreen Keeler, they suffered through it because they had no way of getting out. New Orleans citizen and evacuee Leah Hodges complained that the stray animals from the animal shelter, most of whom would have been euthanized, were evacuated two days before the storm, and the people were left to die. Buses that could have gotten our people, who otherwise could not get out, were left to flood, and people were left to die and Barbara Arnwine, Executive Director for the Lawyers' Committee for Civil Rights, testified, We know that people were not able to evacuate because some people just didn't own cars. In contrast to New Orleans, officials in adjoining Plaquemines Parish cited their early declaration of a mandatory evacuation as the key to achieving a high evacuation rate. Plaquemines Parish President Benny Roussel, according to Plaquemines Parish Sheriff Jiff Hingle, declared a mandatory evacuation on television at 9 a.m. on Saturday, August 27th. Sheriff's deputies started working the intersections to turn off traffic lights and expedite outbound traffic. On Sunday, August 28th, Plaquemines Parish Sheriff's deputies went door to door to warn people to evacuate and to identify those who needed help doing so. Hingle said these efforts resulted in Plaquemines Parish having an evacuation rate of 97 to 98 percent, which helped account for the small number of fatalities there, only three. The shelter of last resort for those who could not or would not evacuate was inadequate. A critical part of evacuation planning is accounting for those who cannot evacuate on their own, including those without access to private transportation. State and local emergency operations plans task transportation agencies with primary responsibility to assemble buses and other resources to operate this response function. 
For example, Alabama's Mobile County EOP states, The principal mode of transportation during an emergency situation will be private vehicles. There will be citizens in Mobile County that do not have private vehicles, nor are able to obtain transportation. These people will be looking to the city and county government to provide this emergency transportation. The Mobile County Emergency Management Agency has been given the responsibility of managing and coordinating this task. An annex to the Baldwin and Mobile County Plan is more explicit. Evacuation preparedness plans consider all persons who do not have access to a private vehicle and therefore would have to rely on public transportation for evacuation. Local governments attempt to arrange for adequate resources to meet the demand for public transportation. Planning for adequate special needs emergency transportation for residents in private homes is usually the responsibility of local emergency management officials, while transportation for those in health-related facilities is the responsibility of the individual facilities. Although detailed information concerning residents of private homes may be difficult to obtain, each local government is developing procedures for maintaining an up-to-date roster of persons likely to need special assistance. Non-ambulatory patients will require transportation that can easily accommodate wheelchairs, stretchers, and possibly life-sustaining equipment. Lack of resources for these needs could result in critical evacuation delays and increased hazards for the evacuees. The special needs population for each county changes from year to year, and requires public cooperation and assistance to maintain an up-to-date listing. Similarly, the New Orleans Plan specifically addresses the issue of those without access to transportation. The plan states that special arrangements will be made to evacuate persons unable to transport themselves. Additional personnel will be recruited to assist in evacuation procedures as needed. The New Orleans Plan further warns that if an evacuation order is issued, without the mechanisms needed to disseminate the information to the affected persons, then we face the possibility of having large numbers of people either stranded and left to the mercy of the storm, or left in areas impacted by toxic materials. Specifically, the New Orleans Plan provides that transportation will be provided to those persons requiring public transportation from the area, placing the Regional Transit Authority as the lead agency for transportation, supported by multiple federal, state, and local agencies, including the Orleans Parish School Board, New Orleans Equipment Maintenance Division, Louisiana Department of Transportation, Louisiana National Guard, Port of New Orleans, U.S. Coast Guard, New Orleans Public Belt Railroad, and Amtrak, the tasks allotted to the RTA include placing special vehicles on alert to be utilized if needed, positioning supervisors and dispatching evacuation buses, and, if warranted by scope of evacuation, implementing additional service. The New Orleans Plan expressly acknowledges that approximately 100,000 citizens of New Orleans do not have means of personal transportation. Following the mandatory evacuation order, city officials sent the police and fire departments through the city, asking people to go to checkpoints where buses circulating through the city would pick them up, but only to take them to the Superdome, which had been opened as a refuge of last resort that day. Despite the New Orleans Plan's acknowledgment that there are people who cannot evacuate by themselves, the city did not make arrangements for their evacuation. Instead, city officials decided to shelter them in New Orleans. As stated previously, emergency planners prefer evacuation to sheltering, because the sheltered population is subject to the most intense dangers of the storm. Evacuation is also favored because it may be slow and difficult to get relief personnel and supplies back into hurricane-ravaged areas. 
In addition, New Orleans preparations for sheltering these individuals were woefully inadequate. On Sunday morning, New Orleans officials, instead of working to move individuals out of New Orleans and out of harm's way, were drafting a plan to seize private facilities to create additional refuges of last resort. Ultimately, city officials designated only the Superdome as such a refuge. As will be discussed later in this chapter, the Superdome proved to be inadequate for the crowds that had to take refuge there. Only at the last minute did the city ask for food and water and medical personnel for the Superdome. As discussed in the medical care chapter, some of the federal medical assistance teams were called in so late that they did not make it to the Superdome before landfall. On Sunday morning, the New Orleans Director of Homeland Security, Terry Ebert, predicted nightmare conditions in the Superdome. Individuals share the blame for incomplete evacuation. The role of the individual was also an important factor in metropolitan New Orleans' incomplete evacuation. In Louisiana, state and parish officials said that it is generally the individual's responsibility to evacuate or identify themselves as having special needs if they need help. State and parish officials noted varying degrees of cooperation with evacuations, among the individuals in the general population. They said many residents evacuate early on their own, even before an evacuation is declared. These individuals watch the weather reports when a hurricane is in the Gulf and make their own informed choices. Officials know from experience, however, that some percentage, from 10 to 25 percent, will not evacuate the governor and other state officials said some residents play hurricane roulette. That is, against the advice of the authorities, they stay and take the risk that the hurricane will hit somewhere else, or that they will be lucky and relatively unaffected. Select committee staff heard similar comments in Mississippi. Testimony from county emergency management officials, as well as Mississippi's governor, indicated that hurricane fatigue, as well as the expense of repeatedly evacuating when storms threaten, may have caused some to not heed the mandatory evacuation orders. For example, Barber testified that various areas in the state had undergone mandatory evacuations for Hurricane Ivan in 2004 and Hurricane Dennis earlier in 2005, but in both instances the storms ultimately made landfall further east, sparing Mississippi. Both state and parish officials in Louisiana said the older population, some of whom might be classified as special needs, make up a substantial portion of those playing hurricane roulette. They said there are a few reasons for this. First, many of the older residents had experience sitting out earlier hurricanes, such as Betsy, 1965, or Camille, 1969, and reasoned they could sit out Katrina. Second, some of them were just set in their ways and would not listen to others' advice, even that of their own adult children, to evacuate. In addition, Katrina was originally headed for the Florida Panhandle, and its turn to the west caught many residents by surprise. Finally, it was the end of the month, when people did not have money for gas to evacuate. Regardless of their reasons for not evacuating, those that had the means to evacuate and did not do so must share some of the blame. Many of these people paid for their poor choices with their lives, as rising floodwaters drowned them in their homes, Others who stayed, but could have left, suffered the less severe consequences of walking through floodwaters to crowded shelters or other high ground. These individuals suffered in horrible conditions, some with shelter and food and water, and some without any of these, while they awaited evacuation, which they could have done for themselves earlier. End of Section 17